Section number one of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume six, eighteen sixty six to 1873 by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. Chapter 1. Delaying is not forgetting. There was an old mansion surrounded by a marshy ditch with a drawbridge, which was but seldom let down. Not all guests are good people. Under the roof were loopholes to shoot through and to pour down boiling water or even molten lead on the enemy should he approach. Inside the house, the rooms were very high and had ceilings of beams, and that was very useful, considering the great deal of smoke which rose up from behind the chimney fire, where the large damp logs of wood smouldered. On the walls hung pictures of knights in armour and proud ladies in gorgeous dresses. The most stately of all walked about alive. She was Meta Morgan. She was the mistress of the house to her belong the castle towards the evening robbers came they killed three of her people and also the yard dog and attached mrs meta to the kennel by the chain while they themselves made good cheer in the hall and drank the wine and the good ale out of her cellar mrs meta was now on the chain she could not even bark but lo the servant of one of the robbers secretly approached her they must not see it otherwise they would have killed him Mrs. Meta Morgan, said the fellow, do you still remember how my father, when your husband was still alive, had to ride on the wooden horse? You prayed for him, but it was no good. He was to ride until his limbs were paralyzed. But you stole down to him, as I steal now to you. You yourself put little stones under each of his feet, that he might have support. Nobody saw it, or they pretended not to see it, for you were then the young gracious mistress. My father has told me this, and I have not forgotten it. Now I will free you, Mrs. Meta Morgan. Then they pulled the horses out of the stable, and rode off in rain and wind to obtain the assistance of friends. Thus the small service done to the old man was richly rewarded, said Meta Morgan. Delaying is not forgetting, said the fellow. The robbers were hanged. There was an old mansion. It is still there. It did not belong to Mrs. Meta Morgan. It belonged to another old noble family. We are now in the present time. The sun is shining on the gilt knob of the tower. Little wooded islands lie like bouquets on the water, and wild swans are swimming around them. In the garden grow roses. The mistress of the house is herself the finest rose petal. She beams with joy, the joy of good deeds, however, not done in the wide world, but in her heart. And what is preserved there is not forgotten delaying is not forgetting now she goes from mansion to mansion to a little peasant hut in the field therein lives a poor paralyzed girl the window of a little room looks northward the sun does not enter here the girl can only see a small piece of field which is surrounded by a high fence but today the sun shines here the warm beautiful son of god is within the little room it comes from the south through the new window where formerly the wall was the paralyzed girl sits in the warm sunshine and can see the wood and the lake the world has become so large so beautiful and only through a single word from the kind mistress of the mansion the word was so easy the deed so small she said the joy it afforded me was infinitely great and sweet and therefore she does many a good deed thinks of all in the humble cottages and in the rich mansions where there are also afflicted ones it is concealed and hidden but god does not forget it delayed is not forgotten an old house stood there it was in the large town with its busy traffic there are rooms and halls in it but we do not enter them we remain in the kitchen where it is warm and light clean and tidy the copper utensils are shining 
the table as if polished with beeswax the sink looks like a freshly scored meat board all this a single servant has done and yet she has time to spare as if she wished to go to church she wears a bow on her cap a black bow that signifies mourning but she has no one to mourn neither father nor mother neither relations nor sweetheart she is a poor girl one day she was engaged to a poor fellow they loved each other dearly one day he came to her and said we both have nothing the rich widow over the way in the basement has made advances to me she will make me rich but you are in my heart what do you advise me to do i advise you to do what you think will turn out to your happiness said the girl be kind and good to her but remember this from the hour we part we shall never see each other again years passed then one day she met the old friend and sweetheart in the street he looked ill and miserable and she could not help asking him how are you rich and prospering in every respect he said the woman is brave and good but you are in my heart i have fought the battle it will soon be ended we shall not see each other again now until we meet before god a week has passed this morning his death was in the newspaper that is the reason of the girl's mourning her old sweetheart is dead and has left a wife and three stepchildren as the paper says it sounds as if there is a crack but the metal is pure the black bow signifies mourning the girl's face points to the same in a still higher degree it is preserved in the heart and will never be forgotten delaying is not forgetting these are three stories you see three leaves on the same stalk do you wish for some more trefoil leaves in the little heart book are many more of them delaying is not forgetting end of chapter 1 delaying is not forgetting section 2 of hans christian andersen fairy tales and short stories volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ruhi hak hans christian andersen fairy tales and short stories volume six eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy three by hans christian andersen translated by h p paul the porter's son eighteen sixty six the general lived in the grand first floor and the porter lived in the cellar there was a great distance between the two families the whole of the ground floor and the difference in rank but they lived in the same house and both had a view of the street and of the courtyard in the courtyard was a grass plot on which grew a blooming acacia tree when it was in bloom and under this tree sat occasionally the finely dressed nurse and the still more finely dressed child of the general little emily before them danced about barefoot the little son of the porter with his great brown eyes and dark hair and the little girl smiled at him and stretched out her hands towards him and when the general saw that from the window he would nod his head and cry charming the general's lady who was so young that she might very well have been her husband's daughter from an early marriage never came to the window that looked upon the courtyard she had given orders though that the boy might play his antiques to amuse her child but must never touch it the nurse punctually obeyed the gracious lady's orders the sun shone in upon the people in the grand first floor and upon the people in the cellar the acacia tree was covered with blossoms and they fell off and next year new ones came the tree bloomed and the porter's little son bloomed too and looked like a fresh tulip the general's little daughter became delicate and pale like the leaf of the acacia blossom 
she seldom came down to the tree now for she took the air in a carriage she drove out with her mamma and then she would always nod at the porter's george yes she used even to kiss her hand to him until her mamma said she was too old to do that now now one morning george was sent up to carry the general the letters and newspapers that had been delivered to the porter's room in the morning as he was running upstairs just as he passed the door of the sandbox he heard a faint piping he thought it was some young chicken that had strayed there and was raising cries of distress but it was the general's little daughter decked out in lace and finery don't tell papa and mamma she whimpered they would be angry what's the matter little missy asked george it's all on fire she answered it's burning with a bright flame george hurried upstairs to the general's apartment he opened the door of the nursery the window curtain was entirely burnt and the wooden curtain pole was one mass of flame george sprang upon a chair he brought in haste and pulled down the burning articles he then alarmed the people but for him the house would have been burnt down the general and his lady cross-questioned little emily it took just one lucifer match she said and it was burning directly and the curtain was burning too i spat at it to put it out i spat at it as much as ever i could but i could not put it out so i ran away and hid myself for papa and mamma would be angry i spat cried the general's lady what an expression did you ever hear your papa and mamma talk about spitting you must have got that from downstairs and george had a penny given to him but this penny did not go into the baker's shop but into the savings box and soon there were so many pennies in the savings box he could buy a paint box and colour the drawings he made and he had a great number of drawings they seemed to shoot out of his pencil and out of his fingers ends his first coloured pictures he presented to emily charming said the general and even the general's lady acknowledged that it was easy to see what the boy had meant to draw he has genius those were the words that were carried down into the cellar the general and his gracious lady were grand people they had two coats of arms on their carriage a coat of arms for each of them and the gracious lady had had this coat of arms embroidered on both sides of every bit of linen she had and even on her nightcap and her dressing bag one of the coats of arms the one that belonged to her was a very dear one it had been bought for hard cash by her father for he had not been born with it nor had she she had come into the world too early seven years before the coat of arms and most people remembered the circumstance but the family did not remember it a man might well have a bee in his bonnet when he had such a coat of arms to carry as that let alone having to carry two and the general's wife had a bee in hers when she drove to the court ball as stiff and as proud as you please the general was old and grey but he had a good seat on horseback and he knew it and he rode out every day with a groom behind him at a proper distance when he came to a party he looked somehow as if he were riding into the room upon his high horse and he had orders too such a number that no one would have believed it but that was not his fault as a young man he had taken part in the great autumn reviews which were held in those days he had an anecdote that he told about those days the only one he knew a subaltern under his orders had cut off one of the princes and taken him prisoner and the prince had been obliged to ride through the town with a little band of captured soldiers himself a prisoner behind the general this was an ever memorable event and was always told over and over again every year by the general who moreover always repeated the remarkable words he had used when he returned his sword to the prince those words were 
only my subaltern could have taken your highness prisoner i could never have done it and the prince had replied you are incomparable in a great war the general had never taken part when war came into the country he had gone on a diplomatic career to foreign courts he spoke the french language so fluently that he had almost forgotten his own he could dance well he could ride well and orders grew on his coat in an astounding way the sentries presented arms to him one of the most beautiful girls presented arms to him and became the general's lady and in time they had a pretty charming child that seemed as if it had dropped from heaven it was so pretty and the porter's son danced before it in the courtyard as soon as it could understand it and gave her all his coloured pictures and little emily looked at them and was pleased and tore them to pieces she was pretty and delicate indeed my little rose-leaf cried the general's lady thou art born to wed a prince the prince was already at the door but they knew nothing of it people don't see far beyond the threshold the day before yesterday our boy divided his bread and butter with her said the porter's wife there was neither cheese nor meat upon it but she liked it as well as if it had been roast beef there could have been a fine noise if the general and his wife had seen the feast but they did not see it george had divided his bread and butter with little emily and he would have divided his heart with her if it would have pleased her he was a good boy brisk and clever and he went to the night school in the academy now to learn to draw properly little emily was getting on with her education too for she spoke french with her bonne and had a dancing master george will be confirmed at easter said the porter's wife for george had got so far as this it would be the best thing now to make an apprentice of him said his father it must be to some good calling and then he would be out of the house he would have to sleep out of the house said george's mother it is not easy to find a master who has room for him at night and we shall have to provide him with clothes too the little bit of eating that he wants can be managed for him for he's quite happy with a few boiled potatoes and he gets taught for nothing let the boy go his own way you will say that he will be our joy some day and the professor says so too the confirmation suit was ready the mother had worked it herself but the tailor who did repairs had cut them out and a capital cutter out he was if he had had a better position and been able to keep a workshop and journeyman the porter's wife said he might have been a court tailor the clothes were ready and the candidate for confirmation was ready on his confirmation day george received a great pinchback watch from his godfather the old ironmonger's shopman the richest of his godfathers the watch was an old and tried servant it always went too fast but that is better than to be lagging behind that was a costly present and from the general's apartment there arrived a hymn book bound in morocco sent by the little lady to whom george had given pictures at the beginning of the book his name was written and her name as his gracious patroness these words had been written at the dictation of the general's lady and the general had read the inscription and pronounced it charming that is really a great attention from a family of such position said the porter's wife and george was sent upstairs to show himself in his confirmation clothes with the hymn book in his hand the general's lady was sitting very much wrapped up and had the bad headache she always had when time hung heavy upon her hands she looked at george very pleasantly and wished him all prosperity and that he might never have her headache the general was walking about in his dressing-gown he had a cap and a long tassel on his head and russian boots with red tops on his feet he walked three times up and down the room absorbed in his own thoughts and recollections and then stopped and said so little george is a confirmed christian now be a good man and honour those in authority over you some day when you are an old man you can say that the general gave you this precept 
that was a longer speech than the general was accustomed to make and he went back to his ruminations and looked very aristocratic but of all that george heard and saw up there little miss emily remained most clear in his thoughts how graceful she was how gentle and fluttering and pretty she looked if she were to be drawn it ought to be on a soap bubble about her dress about her yellow curled hair there was a fragrance as of a fresh blown nose and to think that he had once divided his bread and butter with her and that she had eaten it with enormous appetite and nodded to him at every second mouthful did she remember anything about it yes certainly for she had given him the beautiful hymn book in remembrance of this and when the first new moon in the first new year after this event came round he took a piece of bread a penny and his hymn book and went out into the open air and opened the book to see what psalm he could turn up it was a psalm of praise and thanksgiving and he opened the book again to see what would turn up for little emily he took great pains not to open the book in the place where the funeral hymns were and yet he got one that referred to the grave and death and then he thought this was not a thing in which one must believe for all that he was startled when afterwards the pretty little girl had to lie in bed and the doctor's carriage stopped at the gate every day they will not keep her with them said the porter's wife the good god knows whom he will summon to himself but they kept her after all and george drew pictures and sent them to her he drew the czar's palace the old kremlin at moscow just as it stood with towers and cupolas and these cupolas looked like gigantic green and gold cucumbers at least in george's drawing little emily was highly pleased and consequently when a week had elapsed george sent her a few more pictures all with buildings in them for you see she could imagine all sorts of things inside the windows and doors he drew a chinese house with bells hanging from every one of the sixteen stories he drew two grecian temples with slender marble pillars and with steps all round them he drew a norwegian church it was easy to see that this church had been built entirely of wood hewn out and wonderfully put together every story looked as if it had rockers like a cradle but the most beautiful of all was the castle drawn on one of the leaves and which he called emily's castle this was the kind of place in which she must live that is what george had thought and consequently he had put into his building whatever he thought most beautiful in all the others it had carved woodwork like the norwegian church marble pillars like the grecian temple bells in every story and was crowned with cupolas green and gilded like those of the kremlin of the czar it was a real child's castle and under every window was written what the bo what the hall or the room inside was intended to be for instance here emily sleeps here emily dances here emily plays at receiving visitors it was a real pleasure to look at the castle and right well was the castle looked at accordingly charming said the general but the old count for there was an old count there who was still grander than the general and had a castle of his own said nothing at all he heard that it had been designed and drawn by the porter's little son not that he was so very little either for he had already been confirmed the old count looked at the pictures and had his own thoughts as he did so one day when it was gloomy grey wet weather the brightest of days dawned for george for the professor at the academy called him into his room listen to me my friend said the professor i want to speak to you the lord has been good to you in giving you abilities and he has also been good in placing you among kind people the old count at the corner yonder has been speaking to me about you i have also seen your sketches but we will not say any more about those for there is a good deal to correct in them but from this time forward you may come twice a week to my drawing class and then you will soon learn how to do them better i think there's more of the architect than of the painter in you you will have time to think that over but go across to the old count this very day 
and thank God for having sent you such a friend. It was a great house, the house of the old count at the corner. Round the windows, elephants and dromedaries were carved, all from the old times. But the old count loved the new time best, and what it brought, whether it came from the first floor, or from the cellar, or from the attic. I think, said the porter's wife, the grander people are, the fewer airs do they give themselves. How kind and straightforward the old count is. And he talks exactly like you and me. Now, the general and his lady can't do that. And George was fairly wild with delight yesterday at the good reception he met with at the count's. And so am I today, after speaking to the great man. Wasn't it a good thing that we didn't bind George Apprentice to a handicraftsman? for he has abilities of his own. But they must be helped on by others, said the father. That help he has got now, rejoined it the mother, for the count spoke quite clearly and distinctly. But I fancy it began with the general, said the father, and we must thank them too. Let us do so with all my heart, cried the mother, though I fancy we have not much to thank them for. I will thank the good God, and I will thank him too, for letting little Emily get well. Emily was getting on bravely, and George got on bravely, too. In the course of the year, he won the little silver prize medal of the Academy, and afterwards he gained the great one, too. It would have been better, after all, if he had been apprenticed to a handicraftsman, said the porter's wife, weeping, for then we could have kept him with us. What is he to do in Rome? I shall never see the sight of him again, and even if he comes back, but that he won't do, the dear boy. It is fortune and fame for him, said the father. Yes, thank you, my friend, said the mother. You are saying what you do not mean. You are just as sorrowful as I am. And it was all true about the sorrow and the journey. But everyone said it was a great piece of good fortune for the young fellow. And he had to take leave, and of the general too. The general's lady did not show herself, for she had had her bad headache. On this occasion, the general told his only anecdote about what he had said to the prince, and how the prince had said to him, You are incomparable, and he held out a languid hand to George. Emily gave George her hand too, and looked almost sorry, and George was the most sorry of all. Time goes by when one has something to do, and it goes by too when one has nothing to do. The time is equally long, but not equally useful. It was useful to George, and it did not seem long at all, except when he happened to be thinking of his home. How might the good folks be getting on, upstairs and downstairs? Yes, there was writing about that, and many things can be put into a letter. Bright sunshine and dark heavy days. Both of these were in the letter, which brought the news that his father was dead, and that his mother was alone now. She wrote that Emily had come down to see her, and had been to her like an angel of comfort, and concerning herself, she added that she had been allowed to keep her situation as porteress. The general's lady kept a diary, and in this diary was recorded every ball she attended and every visit she received. The diary was illustrated by the insertion of the visiting cards of the diplomatic circle, and of the most noble families and the general's lady was proud of it. The diary kept growing through a long time, and amid many severe headaches, and through a long course of half-nights, that is to say, of court balls. Emily had now been to a court ball for the first time. Her mother had worn a bright red dress with black lace in the Spanish style. The daughter had been attired in white, fair and delicate green silk ribbons, fluttered like flag leaves, among her yellow locks, and on her head she wore a wreath of water lilies. Her eyes were so blue and clear, her mouth was so delicate and red. She looked like a little water spirit, so beautiful as such a spirit can be imagined. The princess danced with her, one after another of course, and the general's lady had not had a headache for a week afterwards. But the first ball was not the last, and Emily could not stand it. It was a good thing, therefore, that summer brought with it rest and exercise in the open air. 
The family had been invited by the old count to visit him at his castle. That was a castle with a garden which was worth seeing. Part of this garden was laid out quite in the style of the old days, with stiff green hedges. You walked as if between green walls and peepholes in them. Box trees and yew trees stood there trimmed into the form of stars and pyramids, and water sprang from the fountains in large grottoes lined with shells. All around stood figures of the most beautiful stone that could be seen in their clothes as well as in their faces. Every flower bed had a different shape and represented a fish or a coat of arms or a monogram. That was the French part of the garden and from this part the visitor came into what appeared like the green fresh forest where the trees might grow as they chose and accordingly they were great and glorious. The grass was green and beautiful to walk on and it was regularly cut and rolled and swept and tended that was the english part of the garden old time and new time said the count here they run well into one another in two years the building itself will put on a proper appearance there will be a complete metamorphosis in beauty and improvement i shall show you the drawings and i shall show you the architect for he is to dine here today charming said the general "'Tis like paradise here,' said the general's lady, "'and yonder you have a knight's castle.' "'That's my poultry house,' observed the count. "'The pigeons live in the tower, the turkeys in the first floor, "'but old Elsie rules in the ground floor. "'She has apartments on all sides of her. "'The sitting hens have their own room, "'and the hens with chickens have theirs, "'and the ducks have their own particular door leading to the water.' "'Charming,' repeated the general and all sailed forth to see these wonderful things old elsie stood in the room on the ground floor and by her side stood architect george he and emily now met for the first time after several years and they met in the poultry house yes there he stood and was handsome enough to be looked at his face was frank and energetic he had black shining hair and a smile about his mouth which said i have a brownie that sits in my ear and knows every one of you inside out old elsie had pulled off her wooden shoes and stood there in her stockings to do honour to the noble guests the hens clucked and the cocks crowed and the ducks waddled to and fro and said quack quack but the fair pale girl the friend of his childhood the daughter of the general stood there with a rosy blush on her usually pale cheeks and her eyes opened wide and her mouth seemed to speak without uttering a word and the greeting he received from her was the most beautiful greeting a young man can desire from a young lady if they are not related or have not danced many times together and she and the architect had never danced together the count shook hands with him and introduced him he is not altogether a stranger our young friend george the general's lady bowed to him, and the general's daughter was very nearly giving him her hand, but she did not give it to him. Ah, oh, little Master George, said the general, old friends, charming. You have become quite an Italian, said the general's lady, and I presume you speak the language like a native. My wife sings the language, but she does not speak it, observed the general. After dinner, George sat at the right hand of Emily whom the general had taken down while the count led in the general's lady mr george talked and told of his travels and he could talk well and was the life and soul of the table though the old count could have been it too emily sat silent but she listened and her eyes gleamed but she said nothing in the veranda amongst the flowers she and george stood together the rose bushes concealed them and george was speaking again for he took the lead now many thanks for the kind consideration you showed my old mother he said i know that you went down to her on the night when my father died and you stayed with her till his eyes were closed my heartiest thanks he took emily's hand and kissed it he might do so on such an occasion she blushed deeply but pressed his hands and looked at him with her dear blue eyes 
your mother was a dear soul she said how fond she was of her son and she let me read all your letters so that i almost believe i know you how kind you were to me when i was a little girl you used to give me pictures which you tore in two said george no i have still your drawing of the castle i must build the castle in reality now said george and he became quite warm at his own words the general and the general's lady talked to each other in their room about the porter's son how he knew how to behave and to express himself with the greatest propriety he might be a tutor said the general intellect said the general's lady but she did not say anything more during the beautiful summer time mr george several times visited the count and his castle and he was missed when he did not come how much the good god has given you that he has not given to us poor mortals said emily to him are you sure you are very grateful for it it flattered george that the lovely young girl should look up to him and he thought then that emily had unusual good abilities and the general felt more and more convinced that george was no cellar child his mother was a very good woman he observed it is only right i should do her that justice now she is in her grave the summer passed away and the winter came again there was talk about mr george he was highly respected and was received in the first circles the general had met him at a court ball and now there was a ball to be given in the general's house for emily and could mr george be invited to it he whom the king invites can be invited by the general also said the general and drew himself up till he stood quite an inch higher than before mr george was invited and he came princes and counts came and they danced one better than the other but emily could only dance one dance the first for she made a false step nothing of consequence but her foot hurt her so that she had to be careful and leave off dancing and look at the others so she sat and looked on and the architect stood by her side i suppose you are giving her the whole history of st peter's said the general as he passed by and smiled like the personification of patronage with the same patronizing smile he received mr george a few days afterwards the young man came no doubt to return thanks for the invitation to the ball what else could it be but indeed there was something else something very astonishing and startling he spoke words of sheer lunacy so that the general could hardly believe his own ears it was the height of rodomonted an offer quite an inconceivable offer mr george came to ask the hand of emily in marriage man cried the general and his brain seemed to be boiling i don't understand you at all what is it you say what is it you want i don't know you sir man what possesses you to break into my house and am i to stand here and listen to you he stepped backwards into his bedroom locked the door behind him and left mr george standing alone george stood still for a few minutes and then turned round and left the room emily was standing in the corridor my father has answered she asked and her voice trembled george pressed her hand he has escaped me he replied but a better time will come there were tears in emily's eyes but in the young man's eyes shone courage and confidence and the sun shone through the window and cast his beams on the pair and gave them his blessing the general sat in his room bursting hot yes he was still boiling until he boiled over in the exclamation lunacy porter madness not an hour was over before the general's lady knew it was out of the general's own mouth she called emily and remained alone with her you poor child she said to insult you so to insult us so there are tears in your eyes too but they become you well you look beautiful in tears you looked as i looked on my wedding day weep on my sweet emily yes that i must said emily if you and my father do not say yes child screamed the lady's lady you are ill you are talking wildly and i shall have a most terrible headache oh what a misfortune is coming upon our house 
don't make your mother die emily or you will have no mother and the eyes of the general's lady were wet for she could not bear to think of her own death in the newspapers there was an announcement mr george has been elected professor of the fifth class number eight it is a pity that his parents are dead and cannot read it said the new porter people who who now lived in the cellar under the general's apartments they knew that the professor had been born and grown up within their four walls the salary said a man now he'll get a salary said the man yes that's not much for a poor child said the woman eighteen dollars a year why said the man why it's a good deal of money no i mean the honour of it replied his wife do you think he cares for the money those few dollars he can earn a hundred times over and most likely he'll get a rich wife into the bargain if we had children of our own husband our child should be an architect and a professor too george was spoken well of in the cellar and he was spoken well of in the first floor the old count took upon himself to do that the pictures he had drawn in his childhood gave occasion for it but now did the conversation come to turn on these pictures but how did the conversation come to turn on these pictures why they had been talking of russia and of moscow and thus mention was made of the kremlin which little george had once drawn for miss emily he had drawn many pictures but the count specially remembered one emily's castle where she was to sleep and to dance and to play at receiving guests the professor was a true man said the count and would be a privy councillor before he died it was not at all unlikely and he might build a real castle for the young lady before the time came why not that was a strange jest remarked the general's lady when the count had gone away the general took his head thoughtfully and went out for a ride with his groom behind him at a proper distance and he sat more stiffly than ever on his high horse it was emily's birthday flowers books letters and visiting cards came pouring in the general's lady kissed her on the mouth and the general kissed her on the forehead they were affectionate parents and they and emily had to receive grand visitors two of the princes they talked of balls and theatres of diplomatic missions of the government of empires and nations and then they spoke of talent and so the discourse turned upon the young architect he is building up an immortality for himself said one and he will certainly build his way into one of our first families one of our first families repeated the general and afterwards the general's lady what is meant by one of our first families i know for whom it was intended said the general's lady but i shall not say it i don't think it heaven disposes but i shall be astonished i am astonished also said the general i haven't an idea in my head and he fell into a reverie waiting for ideas there is a power a nameless power in the possession of favour from above the favour of providence and this little favour the little george had but we are forgetting the birthday emily's room was fragrant with flowers sent by male and female friends on the table lay beautiful presents for greetings and remembrance but none could come from george none could come from him but it was not necessary for the whole house was full of remembrances of him even out of the ash bin the blossom of memory peeped forth for emily had sat whimpering there on the day when the window curtain caught fire and george arrived in the character of fire engine a glance out of the window and the acacia tree reminded of the days of childhood flowers and leaves had fallen but there stood the tree covered with hoar frost looking like a single huge branch of coral and the moon shone clear and large among the twigs unchanged in its changings as if it was when george divided his bread and butter with little emily out of a box the girl took the drawings of the czar's palace and of her own castle remembrances of george the drawings were looked at and many thoughts came she remembered the day when unobserved by her father and mother she had gone down to the porter's wife who lay dying once again she seemed to sit beside her 
holding the dying woman's hands in hers hearing the dying woman's last words blessing george the mother was thinking of her son and now emily gave her own interpretation to those words yes george was certainly with her on her birthday it happened that the next day was another birthday in that house the general's birthday he had been born the day after his daughter but before her of course many years before her many presents arrived and among them came a saddle of exquisite workmanship a comfortable and costly saddle one of the princes had just such another now from whom might the saddle come the general was delighted and there was a little note in the saddle now if the words on the note had been many thanks for yesterday's reception we might easily have guessed from whom it came but the words were from somebody whom the general does not know whom in the world do i not know exclaimed the general i know everybody and his thoughts wandered all through society for he knew everybody there the saddle comes from my wife he said at last she is teasing me charming but she was not teasing him those times were past again there was a feast but it was not in the general's house it was a fancy ball at the prince's and masks were allowed too the general went at rubens in a spanish costume with a little ruff around his neck a sword by his side and a stately manner the general's lady was madame rubens in black velvet made high round the neck exceedingly warm and with a millstone around her neck in the shape of a great ruff accurately dressed after a dutch picture in the possession of the general in which the hands were specially admired they were just like the hands of the general's lady emily was psyche in white crepe and lace she was like a floating swan she did not want wings at all she only wore them as emblematic of psyche brightness splendor light and flowers wealth and taste appeared in the ball there was so much to see and the beautiful hands of madame rubens made no sensation at all a black domino with an acacia blossom in his cap danced with psyche who is that asked the general's lady his royal highness replied the general i am quite sure of it i knew him directly by the pressure of his hands the general's lady doubted it general rubens had no doubt about it he went up to the black domino and wrote the royal letters in the mask's hand these were denied but the mask gave him a hint the words that came with the saddle one whom you do not know general but i do know you said the general it was you who sent me the saddle the domino raised his head and disappeared amongst the other guests who is that black domino with whom you were dancing emily asked the general's lady i did not ask his name she replied because you knew it it is the professor your protege is here count she continued turning to that nobleman who stood close by a black domino with acacia blossoms in his cap very likely my dear lady replied the count but one of the princes wears just the same costume i knew the pressure of the hand said the general the saddle comes from the prince i am so certain of it that i could invite that domino to dinner do so if it be the prince he will certainly come replied the count and if it is the other he will not come said the general and approached the black domino who was just speaking with the king the general gave a very respectful invitation that they might make each other's acquaintance and he smiled in his certainty concerning the person he was inviting he spoke loud and distinctly the domino raised his mask and it was george do you repeat your invitation general he asked the general certainly seemed to grow an inch taller assumed a more stately demeanor and took two steps backward and one step forward as if he were dancing a minuet and then came such as much gravity in expression into the face of the general as the general could contrive or infuse into it and he replied i never retract my words you are invited professor and he bowed with a glance at the king who must have heard the whole dialogue
Now there was a company to dinner at the general's, but only the old count and his protégé were invited. I have foot under his table, thought George. That's laying the foundation stone. And the foundation stone was really laid with great ceremony at the house of the general and the general's lady. The man had come and had spoken quite like a person in good society and had made himself very agreeable so that the general had often to repeat his charming the general talked of this dinner talked of it even to a court lady and this lady one of the most intellectual persons about the court asked to be invited to meet the professor the next time he should come so he had to be invited again and he was invited and came and was charming again he could even play chess he is not out of the cellar said the general he is quite a distinguished person there are many distinguished persons of that kind and it's no fault of his the professor who was received in the king's palace might very well be received by the general but that he could ever belong to the house was out of the question only the whole town was talking of it he grew and grew the dew of favour fell from above so no one was surprised after all that he should become a privy councillor and emily a privy councillor's lady life is either a tragedy or a comedy said the general in tragedies they die in comedies they marry one another in this case they married and they had three clever boys but not all at once the sweet children rode on their hobby horses through all the rooms when they came to see the grandparents and the general also rode on his stick he rode behind him in the character of groom to the little privy councillors and the general's lady sat on her sofa and smiled at them even when she had her severest headache so far did george get and much further else it had not been worth while to tell the story of the porter's son end of the porter's son Section 3 of Anne's Christian Anderson Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Anne's Christian Anderson fairy tales and short stories volume 6 1866 to 1873 by anne's christian anderson translated by h p paul chapter 3 our aunt 1866 you ought to have known our aunt she was charming that is to say she was not charming at all as the word is usually understood but she was good and kind amusing in her way and was just as any one ought to be whom people are to talk about and to laugh at she might have been put into a play and wholly and solely on account of the fact that she only lived for the theatre and for what was done there she was an honourable matron but agent fabs whom she used to call flabs declared that our aunt was stage struck the theatre is my school said she the source of my knowledge from thence i have resuscitated biblical history now moses and joseph in egypt there are operas for you i get my universal history from the theatre my geography and my knowledge of men out of the french pieces i get to know life in paris slippery but exceedingly interested how i have cried over la famille Rookbo, that the man must drink himself to death so that she may marry the young fellow yes how many tears i have wept in the fifty years i have subscribed to the theatre our aunt knew every acting play every bit of scenery every character 
every one who appeared or had appeared she seemed really only to live during the nine months the theatre was open summer time without a summer theatre seemed to be only a time that made her old while on the other hand a theatrical evening that lasted till midnight was a lengthening of her life she did not say as other people do now we shall have spring the stork is here or they've advertised the first strawberries in the papers she on the contrary used to announce the coming of autumn with have you heard they're selling boxes for the theatre now the performances will begin she used to value a lodging entirely according to its proximity to the theatre it was a real sorrow to her when she had to leave the little lane behind the playhouse and move into the great street that lay a little farther off and lived there in a house where she had no opposite neighbours at home said she my windows must be my opera box one cannot sit back and look into oneself till one's tired one must see people by now i live just as if i'd go into the country if i want to see human beings i must go into my kitchen and sit down on the sink for there only i have opposite neighbours no when i lived in my dear little lane i could look straight down into the ironmonger's shop and had only three hundred paces to the theatre and now i've three thousand paces to go military measurement our aunt was sometimes ill but however unwell she might feel she never missed the play the doctor prescribed one day that she should put her feet in a bran bath and she followed his advice but she drove to the theatre all the same and sat with her feet in bran there if she had died there she would have been very glad though walston died in the theatre and she called that a happy death she could not imagine that in heaven there must be a theatre too it had not indeed been promised us but we might very well imagine it the many distinguished actors and actresses who had passed away must surely have a field for their talent our aunt had an electric wire from the theatre to her room a telegram used to be dispatched to her at coffee time and it used to consist of the words her sivertson is at the machinery for it was he who gave the signal for drawing the curtain up and down and for changing the scenes from him she used to receive a short and concise description of every piece his opinion of shakespeare's tempest was mad nonsense there's so much to put up and the first scene begins with water to the front of the wings that is to say the water had to come forward so far but when on the other hand the same interior scene remained through five acts he used to pronounce it a sensible well-written play a resting play which performed itself without putting up scenes in earlier times by which name our aunt used to designate thirty years ago she and the before mentioned her sivertson had been younger at that time he had always been connected with the machinery and was as she said her benefactor it used to be the custom in those days that in the evening performances in the only theatre the town possessed spectators were admitted to the part called the flies over the stage and every machinist had one or two places to give away often the flies were quite full of good company it was said the general's wives and privy councillors wives had been up there it was quite interesting to look down behind the scenes and to see how the people walked to and fro on the stage when the curtain was down our aunt had been there several times as well when there was a tragedy as when there was a ballet for the pieces in which there were the greatest number of characters on the stage were the most interesting to see from the flies one sat pretty much in the dark up there and most people took their supper up with them once three apples and a great piece of bread and butter and sausage fell down right into the dungeon of ugolino where that unhappy man was to be starved to death and there was great laughter among the audience 
the sausage was one of the weightiest reasons why the worthy management refused in future to have any spectators up in the flies but i was there seven and thirty times said our aunt and i shall always remember mr siverston for that on the very last evening when the flies were still open to the public the judgment of solomon was performed as our aunt remembered very well she had through the influence of a benefactor her siverson procured a free admission for the agent fabs although he did not deserve it in the least for he was always cutting his jokes about the theatre and teasing our aunt but she had procured him a free admission to the flies for all that he wanted to look at this player stuff from the other side those were his own words and they were just like him said our aunt he looked down from above on the judgment of solomon and fell asleep over it one would have thought that he had come from a dinner where many toasts had been given he went to sleep and was locked in and there he sat through the dark night in the flies and when he woke he told a story but our aunt would not believe it the judgment of solomon was over he said and all the people had gone away upstairs and downstairs and now the real play began the afterpiece which was the best of all said the agent then life came into the affair it was not the judgment of solomon that was performed no a real court of judgment was held upon the stage and agent fabs had the impudence to try and make our aunt believe all this that was the thanks she got for having got him a place in the flies what did the agent say why it was curious enough to hear but there was malice and satire in it it looked dark up there said the agent and then the magic business began a great performance the judgment in the theatre the box keepers were at their posts and every spectator had to show his ghostly pass-book that it might be decided if he was to be admitted with hands loose or bound or with or without a muzzle grand people who came too late when the performance had begun and young people who could always watch the time were tied up outside and had list slippers put on their feet with which they were allowed to go in before the beginning of the next act and they had muzzles too and then the judgment on the stage began all malice and not a bit of truth in it said our aunt the painter who wanted to get to paradise had to go up a staircase which he had himself painted but which no man could mount that was to expiate his sins against perspective all the plants and buildings which the property man had placed with infinite pains in countries to which they did not belong the poor fellow was obliged to put in their right places before cock-crow if he wanted to get into paradise let her fab see how he would get in himself but what he said of the performance tragedians and comedians singers and dancers that was the most rascally of all mr fabs indeed flabs he did not deserve to be admitted at all and our aunt would not soil her lips with what he said and he said did flabs that the whole was written down and it should be printed when he was dead and buried but not before for he would not risk having his arms and legs broken once our aunt had been in fear and trembling in her temple of happiness the theatre it was on a winter day one of those days in which one has a couple of hours of daylight with a grey sky it was terribly cold and snowy but aunt must go to the theatre a little opera and a great ballet were performed and a prologue and an epilogue into the bargain and that would last till late at night our aunt must needs go so she borrowed a pair of fur boots of her lodger boots with fur inside and out and which reached far up her legs she got into the theatre and to her box and boots were warm and she kept them on suddenly there was a cry of fire smoke was coming from one of the side scenes and streamed down from the flies and there was terrible panic the people came rushing out and our aunt was the last in the box on the second tier left-hand side 
for from there the scenery looks best she used to say the scenes are always arranged that they look best from the king's side aunt wanted to come out but the people before her in their fright and heedlessness slammed the door of the box and there sat our aunt and couldn't get out and couldn't get in that is to say she couldn't get into the next box for the partition was too high for her she called out and no one heard her she looked down into the tier of boxes below her and it was empty and low and looked quite near and aunt in her terror felt quite young and light she thought of jumping down and had got one leg over the partition the other resting on the bench there she sat astride as if on horseback well wrapped up in her flowered cloak with one leg hanging out a leg in a tremendous fur boot that was a sight to behold and when it was beheld our aunt was hurt too and was saved from burning for the theatre was not burned down that was the most memorable evening of her life and she was glad that she could not see herself for she would have died with confusion her benefactor in the machinery department her sivertson visited her every sunday but it was a long time from sunday to sunday in the latter time therefore she used to have in a little child for the scraps that is to say to eat up the remains of the dinner it was a child employed in the ballet one that certainly wanted feeding the little one used to appear sometimes as an elf sometimes as a page the most difficult part she had to play was the lion's hind leg in the magic flute but as she grew larger she could represent the four feet of the lion she certainly only got half a guilder for that whereas the hind legs were paid for with a whole guilder but then she had to walk bent and to do without fresh air that was all very interesting to hear said our aunt she deserved to live as long as the theatre stood but she could not last so long and she did not die in the theatre but respectably in her bed her last words were moreover not without meaning she asked what will the play be tomorrow at her death she left about five hundred dollars we presume this from the interest which came to twenty dollars this our aunt had destined as a legacy for a worthy old spinster who had no friends it was to be devoted to a yearly subscription for a place in the second tier on the left side for the saturday evening for on that evening two pieces were always given it said in the will and the only condition laid upon the person who enjoyed the legacy was that she should think every saturday evening of our aunt who was lying in her grave this was our aunt's religion End of Our Aunt Section 4 of Anne's Christian Anderson Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ruhi Huck Anne's Christian Anderson Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866-1873 to 1873, by Anne's Christian Anderson Translated by H. P. Paul The Toad 1866 The well was deep and therefore the rope had to be a long one. It was heavy work turning the handle when anyone had to raise a bucket full of water over the edge of the well. Though the water was clear, the sun never looked down far enough into the well to mirror itself in the waters, but as far as its beams could reach, green things grew forth between the stones in the sides of the well. Down below dwelt a family of the toad race. They had, in fact, come head over heels down the well in the person of the old mother toad who was still alive the green frogs who had been established there a long time and swam about in the water called them well guests 
but the newcomers seemed determined to stay where they were for they found it very agreeable living in a dry place as they called the wet stones the mother frog had once been a traveller she happened to be in the water bucket when it was drawn up but the light became too strong for her and she got a pain in her eyes fortunately she scrambled out of the bucket but she fell into the water with a terrible flop and had to lie sick for three days with pains in her back she certainly had not much to tell of the things up above but she knew this and all the frogs knew it that the well was not all the world the mother toad might have told this and that if she had chosen but she never answered when they asked her anything and so they left off asking she's thick and fat and ugly said the young green frogs and her children will be just as ugly as she is that may be retorted the mother toad but one of them has a jewel in his head or else i have the jewel the young frogs listened and stared and as these words did not please them they made grimaces and dived down under the water but the little toads kicked up their hind legs from mere pride for each of them thought that he must have the jewel and then they sat and held their heads quite still but at length they asked what it was that made them so proud and what kind of a thing the jewel might be oh it is such a splendid and precious thing that i cannot describe it said the mother toad it's something which one carries about for one's own pleasure and that makes other people angry but don't ask me any questions for i shan't answer you well i haven't got the jewel said the smallest of the toads she was as ugly as a toad can be why should i have such a precious thing and if it makes others angry it can't give me any pleasure no i only wish i could get to the edge of the well and look out it must be beautiful up there you'd better stay where you are said the old mother toad for you know everything here and you can tell what you have take care of the bucket for it will crush you to death and even if you get into it safely you may fall out and it's not every one who falls so cleverly as i did and gets away with whole legs and whole bones quack said the little toad and that's just as if one of us were to say aha she had an immense desire to go to the edge of the well and to look over she felt such a longing for the green up there and the next morning when it chanced that the bucket was being drawn up filled with water and stopped for a moment just in front of the stone on which the toad sat the little creature's heart moved within it and our toad jumped into the filled bucket which presently was drawn to the top emptied out ach you beast said the farm labourer who emptied the bucket when he saw the toad you're the ugliest thing i've seen for one while and he made a kick with his wooden shoe at the road which just escaped being crushed by managing to scramble into the nettles which grew high by the well's brink here she saw stem by stem but she looked up also the sun shone through the leaves which were quite transparent and she felt as a person would feel who stops suddenly into a great forest where the sun looks in between the branches and leaves it's much nicer here than down in the well i should like to stay here my whole life long said the little toad so she lay there for an hour yes for two hours i wonder what is to be found up there as i have come so far i must try to go still farther and so she crawled on as fast as she could crawl and got out upon the highway where the sun shone upon her and the dust powdered her all over as she marched across the way i've got to a dry place now and no mistake said the toad it's almost too much of a good thing here it tickles one so she came to the ditch and forget-me-nots were growing there and meadow sweet and a very little way off was a hedge of white thorn and elder bushes grew there too and bindweed with white flowers gay colours were to be seen here and a butterfly too was flitting by the toad thought it was a flower which had broken loose that it might look about better in the world which was quite a natural thing to do 
if one could only make a journey as that said the toad croak how capital that would be eight days and eight nights she stayed by the well and experienced no want of provisions on the ninth day she thought farewell onwards but what could she find more charming and beautiful perhaps a little toad or a few green frogs during the last night there had been a sound borne on the breeze as if there were cousins in the neighbourhood it is a glorious thing to live glorious to get out of the well and to lie among the stinging nettles and to crawl along the dusty road but onward onward that we may find frogs or a little toad we can't do without that nature alone is not enough for one and so she went forward on her journey she came out into the open field to a great pond round about which grew reeds and she walked into it it will be too damp for you here said the frogs but you are very welcome are you a he or a she but it doesn't matter you are equally welcome and she was invited to the concert in the evening the family concert great enthusiasm and thin voices we know the sort of thing no refreshments were given only there was plenty to drink for the whole pond was free now i shall resume my journey he said the little toad for she always felt a longing for something better she saw the stars shining so large and so bright and she saw the moon gleaming and then she saw the sun rise and mount higher and higher perhaps after all i am still in a well only in a larger well i must get higher yet i feel a great restlessness and longing and when the moon became round and full the poor creature thought i wonder if that is the bucket which will be let down and into which i must step to get higher up or is it the sun or is the sun the great bucket how great it is how bright it is it can take up all i must look out that i may not miss the opportunity oh how it seems to shine in my head i don't think the jewel can shine brighter but i haven't the jewel nor that i cry about that no i must go higher up into splendour and joy i feel so confident and yet i am afraid it's a difficult step to take and yet it must be taken onward therefore straight onward she took a few steps such as a crawling animal may take and soon found herself on a road beside which people dwelt but there were flower gardens as well as kitchen gardens and she sat down to rest by a kitchen garden what a number of different creatures there are that i never knew and how beautiful and great the world is but one must look round in it and not stay in one spot and then she hopped into the kitchen garden how green it is here how beautiful it is here i know that said the caterpillar on the leaf my leaf is the largest here it takes half the world from me but i don't care for the world cluck cluck and some fowls came they tripped about in the cabbage garden the fowl who marched at the head of them had a long sight and she spied the caterpillar on the green leaf and pecked at it so that the caterpillar fell on the ground where it twisted and writhed the fowl looked at it first with one eye and then with the other for she did not know what the end of this writhing would be it doesn't do that with a good will thought the fowl and lifted up her head to peck at the caterpillar the toad was so horrified at this that she came crawling straight up towards the fowl aha it has allies quoth the fowl just look at the crawling thing and then the fowl turned away i don't care for the little green morsel it would only tickle my throat the other fowls took the same view of it and they all turned away together i ride myself free said the caterpillar what a good thing it is when one has presence of mind but the hardest thing remains to be done and that is to get on my leaf again where is it and the little toad came up and expressed her sympathy she was glad that in her ugliness she had frightened the fowls what do you mean by that cried the caterpillar 
i wriggled myself free from the fowl you are very disagreeable to look at cannot i be left in peace on my own property now i smell cabbage now i am near my leaf nothing is so beautiful as property but i must go higher up yes higher up said the little toad higher up she feels just as i do but she's not in a great humour to-day that's because of the fright we all want to go higher up and she looked up as high as ever she could the stork sat in his nest on the roof of the farmhouse he clapped with his beak and the mother stork clapped with hers how high up they live thought the toad if one could only get as high as that in the farmhouse lived two young students the one was a poet and the other a scientific searcher into the secrets of nature the one sang and wrote joyously of everything that god had created and how it was mirrored in his heart he sang out clearly sweetly richly in well-sounding verses while the other investigated created matter itself and even cut it open where need was he looked upon god's creation as a great sum in arithmetic subtracted multiplied and tried to know it within and without and to talk with understanding concerning it and that was a very sensible thing and he spoke joyously and cleverly of it they were good joyful men those two there sits a good specimen of a toad said the naturalist i must have that fellow in a bottle of spirits you have two of them already replied the poet let the thing sit there and enjoy its life but it's so wonderfully ugly persisted the first yet if we could find the jewel in its head said the poet i too should be for cutting it open a jewel cried the naturalist you seem to know a great deal about natural history but is there not something beautiful in the popular belief that just as the toad is the ugliest of animals it should often carry the most precious jewel in its head is it not just the same thing with men what a jewel that was that aesop had and still more socrates the toad did not hear any more nor did she understand half of what she had heard the two friends walked on and thus she escaped the fate of being bottled up in spirits those two also were speaking of the jewel said the toad to herself what a good thing that i have not got it i might have been in a very disagreeable position now there was a clapping on the roof of the farmhouse father stork was making a speech to his family and his family was glancing down at the two young men in the kitchen garden man is the most conceited creature said the stork listen how their jaws are wagging and for all that they can't clap properly they boast of their gifts of eloquence and their language yes a fine language truly why changes in every day's journey we make one of them doesn't understand another now we can speak our language over the whole earth up in the north and in egypt and then men are not able to fly moreover they rush along by means of an invention they call railway but they often break their necks over it it makes my beak turn cold when i think of it the world would get on without men we could do without them very well so long as we only keep frogs and earthworms that was a powerful speech thought the little toad what a great man that is yonder and how high he sits higher than ever i saw any one sit yet and how he can swim she cried as the stork soared away through the air with outspread pinions and the mother stork began talking in the nest and told about egypt and the waters of the nile and the incomparable mud that was to be found in that strange land and all this sounded new and very charming to the little toad i must go to egypt said she if the stork or one of his young ones would only take me i would oblige him in return yes i shall get to egypt for i feel so happy all the longing and all the pleasure that i feel is much better than having a jewel in one's head and it was just she who had the jewel the jewel was the continual striving and desire to go upward ever upward it gleamed in her head gleamed in joy beamed brightly in her longing then suddenly up came the stork he had seen the toad in the grass and stooped down and seized the little creature anything but gently the stork's beak pinched her and the wind whistled 
it was not exactly agreeable but she was going upward upward towards egypt and she knew it and that was why her eyes gleamed and a spark seemed to fly out of them Quank! Gah! the body was dead the toad was killed but the spark that had shot forth from her eyes what became of that the sunbeam took it up the sunbeam carried the jewel from the head of the toad whither ask not the naturalist rather ask the poet he would tell it thee under the guise of a fairy tale and the caterpillar on the cabbage and the stork family belong to the story think the caterpillar is changed and turns into a beautiful butterfly the stork family flies over mountains and seas to the distant africa and yet finds the shortest way home to the same country to the same roof nay that is almost too improbable and yet it is true you may ask the naturalist he will confess it is so and you know it yourself for you have seen it but the jewel in the head of the toad seek it in the sun see it there if you can the brightness is too dazzling there we have not yet such eyes as can see into the glories which god has created but we shall receive them by and by and that will be the most beautiful story of all and we shall all have a share in it end of the toad section five of hans christian andersen fairy tales and short stories volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Hall. Hans Christian Andersen. Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. 1866 to 1873. By Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Nis and the Dame. By Hans Christian Andersen. 1868. You have all heard of the Nis, but have you ever heard of the dame, the gardener's dame? She had plenty of reading, knew verses by heart, ay, and could write them herself with ease, except that the rhymes, clinchings, as she called them, cost her a little trouble. She had gifts of writing and gifts of speech. She could well have been a priest, or at all events, the priest's wife. The earth is beauteous in her Sunday gown, said she, and this thought she had set in regular form and clinching, set it up in a ditty that was ever so fine and long. The underschoolmaster, Mr. Kisserup, not that it matters about his name, was a cousin of hers, and on a visit at the gardener's, he heard the dame's poem, and it did him good, he said, a world of good. You have a soul, ma'am, said he. Fiddle-dee-dee, said the gardener. Don't be putting such stuff in her head. Soul indeed. A wife should be a body, a plain, decent body, and watch the pot to see that the porridge is not burnt. The burnt taste I can take out of the porridge with a little charcoal, said the dame, and out of you with a little kiss. One might fancy you thought of nothing but greens and potatoes, and yet you love the flowers. And so saying, she kissed him. Flowers are all soul, said she. Mind your porridge pot, said he, and went off into the garden. This was his porridge pot, and this he minded. But the underschoolmaster sat in the dame's parlour and talked with the dame. Her fine words, Earth is beauteous, he made the text of a whole sermon after his own fashion. Earth is beauteous, make it subject unto you, was said, and we became the lords. Some rule it with the mind, others with the body. 
This man is sent into the world like an incorporate note of admiration. That man like a dash of hesitation. We pause and ask, why is he here? One of us becomes a bishop, another only a poor undermaster. But all is for the best. Earth is beauteous and always in her Sunday gown. That was a thought-stirring poem, ma'am, full of feeling and cosmography. You have a soul, Mr. Kisserup, said the dame. A great deal of soul, I assure you. One gains clearness of perception by talking with you. And so they went on in the same strain, as grand and excellent as ever. But out in the kitchen there was somebody else talking, and that was the Niss, the little grey-jacketed Niss with his red cap. You know him. The Niss sat in the kitchen playing the pot-watcher. He talked, but nobody heard him except the great black tomcat, Cream Thief, as the dame called him. The Niss was snarling at her because she did not believe in his existence. He found, true, she had never seen him, but still with all her reading she ought to have known he did exist and have shown him some little attention. She never thought on Christmas Eve of setting so much as a spoonful of porridge for him, though all his forefathers had got this, and from dames too, who had no reading at all. Their porridge used to be swimming with cream and butter. It made the cat's mouth water to hear of it. "'She calls me an idea,' said the Niss. That's quite beyond the reach of my ideas. In fact, she denies me. I've caught her saying so before. And again, just now, yonder, where she sits droning to that boy-whipper, that understrapper. I say with Daddy, mind your porridge pot. And that she doesn't do. So now for making it boil over. And the Niss puffed at the fire till it burned and blazed. Hubble, bubble, hish, the pot boiled over. And now for picking holes in Daddy's sock, said the Niss. I'll unravel a long piece from toe to heel, so there'll be something to darn when she's not too busy poetizing. Dame Poetess, please darn Daddy's stockings. The cat sniggered and sneezed. He had caught cold somehow, though he always went in furs. "'I've unlatched the larder door,' said the Niss. "'There's clotted cream there, as thick as gruel. If you won't have a lick, I will.' "'If I am to get all the blame and beating,' said the cat, "'I'll have my share of the cream.' "'A sweet lick is worth a kick,' said the Niss. But now I'll be off to the schoolmaster's room, hang his braces on the looking-glass, put his socks in the water-jug, and make him believe that the punch has set his brain spinning. Last night I sat on the wood-stack by the kettle. I dearly loved to bully the watchdog, so I swung my legs about in front of him. His chain was so short he could not reach them, however high he sprang. He was furious, and went on bark-barking, and I went on dingle-dangling. Ah, that was rare sport. Schoolmaster awoke and jumped up and looked out three times, but he couldn't see me. Though he had got barnacles on, he sleeps in his barnacles." Say mew if dame is coming, said the cat. I am hard of bearing. I feel sick today. You have the licking sickness, said the Niss. Lick away, lick the sickness away. Only be sure to wipe your beard that the cream mayn't hang on it. Now I'll go for a bit of eavesdropping. And the Niss stood behind the door 
and the door stood ajar. There was no one in the parlour except the dame and the undermaster. They were talking about things which, as the schoolmaster finally observed, ought in every household to rank far above pots and pans. The Gifts of the Soul Mr. Kisserup, said the dame, I will now show you something in that line which I have never shown to any living creature, least of all to a man. My smaller poems, some of which, however, are rather long, I have called them clinchings by a gentlewoman. I cling to those old designations. And so one ought, said the schoolmaster, one ought to root the German out of our language. I'll do my best toward it, said the dame. You will never hear me speak of Butterdyke or Kleiner. No, I call them past leaves and fatty cakes. And she took out of her drawer a writing book in a bright green binding with two blotches of ink on it. There is much in the book that is earnest, said she. My mind inclines toward the sorrowful. Here, now, is my midnight sigh, my evening red, and here, when I was wedded to Clemenson, my husband, you know. You may pass that over, though it has thought and feeling. The housewife's duties is the best piece, sorrowful like all the rest. I am strongest in that style. Only one single piece is jocular, it contains some lively thoughts. One must indulge them now and then. Thoughts about, don't laugh at me, about being a poetess. It has hitherto been all between me and my trawl, and now you make a third of us, Mr. Kisserup. Poetry is my ruling passion. It haunts and worries me. It reigns over me. This I have expressed in my title, the little Niss. You know the old cottage tales about the Niss, who is always playing pranks in the house. I have depicted myself as the house, and my poetical feelings as the Niss, the spirit that possesses me. His power and strength I have sung in the little Niss. But you must pledge me with hands and mouth never to reveal my secret, either to my husband or any one else. Read it aloud, so that I may hear whether you understand the composition. And the schoolmaster read, and the dame listened, and so did the little Niss. He was eavesdropping, you know, and he came up just in time to hear the title of The Little Niss. How, how, said he, that's my name. What has she been writing about me? Oh, I'll give her tit for tat, chip her eggs, nip her chickens, hunt the fat off her fatted calf, fie upon such a dame. And he listened, with pursed up lips and pricked up ears. But as he heard of the Nissa's power and glory, and his lordship over the dame, it was poetry you know she meant, but the Niss took the name literally. The little fellow began smiling more and more. His eyes glistened with pleasure. Then came lines of dignity in the corners of his mouth. He drew up his heels and stood on his toes an inch or two higher than usual. He was delighted with what was said about the little Niss. I have done her wrong. She is a dame of soul and high breeding. She has put me into her clinchings, and they will be printed and read. No more cream for Master Cat. I shall let nobody touch it but myself. One drinks less than two, so that will be a saving, and I shall carry that out and pay respect and honour to our dame. Ah, oh, he is a man all over that niss, said the old cat. Only one soft mew from the dame, 
a mew about himself, and he changes his mind in a jiffy. And that dame of ours, isn't she sly? But the dame was not sly. It was all because the Nis was a man. If you cannot understand this story, ask somebody to help you, but do not ask the Nis. No, nor yet the dame. End of the Nis and the Dame. Recording by Michael Hall. Section 6 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866-1873, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. Section 6. The Dryad. Part 1. We are travelling to Paris for the exhibition. Now we are there. That was a journey, a flight without magic. We flew on the wings of steam over the sea and across the land. Yes, our time is the time of fairy tales. We are in the midst of Paris, in a great hotel. Blooming flowers ornament the staircases, and soft carpets the floors. Our room is a very cosy one, and through the open balcony door we have a view of a great square. Spring lives down there. It has come to Paris, and arrived at the same time with us. It has come in the shape of a glorious young chestnut tree, with delicate leaves newly opened. How the tree gleams, dressed in its spring garb, before all the other trees in the place. One of these latter had been struck out of the list of living trees. It lies on the ground with roots exposed. On the place where it stood, the young chestnut tree is to be planted, and to flourish. It still stands, towering aloft, on the heavy wagon which has brought it this morning a distance of several miles to Paris. For years it had stood there, in the protection of a mighty oak tree, under which the old venerable clergyman had often sat, with children listening to his stories. The young chestnut tree had also listened to the stories, for the dryad who lived in it was a child also. She remembered the time when the tree was so little that it only projected a short way above the grass and ferns around. These were as tall as they would ever be, but the tree grew every year, and enjoyed the air and the sunshine, and drank the dew and the rain. Several times it was also, as it must be, well shaken by the wind and the rain, for that is part of education. The dryad rejoiced in her life, and rejoiced in the sunshine, and the singing of the birds. But she was most rejoiced at human voices. She understood the language of men as well as she understood that of animals. Butterflies, cockchafers, dragonflies, everything that could fly came to pay a visit. They could all talk. They told of the village, of the vineyard, of the forest, of the old castle with its parks and canals and ponds. Down in the water dwelt also living things, which, in their way, could fly under the water from one place to another, beings with knowledge and delineation. They said nothing at all, they were so clever. And the swallow, who had dived, told about the pretty little goldfish, of the thick turbo, the fat brill, and the old carp. The swallow could describe all that very well, but, self is the man, she said, one ought to see these things oneself. But how was the dryad ever to see such things? She was obliged to be satisfied with being able to look over the pretty country and see the busy industry of men. It was glorious, but most glorious of all when the old clergyman sat under the oak tree and talked of France, and of the great deeds of her sons and daughters, whose names will be mentioned with admiration through all time. Then the dryad heard of the shepherd girl, Joan of Arc, and of Charlotte Corday. She heard about Henry the Fourth and Napoleon I. She heard names whose echoes sound in the hearts of the people. The village children listened attentively, and the dryad no less attentively. She became a schoolchild with the rest. In the clouds that went sailing by she saw, picture by picture, everything that she heard talked about. The cloudy sky was her picture book. 
she felt so happy in beautiful france the fruitful land of genius with the crater of freedom but in her heart the sting remained that the bird that every animal that could fly was much better off than she even the fly could look about more in the world far beyond the dryad's horizon france was so great and so glorious but she could only look across a little piece of it the land stretched out world-wide with vineyards forests and great cities of all of these paris was the most splendid and the mightiest the birds could get there but she never among the village children was a little ragged poor girl but a pretty one to look at she was always laughing or singing and twining red flowers in her black hair don't go to paris the old clergyman warned her poor child if you go there it will be your ruin but she went for all that the dryad often thought of her for she had the same wish and felt the same longing for the great city the dryad's tree was bearing its first chestnut blossoms the birds were twittering round them in the most beautiful sunshine then a stately carriage came rolling along that way and in it sat a grand lady driving the spirited light-footed horses on the back seat a little smart groom balanced himself the dryad knew the lady and the old clergyman knew her also he shook his head gravely when he saw her and said so you went there after all and it was to your ruin poor mary that one poor thought the dryad no she wears a dress fit for a countess she had become one in the city of magic changes oh if i were only there amid all the splendor and pomp they shine up into the very clouds at night when i look up i can tell in what direction the town lies toward that direction the dryad looked every evening she saw in the dark night the gleaming cloud on the horizon in the clear moonlight night she missed the sailing clouds which showed her pictures of the city and pictures from history the child grasps at the picture books the dryad grasped at the cloud world her thought book a sudden cloudless sky was for her a blank leaf and for several days she had only had such leaves before her it was in the warm summer time not a breeze moved through the glowing hot days every leaf every flower lay as if it were torpid and the people seemed torpid too then the clouds arose and covered the region round about where the gleaming mist announced here lies paris the clouds piled themselves up like a chain of mountains hurried on through the air and spread themselves abroad over the whole landscape as far as a dryad's eye could reach like enormous blue-black blocks of rock the clouds lay piled over one another gleams of lightning shot forth from them these are also the servants of the lord god the old clergyman had said and there came a bluish dazzling flash of lightning a lighting up as if of the sun itself which could burst blocks of rock asunder the lightning struck and split to the roots the old venerable oak the crown fell asunder it seemed as if the tree were stretching forth its arms to clasp the messengers of the light no bronze cannon can sound over the land at the birth of a royal child as the thunder sounded at the death of the old oak the rain streamed down a refreshing wind was blowing the storm had gone by and there was quite a holiday glow on all things the old clergyman spoke a few words for honorable remembrance and a painter made a drawing as a lasting record of the tree everything passes away said the dryad passes away like a cloud and never comes back the old clergyman too did not come back the green roof of the school was gone and his teaching chair had vanished the children did not come but autumn came and winter came and then spring also in all this change of seasons the dryad looked toward the region where at night paris gleamed with its bright mist far on the horizon forth from the town rushed engine after engine train after train whistling and screaming at all hours in the day in the evening toward midnight at daybreak and all the day through came the trains out of each one and into each one streamed people from the country of every king a new wonder of the world had summoned them to paris in what form did this wonder exhibit itself a splendid blossom of art and industry said one has unfolded itself in the champ de mars a gigantic sunflower from whose petals one can learn geography and statistics and can become as wise as a lord bear and raise one's self to the level of art and poetry 
and study the greatness and power of the various lands. A fairy tale flower, said another, a many colored lotus plant, which spreads out its green leaves like a velvet carpet over the sand. The opening spring has brought it forth, and summer will see it in all its splendor. The autumn winds will sweep it away, so that not a leaf, not a fragment of its roots, shall remain. In front of the military school extends in time of peace the arena of war, a field without a blade of grass, a piece of sandy steppe, as if cut out of the desert of Africa, where Fata Morgana displays her wondrous airy castles and hanging gardens. In the Champ de Mars, however, these were to be seen more splendid, more wonderful than in the East, for human art had converted the airy deceptive scenes into reality. The Aladdin's palace of the present has been built, it was said. Day by day, hour by hour, it unfolds more of its wonderful splendor. The endless halls shine in marble and many colors. Master Bloodless here moves his limbs of steel and iron in the great circular hall of machinery. Works of art in metal, in stone, in Gobelin's tapestry, announce the vitality of mind that is stirring in every land. Halls of paintings, splendor of flowers, everything that mind and skill can create in the workshop of the artisan has been placed here for show. Even the memorials of ancient days, out of old graves and turf moors, have appeared at this general meeting. The overpowering great variegated whole must be divided into small portions, and pressed together like a plaything if it is to be understood and described. Like a great table on Christmas Eve, the Champ de Mars carried a wonder castle of industry and art, and around this knick-knacks from all countries had been ranged, knick-knacks on a grand scale, for every nation found some remembrance of home. Here stood the royal palace of Egypt, there the cannibersary of desert land. The Bedouin had quitted his sunny country, and hastened by on his camel. There stood the Russian stables, with the fiery, glorious horses of the steppe. There stood the simple straw-thatched dwelling of the Danish peasant, with a Danibrog flag, next to Gustavus Vasa's wooden house from Dalana, with its wonderful carvings. American huts, English cottages, French pavilions, kiosks, theatres, churches, all strewn around, and between them the fresh green turf, the clear springing water, blooming bushes, rare trees, hothouses, in which one might fancy oneself transported into the tropical forest, whole gardens brought from Damascus and blooming under one roof. What colors! What fragrance! Artificial grottoes surrounded bodies of fresh or salt water and gave a glimpse into the empire of the fishes the visitors seemed to wander at the bottom of the sea among fishes and polypi. All this, they said, the Champ de Mars offers, and around the great richly spread table the crowd of human beings moves like a busy swarm of ants on foot or in little carriages, for not all feet are equal to such a fatiguing journey. Hither they swarm from morning till late in the evening. Steamer after steamer, crowded with people, glides down the Seine. The number of carriages is continually on the increase, the swarm of people on foot and on horseback grows more and more dense. Carriages and omnibuses are crowded, stuffed and embroidered with people. All these tributary streams flow in one direction, toward the exhibition. On every entrance the flag of France is displayed. Around the world's bazaar wave the flags of all nations. There is a humming and a murmuring from the hall of the machines. From the towers the melody of the chimes is heard. With the tones of the organs in the churches mingle the hoarse nasal songs from the cafes of the East. It is a kingdom of Babel, a wonder of the world. In very truth it was. That's what all the reports said, and who did not hear them? The dryad knew everything that is told here of the new wonder of the city of cities. Fly away, ye birds, fly away to sea. And then come back and tell me, said the dryad. The wish became an intense desire, became the one thought of a life. Then, in the quiet, silent night, while the full moon was shining, the dryad saw a spark fly out of the moon's disk and fall like a shooting star. And before the tree, whose leaves waved to and fro as if they were stirred by a tempest, stood a noble, mighty, and grand figure in tones that were at once rich and strong, like the trumpet of the last judgment bidding farewell to life and summoning to great account, it said, Thou shalt go to the city of magic. Thou shalt take root there, and enjoy the mighty rushing breezes, the air and the sunshine there. But the time of thy life shall then be shortened. 
the line of years that awaited thee here amid the free nature shall shrink to but a small tail poor dryad it shall be thy destruction thy yearning and longing will increase thy desire will grow more stormy the tree itself will be as a prison to thee thou wilt quit thy cell and give up thy nature to fly out and mingle among men then the years that would have belonged to thee will be contracted to half the span of the ephemeral fly that lives but a day one night and thy life taper shall be blown out the leaves of the tree will wither and be blown away to become green never again thus the words sounded and the light vanished away but not the longing of the dryad she trembled in the wild fever of expectation i shall go there she cried rejoicingly life is beginning and swells like a cloud nobody knows whither it is hastening when the gray dawn arose and the moon turned pale and the clouds were tinted red the wished-for hour struck the words of promise were fulfilled people appeared with spades and poles they dug round the roots of the tree deeper and deeper and beneath it a wagon was brought out drawn by many horses and the tree was lifted up with its roots and the lumps of earth that adhered to them matting was placed round the roots as though the tree had its feet in a warm bag and now the tree was lifted on the wagon and secured with chains the journey began the journey to paris there the tree was to grow as an ornament to the city of french glory the twigs and the leaves of the chestnut tree trembled in the first moments of it being moved and the dryad trembled in the pleasurable feeling of expectation away away it sounded in every beat of her pulse away away sounded in words that flew trembling along the dryad forgot to bid farewell to the regions of home she thought not of the waving grass and of the innocent daisies which had looked up to her as to a great lady a young princess playing at being a shepherdess out in the open air the chestnut tree stood upon the wagon and nodded his branches whether this meant farewell or forward the dryad knew not she dreamed only of the marvellous new things that seemed yet so familiar and that were to unfold themselves before her no child's heart rejoicing in innocence no heart whose blood danced with passion had set out on the journey to paris more full of expectations than she her farewell sounded in the words away away the wheels turned the distant approached and the present vanished the region was changed even as the clouds change new vineyards forests villages villas appeared came nearer vanished the chestnut tree moved forward and the dryad went with it steam engine after steam engine rushed past sending up into the air vapory clouds that formed figures which told of paris whence they came and whither the dryad was going everything around knew it and must know whither she was bound it seemed to her as if every tree she passed stretched out its leaves towards her with a prayer take me with you take me with you for every tree enclosed a longing dryad what changes during this flight houses seem to be rising out of the earth more and more thicker and thicker the chimneys rose like flower-pots ranged side by side or in rows one above the other on the roofs great inscriptions in letters a yard long and figures in various colors covering the walls from cornice to basement came brightly out where does paris begin and when shall i be there asked the dryad the crowd of people grew the tumult and the bustle increased carriage followed upon carriage people on foot and people on horseback were mingled together all around were shops on shops music and song crying and talking the dryad in her tree was now in the midst of paris the great heavy wagon all at once stopped on a little square planted with trees the high houses around had all of them balconies to the windows from which the inhabitants looked down upon the young fresh chestnut tree which was coming to be planted here as a substitute for the dead tree that lay stretched on the ground the passers-by stood still and smiled in admiration of its pure vernal freshness the older trees whose buds were still closed whispered with their waving branches welcome welcome the fountain throwing its jet of water high up in the air to let it fall again in the wide stone basin told the wind to sprinkle the newcomer with pearly drops as if it wished to give him a refreshing draught to welcome him 
the dryad felt how her tree was being lifted from the wagon to be placed in the spot where it was to stand the roots were covered with earth and fresh turf was laid on top blooming shrubs and flowers in pots were ranged round and thus a little garden arose in the square the tree that had been killed by the fumes of gas the steam of kitchens and the bad air of the city was put upon the wagon and driven away the passers-by looked on children and old men sat upon the bench and looked at the green tree and we who are telling this story stood upon a balcony and looked down upon the green spring site that had been brought in from the fresh country air and said what the old clergyman would have said poor dryad i am happy i am happy the dryad cried rejoicing and yet i cannot realize cannot describe what i feel everything is as i fancied it and yet as i did not fancy it the houses stood there so lofty so close the sunlight shone on only one of the walls and that one was stuck over with bills and placards before which the people stood still and this made a crowd carriages rushed past carriages rolled past light ones and heavy ones mingled together omnibuses those overcrowded moving houses came rattling by horsemen galloped among them even carts and wagons asserted their rights the dryad asked herself if these high-grown houses which stood so close around her would not remove and take other shapes like the clouds in the sky and draw aside so that she might cast a glance into paris and over it notre dame must show itself the vendome column and the wondrous building which had called and was still calling so many strangers to the city but the houses did not stir from their places it was yet day when the lamps were lit the gas jets gleamed from the shops and shone even into the branches of the tree so that it was like sunlight in summer the stars above made their appearance the same to which the dryad had looked up in her home she thought she felt a clear pure stream of air which went forth from them she felt herself lifted up and strengthened and felt an increased power of seeing through every leaf and through every fibre of the root amid all the noise and the turmoil the colours and the lights she knew herself watched by mild eyes from the side streets sounded the merry notes of fiddles and wind instruments up to the dance to the dance to jollity and pleasure that was their invitation such music it was that horses and carriages trees and houses would have danced if they had known how the charm of intoxicating delight filled the bosom of the dryad how glorious how splendid it is she cried rejoicingly now i am in paris the next day that dawned the next night that fell offered the same spectacle similar bustle similar life changing indeed yet always the same and thus it went on through the sequence of days now i know every tree every flower on the square here i know every house every balcony every shop in this narrow cut-off corner where i am denied the sight of this great mighty city where are the arches of triumph the boulevards the wondrous buildings of the world i see nothing of all this as if shut up in a cage i stand among the high houses which i now know by heart with their inscriptions signs and placards all the painted confectionery that is no longer to my taste where are all the things of which i heard for which i longed and for whose sake i wanted to come hither what have i seized found won i feel the same longing i felt before i feel that there is a life i should wish to grasp and to experience i must go out into the ranks of living men and mingle among them i must fly about like a bird i must see and feel and become human altogether i must enjoy the one half day instead of vegetating for years in everyday sameness and weariness in which i become ill and at last sink and disappear like the dew on the meadows i will gleam like the cloud gleam in the sunshine of life look out over the whole like the cloud and pass away like it no one knoweth whither thus sighed the dryad and she prayed take from me the years that were destined for me and give me but half the life of the ephemeral fly deliver me from my prison give me human life human happiness only a short span only the one night if it cannot be otherwise and then punish me for my wish to live my longing for life strike me out of thy list let my shell the fresh young tree wither or be hewn down and burnt to ashes and scattered to all the winds a rustling went through the leaves of the tree there was a trembling in each of the leaves 
it seemed as if fire streamed through it. A gust of wind shook its green crown, and from the midst of that crown a female figure came forth. In the same moment she was sitting beneath the brightly illuminated leafy branches, young and beautiful to behold, like poor Mary to whom the clergyman had said, The great city will be thy destruction. The dryad sat at the foot of the tree, at her house door, which she had locked and whose key had thrown away. So young, so fair, the stars saw her and blinked at her, the gaslight saw her and gleamed and beckoned to her. How delicate she was, and yet how blooming, a child, and yet a grown maiden. Her dress was fine as silk, green as the freshly opened leaves on the crown of the tree. In her nut-brown hair clung a half-open chestnut blossom. She looked like the goddess of spring. For one short minute she sat motionless. Then she sprang up, and light as a gazelle, she hurried away. She ran and sprang like the reflection from the mirror that, carried by the sunshine, is cast, now here, now there. Could any one have followed her with his eyes, he would have seen how marvelously her dress and her form changed, according to the nature of the house or the place whose light happened to shine upon her. She reached the boulevards. Here a sea of light streamed forth from the gas flames of the lamps, the shops, and the cafés. Here stood in a row young and slender trees, each of which concealed its dryad, and gave shade from the artificial sunlight. The whole vast pavement was one great festival hall, where covered tables stood laden with refreshments of all kinds, from champagne and chartreuse down to coffee and beer. Here was an exhibition of flowers, statues, books, and colored stuffs. From the crowd close by the lofty houses, she looked forth over the terrific stream beyond the rows of trees. Yonder heaved a stream of rolling carriages, cabriolets, coaches, omnibuses, cabs, and among them riding gentlemen and marching troops. To cross to the opposite shore was an undertaking fraught with danger to life and limb. Now lanterns shed their radiance abroad. Now the gas had the upper hand. Suddenly a rocket rises. Whence? Whither? Here are sounds of soft Italian melodies. Yonder Spanish songs are sung, accompanied by the rattle of the castanets. But strongest of all, and predominating over the rest, the street organ tunes of the moment, the exciting can-can music which Orpheus never knew, and which was never heard by the Belle Helene. Even the barrow was tempted to hop upon one of his wheels. The dryad danced, floated, flew, changing her color every moment like a hummingbird in the sunshine. Each house, with the world belonging to it, gave her its own reflections. As the glowing lotus flower, torn from its stem, is carried away by the stream, so the dryad drifted along. Wherever she paused, she was another being, so that none was able to follow her, to recognize her, or to look more closely at her. Like cloud pictures, all things flew by her. She looked into a thousand faces, but not one was familiar to her. She saw not a single form from home. Two bright eyes had remained in her memory. She thought of Mary, poor Mary the ragged Mary child, who wore the red flowers in her black hair. Mary was now here, in the world city, rich and magnificent, as in that day when she drove past the house of the old clergyman, and past the tree of the dryad, the old oak. Here she was certainly living in the deafening tumult. Perhaps she had just stepped out of one of the gorgeous carriages in waiting. Handsome equipages, with coachmen in gold braid, and footmen in silken hose, drove up. The people who alighted from them were all richly dressed ladies. They went through the opened gate and ascended the broad staircase that led to a building resting on marble pillars. Was this building, perhaps, the wonder of the world? There Mary would certainly be found. End of The Dryad, Part 1 Recording by Todd Section 7 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866-1873, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. Section 7. The Dryad. Part 2. Sancta Maria resounded from the interior. Incense floated through the lofty painted and gilded aisles, where a solemn twilight reigned. 
It was the Church of the Madeline. Clad in black garments of the most costly stuffs, fashioned according to the latest mode, the rich feminine world of Paris glided across the shining pavement. The crests of the proprietors were engraved on silver shields on the velvet-bound prayer books, and embroidered in the corners of perfumed handkerchiefs bordered with Brussels lace. A few of the ladies were kneeling in silent prayer before the altars. Others resorted to the confessionals. Anxiety and fear took possession of the dryad. She felt as if she had entered a place where she had no right to be. Here was the abode of silence, the hall of secrets. Everything was said in whispers. Every word was a mystery. The dryad saw herself enveloped in lace and silk, like the woman of wealth and of high birth around her. Had, perhaps, every one of them a longing in her breast, like the dryad? A deep, painful sigh was heard. Did it escape from some confessional in a distant corner, or from the bosom of the dryad? She drew the veil closer around her. She breathed incense and not the fresh air. Here was not the abiding place of her longing. Away, away! A hastening without rest. The ephemeral fly knows not repose, for her existence is flight. She was out again among the gas candelabra by a magnificent fountain. All its streaming waters are not able to wash out the innocent blood that was spilled here. Such were the words spoken. Strangers stood around, carrying on lively conversation, such as no one would have dared to carry on in the gorgeous hall of secrets whence the dryad came. A heavy stone slab was turned and then lifted. She did not understand why. She saw an opening that led into the depths below. The strangers stepped down, leaving the starlight air and the cheerful life of the upper world behind them. "'I am afraid,' said one of the women who stood around, to her husband. "'I cannot venture to go down, nor do I care for the wonders down yonder. You had better stay here with me.' "'Indeed, and travel home,' said the man, "'and quit Paris without having seen the most wonderful thing of all, the real wonder of the present period, created by the power and resolution of one man?' I will not go down for all that, was the reply. The wonder of the present time, it had been called. The dryad had heard and had understood it. The goal of her ardent longing had thus been reached, and here was the entrance to it. Down into the depths below Paris? She had not thought of such a thing, but now she heard it said, and saw the strangers descending, and went after them. The staircase was of cast iron, spiral, broad and easy. Below, there burned a lamp, and further down, another. They stood in a labyrinth of endless halls and arched passages, all communicating with each other. All the streets and lanes of Paris were there to be seen again, as in a dim reflection. The names were painted up, and every house above had its number down here also, and struck its roots under the macadamized keys of a broad canal, in which the muddy water flowed onward. Over it, the fresh streaming water was carried on arches and quite at the top hung the tangled net of gas-pipes and telegraph wires. In the distance, lamps gleamed, like a reflection from the world city above. Every now and then a dull rumbling was heard. This came from the heavy wagons rolling over the entrance bridges. Whither had the dryad come? You have, no doubt, heard of the catacombs? Now they are vanishing points in that new underground world, that wonder of the present day, the sewers of Paris. The dryad was there, and not in the world's exhibition in the Champ de Mars. She heard exclamations of wonder and admiration. From here go forth health and life for thousands upon thousands up yonder. Our time is the time of progress with its manifold blessings. Such was the opinion and the speech of men, but not of those creatures who had been born here and who had built and dwelt here, of the rats, namely, who were squeaking to one another in the clefts of a crumbling wall, quite plainly, and in a way the dryad understood well. A big old father rat, with his tail bitten off, was relieving his feelings in loud squeaks, and his family gave their tribute of concurrence to every word he said. "'I am disgusting with this man mewing,' he cried, "'with these outbursts of ignorance. A fine, magnificent, truly, all made up of gas and petroleum. I can't eat such stuff as that. Everything here is so fine and bright now that one's ashamed of oneself without exactly knowing why.' Ah, if we only lived in the days of tallow candles, and it does not lie so very far behind us. That was a romantic time, as one may say. What are you talking of there? asked the dryad. I have never seen you before. 
what is it that you are talking about of the glorious days that are gone said the rat of the happy time of our great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers then it was a great thing to get down here that was a rat's nest quite different from paris mother plague used to live here then she killed people but never rats robbers and smugglers could breathe freely here here was the meeting place of the most interesting personages whom one now only gets to see in the theatre where they act melodrama up above the time of romance is gone even in our rat's nest and here also fresh air and petroleum have broken in a carriage stopped a kind of open omnibus drawn by swift horses the company mounted and drove away along the boulevard de sebastopol that is to say the underground boulevard over which the well-known crowded street of that name extended the carriage disappeared in the twilight the dryad disappeared lifted to the cheerful freshness above here and not below in the vaulted passages filled with heavy air the wonder work must be found which she was to seek in her short lifetime it must gleam brighter than all the gas flames stronger than the moon which was just gliding past yes certainly she saw it yonder in the distance it gleamed before her and twinkled and glittered like the evening star in the sky she saw a glittering portal open that led to a little garden where all was brightness and dance music colored lamps surrounded little lakes in which were water plants of colored metal from whose flowers jets of water spurted up beautiful weeping willows real products of spring hung their fresh branches over these lakes like a fresh green transparent and yet screening veil in the bushes burnt an open fire throwing a red twilight over the quiet huts of branches into which the sounds of music penetrated an ear-tickling intoxicating music that sent the blood coursing through the veins beautiful girls in festive attire with pleasant smiles on their lips and the light spirit of youth in their hearts marys with roses in their hair but without carriage and postillion flitted to and fro in the wild dance where were the heads where the feet as if stung by tarantulas they sprang laughed rejoiced as if in their ecstasies they were going to embrace all the world the dryad felt herself torn with them into the whirl of the dance round her delicate foot clung the silken boot chestnut brown in colour like the ribbon that floated from her hair down upon her bare shoulders the green silk dress waved in large folds but did not entirely hide the pretty foot and ankle had she come to the enchanted garden of armida what was the name of the place the name glittered in gas jets over the entrance. It was Mabille. The soaring upwards of rockets, the splashing of fountains, and the popping of champagne corks accompanied the wild bacchanic dance. Over the whole glided the moon through the air, clear, but with a somewhat crooked face. A wild joviality seemed to rush through the dryad, as though she were intoxicated with opium. Her eyes spoke, her lips spoke, but the sound of violins and of flutes drowned the sound of her voice. Her partner whispered words to her that she did not understand, nor do we understand them. He stretched out his arms to draw her to him, but he embraced only the empty air. The dryad had been carried away, like a rose-leaf on the wind. Before her she saw a flame in the air, a flashing light high up on a tower. The beacon light shone from the goal of her longing, shone from the red lighthouse tower of the Fata Morgana of the Champ de Mars. Thither she was carried by the wind. She circled round the tower. The workmen thought it was a butterfly that had come too early, and that now sank down, dying. The moon shone bright. Gas lamps spread light around, through the halls, over the all-world's buildings scattered about, over the rose hills and the rocks produced by human ingenuity, from which waterfalls, driven by the power of Master Bloodless, fell down. The caverns of the sea, the depths of the lakes, the kingdom of the fishes were opened here, men walked as in the depths of the deep pond and held converse with the sea in the diving bell of glass the water pressed against the strong glass walls above and on every side the polypi eel-like living creatures had fastened themselves to the bottom and stretched out arms fathoms long for prey a big turbot was making himself broad in front quietly enough but not without casting some suspicious glances aside a crab clambered over him looking like a gigantic spider while the shrimp wandered about in restless haste, like the butterflies and moths of the sea. In the fresh water grew water lilies, nymphia, and reeds. The goldfishes stood up below in rank and file, all turning their heads one way, that the streaming water might flow into their mouths. Fat carps stared at the glass wall with stupid eyes. They knew that they were here to be exhibited, and that they had made the somewhat toilsome journey hither in tubs filled with water. 
and they thought with dismay of the land sickness from which they had suffered so cruelly on the railway. They had come to see the exhibition, and now contemplated it from their fresh or salt-water position. They looked attentively at the crowds of people who passed by them early and late. All the nations in the world, they thought, had made an exhibition of their inhabitants, for the edification of the souls and haddocks, pike and carp, that they might give their opinions upon the different kinds. "'Those are scaly animals,' said a little slimy whiting. "'They put on different scales two or three times a day, and they emit sounds which they call speaking. We don't put on scales, and we make ourselves understood in an easier way, simply by twitching the corners of our mouths and staring with our eyes. We have a great many advantages over mankind.' "'But they have learned swimming of us,' remarked a well-educated codling. "'You must know I come from the great sea outside. "'In the hot time of the year, the people yonder go into the water. First they take off their scales, and then they swim. "'They have learned from the frogs to kick out with their hind legs "'and row with their forepaws. "'But they cannot hold out long. "'They want to be like us, but they cannot come up to us. "'Poor people!' "'And the fishes stared.' They thought that the whole swarm of people whom they had seen in the bright daylight were still moving around them. They were certain they still saw the same forms that had first caught their attention. A pretty barbell, with spotted skin and an enviable round back, declared that the human fry were still there. "'I can see a well-set-up human figure quite well,' said the barbell. "'She was called Contumacious Lady, or something of that kind. She had a mouth and staring eyes like ours.' and a great balloon at the back of her head, and something like a shut-up umbrella up front. There were a lot of dangling bits of seaweed hanging round her. She ought to take all that rubbish off and go as we do. Then she would look something like a respectable barbel, so far as it is possible for a human to look like one. What became of that one whom they drew away with a hook? He sat on a wheelchair and had paper and pen and ink and wrote down everything. They called him a writer. "'They're going about with him still,' said a hoary old maid of a carp, who carried her misfortune about with her, so that she was quite hoarse. In her youth she had once swallowed a hook, and still swam patiently about with it in her gullet. "'A writer? That means, as we fishes describe it, a kind of cuddle or inkfish among men.' Thus the fishes gossiped in their own way. But in the artificial water grotto the laborers were busy, who were obliged to take advantage of the hours of night to get their work done by daybreak. They accompanied with blows of their hammers and with songs the parting words of the vanishing dryad. "'So at any rate I have seen you, you pretty goldfishes,' she said. "'Yes, I know you.' And she waved her hand to them. "'I have known about you a long time in my home. The swallows told me about you. "'How beautiful you are!' How delicate and shining! I should like to kiss every one of you. You others also, I know you all. But you do not know me. The fishes stared out into the twilight. They did not understand a word of it. The dryad was there no longer. She had been a long time in the open air, where the different countries, the country of black bread, the codfish coast, the kingdom of Russia leather, and the banks of eau de cologne, and the gardens of rose oil, exhaled their perfumes from the world wonder flower. When, after a night at a ball, we drive home half asleep and half awake, the melodies still sound plainly in our ears. We hear them, and could sing them all from memory. When the eye of the murdered man closes, the picture of what it saw last clings to it for a time like a photographic picture. So it was likewise here. The bustling life of day had not yet disappeared in the quiet night. The dryad had seen it. She knew. Thus it will be repeated tomorrow. The dryad stood among the fragrant roses, and thought she knew them, and had seen them in her own house. She also saw red pomegranate flowers, like those that little Mary had worn in her dark hair. Remembrances from the home of her childhood flashed through her thoughts. Her eyes eagerly drank in the prospect around, and feverish restlessness chased her through the wonder-filled halls. A weariness that increased continually took possession of her. She felt a longing to rest on the soft oriental carpets within, or to lean against the weeping willow without, by the clear water. But for the ephemeral fly there was no rest. In a few moments the day had completed its circle. Her thoughts trembled. Her limbs trembled. She sank down on the grass by the bubbling water. Thou wilt ever spring living from the earth, 
she said mournfully. Moisten my tongue. Bring me a refreshing draught. I am no living water, was the answer. I only spring upward when the machine wills it. Give me something of thy freshness, thou green grass, implored the dryad. Give me one of thy fragrant flowers. We must die if we are torn from our stalks, replied the flowers and the grass. Give me a kiss, thou fresh stream of air, only a single life kiss. Soon the sun will kiss the clouds red, answered the wind. Then thou wilt be among the dead, blown away, as all the splendor here will be blown away before the year shall have ended. Then I can play again with the light loose sand on the place here, and whirl the dust over the land and through the air. All is dust. The dryad felt a terror like a woman who has cut asunder her pulse artery in the bath, but is filled again with the love of life even while she is bleeding to death. She raised herself, tottered forward a few steps, and sank down again at the entrance to a little church. The gate stood open, lights were burning upon the altar, and the organ sounded. What music! Such notes the dryad had never yet heard. And yet it seemed to her as if she recognized a number of well-known voices among them, they came deep from the heart of all creation. She thought she heard the stories of the old clergymen, of great deeds, and of the celebrated names, and of the gifts that the creatures of God must bestow upon posterity if they would live on in the world. The tones of the organ swelled, and in their song there sounded these words. Thy wish and thy longing have torn thee, with thy roots, from the place which God appointed for thee. That was thy destruction, thou poor dryad. The notes became soft and gentle, and seemed to die away in a wail. In the sky, the clouds showed themselves with a ruddy gleam. The wind sighed, Pass away, ye dead. Now the sun is going to rise. The first ray fell on the dryad. Her form was irradiated in changing colors, like the soap bubble when it is bursting and becomes a drop of water, like a tear that falls and passes away like a vapor. Poor dryad, only a dewdrop, only a tear, poured upon the earth and vanished away. End of Section 7 The Dryad Part 2 Recording by Todd Section 8 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866-1873, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. B. Paul. THE COURT CARDS How many beautiful things may be cut out and pasted on paper! Thus a castle was cut out and pasted, so large that it filled a whole table, and it was painted as if it were built of red stones. It had a shining copper roof, it had towers and a drawbridge, water in the canals just like plate glass, for it was plate glass, and in the highest tower stood a wooden watchman. He had a trumpet, but he did not blow it. The hall belonged to a little boy, whose name was William. He raised the drawbridge himself, and let it down again, made his tin soldiers march over it, opened the castle gate, and looked into the large and elegant drawing-room, where all the court cards of a pack, hearts, diamond, clubs, and spades, hung in frames on the walls, like pictures in real drawing-rooms. The kings held each a sceptre, and wore crowns. The queens wore veils flowing down over their shoulders, and in their hands they held a flower or a fan. The knaves had halberds and nodding plumes. One evening the little boy peeped through the open castle gate to catch a glimpse of the court cards in the drawing-room, and it seemed to him that the king saluted him with their sceptres, that the queen of spades swung the golden tulip which she had held in her hand that a queen of hearts lifted her fan, and that all four queens graciously recognized him. He drew a little nearer, in order to see better, and that made him hit his head against the castle so that it shook. 
then all the four knaves of hearts diamonds club and spades raised their halberds to warn him that he must not try to get in that way the little boy understood the hint and gave a friendly nod he nodded again and then said say something but the knaves did not say a word however the third time he nodded the knave of hearts sprang out of the cart and placed himself in the middle of the floor what is your name the knave asked the little boy you have clear eyes and good teeth but your hands are dirty you do not wash them often enough now this was rather coarse language but of course not much politeness can be expected from a knave he is only a common fellow my name is william said the little boy and the castle is mine and you are my knave of hearts no i am not i am my king's and my queen's knave not yours said the knave of hearts i am not obliged to stay here i can go down off the card and out of the frame too and so can my gracious king and queen even more easily than i we can go out into the wide world but that is such a wearisome march we have grown tired of it it is more convenient more easy more agreeable to be sitting in the cards and just be ourselves have all of you really been human beings once asked little william human beings repeated the knave of hearts yes we have but not so good as we ought to have been please now light a little wax candle i like a red one best for that is the colour of my king and queen then i will tell the lord of the castle i think you said you were the lord of the castle did you not our whole history but for goodness sake don't interrupt me for if i speak it must be done without any interruption whatever i am in a great hurry do you see my king i mean the king of hearts he is the oldest of the four kings here for he was born first born with a golden crown and a golden apple he began to rule at once his queen was born with a golden fan that she still has they both were very agreeably situated even from infancy they did not have to go to school they could play the whole day build castles and knock them down marshal tin soldiers for battle and play with dolls when they asked for buttered bread then there was butter on both sides of the bread and powdered brown sugar too nicely spread over it it was a good old time and it was called the golden age but they grew tired of it and so did i then the king of diamonds took the reins of government the knave said nothing more little william wanted to hear something further but not a syllable was uttered so presently he asked well and then the knave of hearts did not answer he stood up straight silent bald and stiff his eyes fixed upon the burning wax candle little william nodded he nodded again but no reply then he turned to the knave of diamonds and when he had nodded to him three times he sprang out of the card in the middle of the floor and uttered only one single word wax candle little william understood what he meant and immediately lighted a red candle and placed it before him then the knave of diamonds presented arms for that is a token of respect and said then the king of diamonds succeeded to the throne he was a king with a pane of glass on his breast also the queen had a pane of glass on her breast so that people could look right into her for the rest they were formed like other human beings and were so agreeable and so handsome that a monument was erected in honour of them which stood for seven years without falling properly speaking it should have stood for ever for so it was intended but for some unknown reason it fell then the knave of diamonds presented arms out of respect for his king and he looked fixedly on his red wax candle but now at once without any nod or invitation from little william the knave of club stepped out grave and proud like the stalk that struts with such a dignified air over the green meadow the black clover leaf in the corner of the card flew like a bird beyond the knave and then flew back again and stuck itself where it had been sticking before and without waiting for his wax candle the knave of club spoke not all get butter on both sides of the bread and brown powdered sugar on that my king and queen did not get it they had to go to school and learn what they had not learnt before they also had a pane of glass on their breasts but nobody looked through it except to see if there was not something wrong with their works inside in order to find if possible some reason for giving them a scolding i know it i have served my king and queen all my lifetime i know everything about them and obey their commands they bid me say nothing more to-night i keep silent therefore and present arms 
but little William was a kind-hearted boy, so he lighted a candle for this knave also, a shining white one, white like snow. No sooner was the candle lighted than the knave of spades appeared in the middle of the drawing-room. He came hurriedly, yet he limped as if he had a sore leg. Indeed, it had once been broken, and he had had, moreover, many ups and downs in his life. He spoke as follows. "'My brother knaves have each got a candle, and I shall also get one. I know that. But if we poor knaves have so much honour, our kings and queen must have thrice as much. Now it is proper that my king of spades and my queen of spades should have four candles to gladden them. An additional honour ought to be conferred upon them. Their history and trials are so doleful that they have very good reason to wear mourning, and to have a grave digger's spade on their coat of arms. My own fate, poor knave that I am, is deplorable enough. In one game at cards, I have got a nickname of Black Peter. Footnote. Black Peter is the name of a game in Denmark, where it is called Sorteper, the word Sorte denoting black. When the cards are dealt, he who happens to get the name of spades is all the evening nicknamed Black Peter by his fellow players who paint his face black. End footnote. But alas, I have got a still uglier name, which, indeed, it is hardly the thing to mention aloud. And then he whispered, In another game, I have been nicknamed Dirty Mutts. Footnote. Dirty Mutts is another Danish game. Mutts is a name almost exclusively in use among the peasantry. End footnote. I, who was once the King of Spades, Lord Chamberlain. Is not this a bitter fate? The history of my royal master and queen I will not relate. They don't wish me to do so. Little Lord of the Castle, as he calls himself, may guess it himself if he chooses, but it is very lamentable. Oh, no doubt about that. Their circumstances have become very much reduced, and are not likely to change for the better, until we are all riding on the red horse higher than the skies, where there are no haps and mishaps. Little William now lighted, as the knave of spades had said was proper, three candles for each of the kings and three for each of the queens. But for the queen and king of spades he lighted four candles apiece, and the whole drawing-room became as light and transparent as a palace of the richest emperor, and the illustrious king and queens bowed to each other serenely and graciously. The queen of hearts made her golden fan bow, and the queen of spades swung her golden tulip in such a way that a stream of fire issued from it. The royal couples alighted from the cards and frames, and moved in a slow and graceful minuet up and down the floor. They were dancing in the very midst of flames, and the knaves were dancing too. But alas, the whole drawing-room was soon in a blaze. The devouring element roared up through the roof, and all was one crackling and hissing sheet of fire, and in a moment little William's castle itself was enveloped in flames and smoke. The boy became frightened and ran off, crying to his father and mother, "'Fire! Fire! Fire! My castle is on fire!' He grew pale as ashes, and his little hands trembled like the aspen leaf. The fire continued sparkling and blazing, but in the midst of this destructive scene the following words were uttered in a singing tone. "'Now we are riding on the red horse, higher than the skies. This is the way for kings and queens to go, and this is the way for their knaves to go after them.' Yes, that was the end of William's castle, and of the court cards. William did not perish in the flames. He is still alive and he washed his small hands and said, I am innocent of the destruction of the castle. And indeed, it was not his fault that the castle was burnt down. End of The Court Cards Section 9 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866-1873, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. B. Paul. Good luck can lie in a pin. Now I shall tell you a story about good luck. We all know good luck. Some see it from year's end to year's end, others only at certain seasons, on a certain day. There are even people who only see it once in their lives, but see it we all do. 
now I need not tell you, for every one knows it, that God sends the little child and lays it in the mother's lap. It may be in the rich castle, and in the well-to-do house, but it may also be in the open field where the cold wind blows. Every one does not know, however, but it is true all the same, that God, when he brings the child, brings also a lucky gift for it. But it is not laid openly by its side. It is laid in some place in the world where one would least expect to find it, and yet it always is found. That is the best of it. It may be laid in an apple. It was so for a learned man who was called Newton. An apple fell, and so he found his good luck. If you do not know the story, then ask someone who knows it to tell it to you. I have another story to tell, and that is a story about a pear. Once upon a time there was a man who was born in poverty, had grown up in poverty, and in poverty he had married. He was a turner by trade, and made, especially, umbrella handles and rings, but he only lived from hand to mouth. I never find good luck, he said. This is a story that really happened, and one could name the country and the place where the man lived, but that doesn't matter. The red, sour rowan berries grew in richest profusion about his house and garden. In the garden there was also a pear tree, but it did not bear a single pear, and yet the good luck was laid in that pear tree, laid in the invisible pears. One night the wind blew a terrible storm. They told in the newspapers that the big stagecoach was lifted off the road and thrown aside like a rag. It could very well happen, then, that a great branch was broken off the pear tree. The branch was put into the workshop, and the man, as a joke, made a big pear out of it, and then another big one, then a small one, and then some very little ones. "'The tree must some time or other have pears,' the man said, and he gave them to the children to play with. One of the necessities of life in a wet country is an umbrella. The whole house had only one for common use. If the wind blew too strong, the umbrella turned inside out. It also snapped two or three times, but the man soon put it right again. The most provoking thing, however, was that the button which held it together when it was down too often jumped off, or the ring which was round it broke in two. One day the button flew off. The man searched for it on the floor, and there got hold of one of the smallest of the wooden pairs which the children had got to play with. "'The button is not to be found,' said the man. But this little thing will serve the same purpose. So he bored a hole in it, pulled a string through it, and the little pair fitted very well into the broken ring. It was assuredly the very best fastener their umbrella had ever had. Next year, when the man was sending umbrella handles to the town, as he regularly did, he also sent some of the little wooden pairs, and begged that they might be tried. And so they came to America. There they very soon noticed that the little pairs held much better than any other button, and now they demanded of the merchant that all the umbrellas which were sent after that should be fastened with a little pear. Now there was something to do, pears in thousands, wooden pears on all umbrellas. The man must set to work. He turned and turned. The whole pear tree was cut up into little pears. It brought in pennies, it brought in shillings. My good luck was laid in the pear tree, said the man. He now got a big workshop with workmen and boys. He was always in a good humour, and said, "'Good luck can lie in a pin.' I also, who tell the story, say so. People have a saying, "'Take a white pin in your mouth, and you will be invisible.' But it must be the right pin, the one which was given us as a lucky gift by our Lord. I got that, and I also, like the man, can catch chinking gold, gleaming gold, the very best, that kind which shines from children's eyes, the kind that sounds from children's mouths, and from father to mother too. They read the stories, and I stand among them in the middle of the room, but invisible, for I have the white pin in my mouth. If I see that they are delighted with what I tell them, then I also say, Good luck can lie in a pin. End of Good luck can lie in a pin Section 10 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866 to 1873, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. B. Paul. 
sunshine stories. "'Now I am going to tell you a story,' said the wind. "'Excuse me,' said the rain, "'but now it is my turn. You have been howling round the corner as hard as ever you could, this long time past.' "'Is that your gratitude towards me?' said the wind. "'I, who in honour of you, turn inside out, yes, even break all the umbrellas when people won't have anything to do with you.' "'I am going to speak,' said the sunshine. "'Silence!' And the sunshine said it with such glory and majesty that the long, weary wind fell prostrate, and the rain beat against him, and shook him, and said, "'We won't stand it. She always breaks through that Madame Sunshine. We won't listen to her. What she says is not worth hearing.' But the sunshine said, a beautiful swan flew over the rolling, tumbling waves of the ocean. Every one of its feathers shone like gold. One feather drifted down on the great merchant vessel that, with all sail set, was sailing away. The feather dropped on the curly light hair of a young man, whose business it was to have a care for the goods. Supercargo, they call him. The bird of fortune's feather touched his forehead, became a pen in his hand, and brought him such luck that very soon he became a wealthy merchant rich enough to have bought for himself spurs of gold, rich enough to change a golden dish into a noble man's shield, and I shone on it, said the sunshine. The swan flew further, away from the bright green meadow, where the little shepherd boy, only seven years old, had lain down in the shadow of the old and only tree there was. The swan, in its flight, kissed one of the leaves of the tree, the leaf fell into the boy's hand, and it was changed to three leaves, to ten, yes, to a whole book, and in it he read about all the wonders of nature, about his native language, about faith and knowledge. At night he laid the book under his head, that he might not forget what he had been reading. The wonderful book led him to the school bench, and thence in search of knowledge. I have read his name among the names of learned men, said the sunshine. The swan flew into the quiet, lonely forest, rested a while in the dark, deep lake, where the water-lilies grow, where the wild apples are to be found on the shore, where the cuckoo and wild pigeon have their homes. A poor woman in the wood, gathering firewood branches that had fallen down, and dry sticks, she carried them in a bundle on her back, and in her arms she held her little child. She saw the golden swan, the bird of fortune, rise from among the reeds on the shore, what was that that glittered? A golden egg, quite warm yet. She laid it in her bosom, and the warmth remained in it. Surely there was life in the egg. She heard a gentle picking inside of the shell, but mistook the sound, and thought it was her own heart that she heard beating. At home, in the poor cottage, she took out the egg. Tick, tick, it said, as if it had been a valuable gold watch. But that it was not, only an egg, a real living egg. The egg cracked and opened, and a dear little baby swan, all feathered as with purest gold, put out its little head. Round its neck it had four rings, and as the poor woman had four boys, three at home and the little one that she had had with her in the lonely wood, she understood at once that here was the ring for each boy, and just as she thought of that, the little gold bird took flight. She kissed each ring, made each of the children kiss one of the rings, laid it next to the child's heart, then put it on his finger. I saw it all, said the sunshine, and I saw what followed. One of the boys was playing in a ditch, and took a lump of clay in his hand, turned and twisted and pressed it between his fingers, till it took shape, and was like Jason, who went in search of and found the golden fleece. The second boy ran out on the meadow, where the flowers stood, flowers of all imaginable colours. He gathered a handful, and squeezed them so tight, that all the juice spurted into his eyes, and some of it wetted the ring. It cribbled and crawled in his thoughts, and in his hands, and after many a day, and many a year, people in the great city talked of the great painter. The third child held the ring so tight in his teeth, that it gave forth a sound, an echo of the song in the depth of his heart. Thoughts and feelings rose in beautiful sounds, rose like singing swans, plunged like swans into the deep, deep sea. He became a great master, a great composer, of whom every country has the right to say, He was mine. And the fourth little one was, Yes, he was, the ugly duck of the family. They said he had the pip, 
and must have pepper and butter, like the little sick chickens, and that he got. But of me he got a warm, sunny kiss, said the sunshine. He got ten kisses for one. He was a poet, and was buffeted and kissed alternately all his life. But he held what no one could take from him, the ring of fortune, the dame fortune's golden swan. His thoughts took wings and flew up and away, like singing butterflies, the emblem of immortality. "'That was a dreadfully long story,' said the wind. "'And oh, how stupid and tiresome,' said the rain. "'Blow on me, please, that I may revive a little.' And the wind blew, and the sunshine said, "'The swan of fortune flew over the beautiful bay where the fishermen had set their nets. The poorest of them wanted to get married, and marry he did.' To him the swan brought a piece of amber. Amber draws things toward it, and it drew hearts to the house. Amber is the most wonderful incense, and there came a soft perfume, as from a church. There came a sweet breath from out of beautiful nature that God has made. They were so happy and grateful for their peaceful home, and content even in their poverty. Their life became a real sunshine story. "'I think we had better stop now,' said the wind. "'The sunshine has talked long enough, and I am dreadfully bored.' "'And I also,' said the rain. "'And what do we others who have heard the story say?' "'We say, now my story is done.'" End of Sunshine Stories Section 11 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Justice. What One Can Invent by Hans Christian Andersen, 1869 There was once a young man who was studying to be a poet. He wanted to become one by Easter, and to marry, and to live by poetry. To write poems, he knew, only consist in being able to invent something, but he could not invent anything. He had been born too late. Everything had been taken up before he came into the world, and everything had been written and told about. Happy people, who were born a thousand years ago, said he, it was an easy matter for them to become immortal. Happy even was he who was born a hundred years ago, for then there was still something about which a poem could be written. Now the world is written out, and what can I write poetry about? Then he studied till he became ill and wretched. The wretched man. No doctor could help him, but perhaps the wise woman could. She lived in the little house by the wayside, where the gate is that she opened for those who rode and drove. But she could do no more than unlock the gate. She was wiser than the doctor who drives in his own carriage and pays tax for his rank. I must go to her, said the young man. The house in which she dwelt was small and neat, but dreary to behold, for there were no flowers near it, no trees. By the door stood a beehive, which was very useful. There was also a little potato field, very useful, and an earth bank, with sloe bushes upon it, which had done blossoming, and now bore fruit, sloes, that draw one's mouth together if one tastes them before the frost has touched them. That's a true picture of our poetryless time that I see before me now, thought the young man, and that was at least a thought, a grain of gold that he found by the door of the wise woman. Write that down, said she. Even crumbs are bread. I know why you come hither. You cannot invent anything, and yet you want to be a poet by Easter. Everything has been written down, said he. Our time is not the old time. No said the woman. In the old time, wise women were burnt, and poets went about with empty stomachs and very much out at elbows. The present time is good. It is the best of times, but you have not the right way of looking at it. Your ear is not sharpened to hear, and I fancy you do not say the Lord's Prayer in the evening. There is plenty here to write poems about and to tell of for anyone who knows the way. You can read it in the fruits of the earth. You can draw it from the flowing and the standing water, but you must understand how. You must understand how to catch a sunbeam. Now just you try my spectacles on, and put my ear trumpet to your ear, and then pray to God, and leave off thinking of yourself. 
The last was a very difficult thing to do, more than a wise woman ought to ask. He received the spectacles in the ear trumpet, and was posted in the middle of the potato field. She put a great potato into his hand. Sounds came from within it. There came a song with words, the history of the potato, an everyday story in ten parts, an interesting story, and ten lines were enough to tell it in. And what did the potato sing? She sang of herself and her family, of the arrival of the potato in Europe, of the misrepresentation to which she had been exposed before she was acknowledged, as she is now, to be a greater treasure than a lump of gold. We were disturbed by the king's command from the council houses through the various towns and proclamation was made of our great value but no one believed in it or even understood how to plant us one man dug a hole in the earth and threw in his whole bushel of potatoes another put one potato here and another there in the ground and expected that each was to come up a perfect tree from which he might shake down potatoes and they certainly grew and produced flowers and green watery fruit but it all withered away nobody thought of what was in the ground the blessing the potato yes we have endured and suffered that is to say our forefathers have they and we it is all one what a story it was well and that will do said the woman now look at the slow bush we have also some near relations in the home of the potatoes but higher towards the north than they grew said the slows there were northmen from norway who steered westward through mist and storm to an unknown land where behind ice and snow they found plants and green meadows and bushes with blue-black grapes slow bushes the grapes were ripened by the frost just as we are, and they called the land wine land, that is, grown land, or slow land. That is quite a romantic story, said the young man. Yes, certainly, but now come with me, said the wise woman, and she led him to the beehive. He looked into it. What life and labor! There were bees standing in all the passages, waving their wings, so that a wholesome draught of air might blow through the great manufactory. That was their business. Then there came in bees from without, who had been born with little baskets on their feet. They brought flower dust, which was poured out, sorted, and manufactured into honey and wax. They flew in and out. The queen bee wanted to fly out, but then all the other bees must have gone with her. It was not yet the time for that. But still she wanted to fly out, so the others bit off her majesty's wings, and she had to stay where she was. Now get on upon the earth bank, said the wise woman. Come and look out over the highway, where you can see the people. What a crowd it is, said the young man. One story after another. It whirls and whirls. It's quite a confusion before my eyes. I shall go out at the back. No, go straight forward said the woman go straight into the crowd of people look at them in the right way have an ear to hear and the right heart to feel and you will soon invent something but before you go away you must give me my spectacles and my ear trumpet again and so saying she took both from him now i do not see the smallest thing said the young man and now i don't hear anything more why then you can't be a poet by easter said the wise woman but by what time can i be one asked he neither by easter nor whitsuntide you will not learn how to invent anything what must i do to earn my bread by poetry you can do that before shrove tuesday hunt the poets kill their writings and thus you will kill them don't be put out of countenance strike at them boldly and you'll have carnival cake on which you can support yourself and your wife too what can one invent cried the young man and so he hit out boldly at every second poet because he could not be a poet himself we have it from the wise woman she knows what one can invent end of section eleven section twelve of hans christian andersen fairy tales and short stories volume six 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Olson. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866 to 1873, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Thistle's Experiences. Belonging to the lordly manor house was a beautiful, well kept garden, with rare trees and flowers. The guests of the proprietor declared their admiration of it. The people of the neighborhood, from town and country, came on Sundays and holidays and asked permission to see the garden. Indeed, whole schools used to pay visits to it. Outside the garden, by the palings at the roadside, stood a great mighty thistle, which spread out in many directions from the root, so that it might have been called a thistle bush. Nobody looked at it, except the old ass which drew the milkmaid's cart. This ass used to stretch out his neck towards the thistle, and say, You are beautiful! I should like to eat you! But his halter was not long enough to let him reach it and eat it. There was great company at the manor house. Some very noble people from the capital, young pretty girls and among them a young lady who came from a long distance. She had come from Scotland and was of high birth and was rich in land and in gold. A bride worth winning said more than one of the young gentlemen, and their lady mothers said the same thing. The young people amused themselves on the lawn and played at ball. They wandered among the flowers, and each of the young girls broke off a flower and fastened it in a young gentleman's buttonhole. But the young Scotch lady looked around for a long time in an undecided way. None of the flowers seemed to suit her taste. Then her eye glanced across the paling. Outside stood the great thistle bush with the reddish-blue sturdy flowers. She saw them, she smiled, and asked the son of the house to pluck one for her. It is the flower of Scotland, she said. It blooms in the scutcheon of my country. Give me yonder flower. And he brought the fairest blossom, and pricked his fingers as completely as if it had grown on the sharpest rose bush. She placed the thistle flower in the buttonhole of the young man, and he felt himself highly honored. Each of the other young gentlemen would willingly have given his own beautiful flower to have worn this one, presented by the fair hand of the Scottish maiden. And if the son of the house felt himself honored, what were the feelings of the thistle bush? It seemed to him as if dew and sunshine were streaming through him. I am something more than I knew of, said the thistle to itself. I suppose my right place is really inside the palings and not outside. One is often strangely placed in this world, but now I have at least managed to get one of my people within the pale, and indeed into a buttonhole. The thistle told this event to every blossom that unfolded itself, and not many days had gone by before the thistle heard, not from men, not from the twittering of the birds, but from the air itself, which stores up the sounds and carries them far around, out of the most retired walks of the garden and out of the rooms of the house in which doors and windows stood open, that the young gentleman who had received the thistle flower from the hand of the fair Scottish maiden had also now received the heart and hand of the lady in question. They were a handsome pair. It was a good match. That match I made up, said the thistle and he thought of the flower he had given for the buttonhole. Every flower that opened heard of this occurrence. I shall certainly be transplanted into the garden, thought the thistle, and perhaps put into a pot which crowds one in. That is said to be the greatest of all honors. And the thistle pictured this to himself in such a lively manner that at last he said with full conviction, I am to be transplanted into a pot. Then he promised every little thistle flower which unfolded itself that it also should be put into a pot, and perhaps into a buttonhole, the highest honor that could be attained. But not one of them was put into a pot, much less into a buttonhole. They drank in the sunlight and the air, lived on the sunlight by day and on the dew by night, bloomed, were visited by bees and hornets who looked after the honey, the dowry of the flower, and they took the honey and left the flower where it was. The thievish rabble, said the thistle. If I could only stab every one of them. 
but I cannot. The flowers hung their heads and faded, but after a time, new ones came. You come in good time, said the thistle. I am expecting every moment to get across the fence. A few innocent daisies and a long thin dandelion stood and listened in deep admiration and believed everything they heard. The old ass of the milk cart stood at the edge of the field road and glanced across at the blooming thistle bush. But his halter was too short, and he could not reach it. And the thistle thought so long of the thistle of Scotland, to whose family he said he belonged, that he fancied at last that he had come from Scotland, and that his parents had been put into the national escutcheon. That was a great thought. But you see, a great thistle has a right to a great thought. One is often of so grand a family that one may not know it, said the nettle, who grew close by. He had a kind of idea that he might be made into cambric if he were rightly treated. And the summer went by, and the autumn went by. The leaves fell from the trees, and the few flowers left had deeper colors and less scent. The gardener's boy sang in the garden across the palings. Up the hill, down the dale we wend. That is life from beginning to end. The young fir trees in the forest began to long for Christmas, but it was a long time to Christmas yet. Here I am standing yet, said the thistle. It is as if nobody thought of me, and yet I managed the match. They were betrothed, and they have had their wedding. It is now a week ago. I won't take a single step, because I can't. A few more weeks went by. The thistle stood there with his last single flower, large and full. This flower had shot up from near the roots. The wind blew cold over it, and the colors vanished, and the flower grew in size and looked like a silvered sunflower. One day the young pair, now man and wife, came into the garden. They went along by the paling, and the young wife looked across it. There's the great thistle still growing, she said. It has no flowers now. Oh yes, the ghost of the last one is there still, said he, and he pointed to the silvery remains of the flower, which looked like a flower themselves. It is pretty, certainly, she said. Such a one must be carved on the frame of our picture. And the young man had to climb across the palings again, and to break off the calyx of the thistle. It pricked his fingers, but then he had called it a ghost. And this thistle calyx came into the garden, and into the house, and into the drawing room. There stood a picture, young couple. A thistle flower was painted in the buttonhole of the bridegroom. They spoke about this, and also about the thistle flower they brought, the last thistle flower, now gleaming like silver, whose picture was carved on the frame. And the breeze carried what was spoken away, far away. What one can experience, said the thistle bush. My firstborn was put into a buttonhole, and my youngest has been put in a frame. Where shall I go? And the ass stood by the roadside and looked across at the thistle. Come to me, my nibble darling, said he. I can't get across to you. But the thistle did not answer. He became more and more thoughtful, kept on thinking and thinking till near Christmas. And then... A flower of thought came forth. If the children are only good, the parents do not mind standing outside the garden pail. That's an honorable thought, said the sunbeam. You shall also have a good place. In a pot or in a frame? asked the thistle. In a story, replied the sunbeam. End of the thistle's experiences. Section 13 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruby Huck. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. 1866 to 1873 by Hans Christian Andersen, 
Translated by H. B. Paul. Chapter thirteen. Eighteen seventy. There was once a big wax candle which knew its own importance quite well. I am born of wax and moulded in a shape, it said. I give better light and burn longer than other candles. My place is in a chandelier or on a silver candlestick. That must be a lovely existence, said the tallow candle. I am only made of tallow, but I comfort myself with the thought that it is always a little better than being a farthing dip. That is only dipped twice for I am dipped eight times to get my proper thickness. I am content. It is certainly finer and more fortunate to be born of wax instead of tallow. But one does not settle one's own place in this world. You are placed in a big room in a glass chandelier. I remain in the kitchen, but that is also a good place. From there the whole house gets its food. But there is something which is more important than food, said the wax candle society to see it shine and to shine oneself there is a ball this evening and soon i and all my family will be fetched scarcely was the word spoken when all the wax candles were fetched but the tallow candle also went with them the lady herself took it in her dainty hand and carried it out to the kitchen a little boy stood there with a basket which was filled with potatoes two or three apples also found their way there the good lady gave all this to the poor boy. There's a candle for you as well, my little friend, said she. Your mother sits and works till late in the night. She can use it. The little daughter of the house stood close by, and when she heard the words late in the night, she said with great delight, I shall also stay up till late in the night. We shall have a ball, and I shall wear my big red sash. How her face shone! that was with joy no wax candle can shine like two childish eyes that is a blessing to see thought the tallow candle i shall never forget it and i shall certainly never see it again and so it was laid in the basket under the lid and the boy went away with it where shall i go now thought the candle i shall go to poor people and perhaps not even get a brass candlestick while the wax candle sits in silver and sees all the grand people how lovely it must be to shine for the grand people but it was my lot to be tallow and not they and so the candle came to the poor people a widow with three children in a little low room right opposite the rich house god bless the good lady for her gifts said the mother what a lovely candle that is it can burn till late in the light and then the candle was lighted free foy what foy it said what a horrid smelling match that was she lighted me with the wax candle over in the rich house would not have such treatment offered to it there also the candles were lighted they shone out across the street the carriages rolled up with the elegant ball guests and the music played now they begin across there the tallow candle noticed and thought of the beaming face of the rich little girl more sparkling than all the wax lights that sight i shall never see again then the smallest of the children in the poor house a little girl came and took her mother and sister round the neck she had something very important to tell them and it must be whispered tonight you shall have just think Tonight you shall have hot potatoes. And her face shone with happiness. The tallow candle shone right into it, and it saw a gladness, a happiness as great as over in the rich house, where the little girl said, We shall have a ball tonight, and I shall wear my big red sash. It is just as much to get hot potatoes, thought the candle. Hey, there's just as much joy among the children. And it sneezed at that, that is to say, it splattered. A tallow candle can do no more. The table was laid and the potatoes eaten. Oh, how good they tasted. It was a perfect feast, and each one got an apple besides. And the smallest child said the little verse, Thou good Lord, I give thanks to thee, that thou again hast nourished me. Amen. 
Was that not nicely said, mother? Broke out the little one. She must not ask that again, said the mother. You must only think of the good God who has fed you. The little ones went to bed, got a kiss and fell asleep at once. And the mother sat and sewed late into the night to get the means of support for them and for herself. And over from the big house the lights shone and the music sounded. The stars shone all over the houses, over the rich and over the poor, equally clear and blessed. This has been a delightful evening, thought the tallow candle. I wonder if the wax candles had it any better in the silver candlestick. I would like to know that before I am burned out. And it thought of the two happy ones, the one lighted by the wax candle and the other by the tallow candle. Yes, that is the whole story. End of section 13「Section fourteen of Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Zena Blue. Hans Christian Andersen. Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866-1873, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. Chapter 14 Poultry Mag was the only person who lived in the new stately dwelling that had been built for the fowls and ducks belonging to the manor house. It stood there, where once the old knightly building had stood with its tower, its pointed gables, its moat, and its drawbridge. Close by it was a wilderness of trees and thicket. Here the garden had been, and had stretched out to a great lake, which was now moorland. Crows and chows flew screaming over the old trees, and there were crowds of birds. They did not seem to get fewer when anyone shot among them but seemed rather to increase. One heard the screaming into the poultry house, where poultry Meg sat with the ducklings running to and fro over her wooden shoes. She knew every fowl and every duck from the moment it crept out of the shell, and she was fond of her fowls and ducks, and proud of the stately house that had been built for them. Her own little room in the house was clean and neat, for that was the wish of the gracious lady to whom the house belonged. She often came in the company of grand noble guests, to whom she showed the hens and ducks barracks, as she called the little house. Here were a clothes cupboard, and an armchair, and even a chest of drawers, and on these drawers a polished metal plate had been placed, whereon was engraved the word grub and this was the name of the noble family that had lived in the house of old. The brass plate had been found when they were digging the foundation, and the clerk had said it had no value except in being an old relic. The clerk knew all about the place, and about the old times, for he had his knowledge from books, and many a random had been written and put in his table drawer, but the oldest of the crows perhaps knew more than he and screamed it out in her own language. But that was the crow's language, and the clerk did not understand that, clever as he was. After the hot summer days, the mist sometimes hung over the moorland as if a whole lake were behind the old trees, among which the crows and the daws were fluttering, and thus it had looked when the good night grub had lived there, when the old manor house stood with its thick red walls, the dog chain used to reach in those days quite over the gateway through the tower one went into a paved passage which led to the rooms the windows were narrow and the panes were small even in the great hall where the dancing used to be but in the time of the last grub there had been no dancing in the hall within the memory of man although an old drum still lay there that had served as part of the music here stood a quaintly carved cupboard in which rare flower roots were kept 
for my lady grub was fond of plants and cultivated trees and shrubs her husband preferred riding out to shoot wolves and boars and his little daughter marie always went with him part of the way when she was only five years old she would sit proudly on her horse and look saucily round with her great black eyes it was a great amusement to her to hit out among the hunting dogs with her whip but her father would rather have seen her hid among the peasant boys who came running up to stare at their lord the peasant in the clay hut close by the knightly house had a son named soren of the same age as the gracious little lady the boy could climb well and had always to bring her down the bird's nest the birds screamed as loud as they could and one of the greatest of them hacked him with its beak over the eye so that the blood ran down and it was at first thought the eye had been destroyed but it had not been injured after all marie grubb used to call him her soren and that was a great favor and was an advantage to soren's father poor john who had one day committed a fault and was to be punished by riding on the wooden horse this same horse stood in the courtyard and had four poles for legs and a single narrow plank for a back on this john had to ride astride and some heavy bricks were fastened to his feet into the bargain that he might not sit too comfortably he made horrible grimaces and soren wept and implored little marie to interfere she immediately ordered that soren's father should be taken down and when they did not obey her she stamped on the floor and pulled at her father's sleeve till it was torn to pieces she would have her way and she got her way and soren's father was taken down lady grubb who now came up parted her little daughter's hair from the child's brow and looked at her affectionately but marie did not understand why she wanted to go to the hounds and not to her mother who went down into the garden to the lake where the water lily bloomed and the heads of bulrushes nodded amid the reeds and she looked at all this beauty and freshness how pleasant she said in the garden stood at that time a rare tree which she herself had planted it was called the blood beech a kind of negro growing among the other trees so dark brown were the leaves this tree required much sunshine for in continual shade it would become bright green like the other trees and thus lose its distinctive character in the lofty chestnut trees were many birds nests and also in the thickets and in the grassy meadows it seemed as though the birds knew that they were protected here and that no one must fire a gun at them little marie came here with soren he knew how to climb as we have already said and eggs and fluffy feathered young birds were brought down the birds great and small flew about in terror and tribulation the peewit from the fields and the crows and daws from the high trees screamed and screamed it was just such din as the family will raise to the present day what are you doing you children cried the gentle lady that is sinful soren stood abashed and even the little gracious lady looked down a little but then he said quite short and pretty my father lets me do it craw craw away away from here cried the great black birds and they flew away but on the following day came back for they were at home here the quiet gentle lady did not remain long at home here on earth for the good god called her away and indeed her home was rather with him than in the nightly house and the church bells tolled solemnly when her corpse was carried to the church and the eyes of the poor people were wet with tears for she had been good to them when she was gone no one attended her plantations and the garden ran to waste grub the knight was a hard man they said but his daughter young as she was knew how to manage him he used to laugh and let her have her way she was now twelve years old and strongly built she looked the people through and through with her black eyes rode her horse as bravely as a man and could fire off her gun like a practised hunter one day there were great visitors in the neighbourhood 
the grandest visitors who could come the young king and his half-brother and comrade the lord ulrich frederick gildenlow they wanted to hunt the wild boar and to pass a few days at the castle of grub gildenlow sat at a table next to marie grub and he took her by the hand and gave her a kiss as if she had been a relation but she gave him a box on the ear and told him she could not bear him at which there was great laughter as if that had been a very amusing thing and perhaps it was very amusing for five years afterwards when marie had fulfilled her seventeenth year a messenger arrived with a letter in which lord gildenlove proposed for the hand of the noble young lady there was a thing for you he is the grandest and most gallant gentleman in the whole country said grub the knight that is not a thing to despise i don't care so very much about him said marie grub but she did not despise the grandest man of all the country who sat by the king's side silver plate and fine linen and woolen went off to copenhagen in a ship while the bride made the journey by land in ten days but the outfit met with contrary winds or with no winds at all for four months passed before it arrived and when it came my lady gildenlove was gone i'd rather lie on coarse sacking than lie in his silken bed she declared i'd rather walk barefoot than drive with him in a coach late one evening in november two women came riding into the town of Erhus. They were the gracious Lady Gildenlove, Marie Grubb, and her maid. They came from the town of Weil, whither they had come in a ship from Copenhagen. They stopped at Lord Grubb's stone mansion in Erhus. Grubb was not well pleased with this visit. Marie was accosted in hard words, but she had a bedroom given her, and got her beer soup of a morning, but the evil part of her father's nature was aroused against her and she was not used to that she was not of a gentle temper and we often answer as we are addressed she answered openly and spoke with bitterness and hatred of her husband with whom she declared she would not live she was too honourable for that a year went by but it did not go pleasantly there were evil words between the father and daughter that ought never to be bad words bear bad fruit what could be the end of such a state of things we too cannot live under the same roof said the father one day go away from here to our old manor house but you had better bite your tongue off than spread any lies among the people and so the two parted she went with her maid to the old castle where she had been born and near which the gentle pious lady her mother was lying in the church vault an old cowherd lived in the courtyard and was the only other inhabitant of the place in the rooms heavy black cobwebs hung down covered with dust in the garden everything grew just as it would hops and climbing plants ran like a net between the trees and bushes and the hemlock and nettle grew larger and stronger the blood beech had been outgrown by other trees and now stood in the shade and its leaves were green like those of the common trees and its glory had departed crows and chows in great close masses flew past over the tall chestnut trees and chattered and screamed as if they had something very important to tell one another as if they were saying now she's come back again the little girl who had their eggs and their young ones stolen from them and as for the thief who had got them down he had to climb up a leafless tree for he sat on a tall ship's mast and was beaten with a rope's end if he did not behave himself the clerk told all this in our own times he had collected it and looked it up in books and memoranda it was to be found with many other writings locked up in his table drawer upward and downward is the course of the world said he it is strange to hear and we will hear how it went with marie grubb we need not for that forget poultry meg who is sitting in her capital hen house in our own time marie grubb sat down in her times 
but not with the same spirit that old poultry maid showed the winter passed away and the spring and summer passed away and the autumn came again with a damp cold sea fog it was a lonely desolate life in the old manor house marie grubb took her gun in her hand and went out to the heath and shot hares and foxes and whatever birds she could hit more than once she met the noble sir paldare of norbeck who was also wandering about with his gun and his dogs he was tall and strong and boasted of this when they walked together he could have measured himself against the deceased mr brockenhuis of egiskov of whom the people still talked Halladar had after the example of brockenhuis caused an iron chain with a hunting horn to be hung in his gateway and when he came riding home he used to seize the chain and lift himself and his horse from the ground and blow the horn come yourself and see me do that dame marie he said one can breathe fresh and free at norbeck when she went to his castle is not known but on the altar candlestick in the church of norbeck it was inscribed that they were the gift of paldare and marie grubb of norbeck castle a great stout man was paldare he drank like a sponge he was like a tub that could never get full he snored like a whole sty of pigs and he looked red and bloated he is treacherous and malicious said dame paldare grubb's daughter soon she was weary of her life with him but that did not make it better one day the table was spread and the dishes grew cold paldare was out hunting foxes and the gracious lady was nowhere to be found towards midnight paldare came home but dame dar came neither at midnight nor next morning she had turned her back upon norbeck and ridden away without saying good-bye it was gray wet weather the wind grew cold and a flight of black screaming birds flew over her head they were not so homeless as she first she journeyed southward quite down into the german land a couple of golden rings with costly stones were turned into money and then she turned to the east and then she turned again and went toward the west she had no food before her eyes and murmured against everything even against the good god himself so wretched was her soul soon her body became wretched too and she was scarcely able to move a foot the peewit flew up as she stumbled over the mound of earth where he had built his nest the bird cried as it always cried you thief you thief she had never stolen her neighbor's goods but as a little girl she had caused eggs and young birds to be taken from the trees and she thought of that now from where she lay she could see the sand dunes by the seashore lived fishermen but she could not get far she was so ill the great white sea mews flew over her head and screamed as the crows and daws screamed at home in the garden of the manor house the birds flew quite close to her and at last it seemed to her as if they became black as crows then all was night before her eyes when she opened her eyes again she was being lifted and carried a great strong man had taken her up in his arms and she was looking straight into his bearded face he had a scar over one eye which seemed to divide the eyebrow into two parts weak as she was he carried her to the ship where he got a rating for it from the captain the next day the ship sailed away madame grubb had not been put ashore so she sailed away with it but she will return will she not yes but where and when the clerk could tell about this too and it was not a story which he patched together himself he had the whole strange history out of an old authentic book which we ourselves can take out and read the danish historian ludwig holberg who has written so many useful books and merry comedies from which we can get such a good idea of his times and their people tells in his letters of marie grubb where and how he met her it is well worth hearing but for all that we don't at all forget poultry may 
who was sitting cheerful and comfortable in the charming fowl house the ship sailed away with marie grubb that's where we left off long years went by the plague was raging at copenhagen it was the year seventeen eleven the queen of denmark went away to her german home the king quitted the capital and everybody who could do so hurried away the students even those who had board and lodging gratis left the city one of these students the last who had remained in the free college at last went away too it was two o'clock in the morning he was carrying his knapsack which was better stacked with books and writings than with clothes a damp mist hung over the town not a person was to be seen in the streets the street doors around were marked with crosses as a sign that the plague was within or that all the inmates were dead a great wagon rattled past him the coachman brandished his whip and the horses flew by at a gallop the wagon was filled with corpses the young student kept his hand before his face and smelled at some strong spirits that he had with him on a sponge in a little brass set case out of a small tavern in one of the streets there were the sounds of singing and of unhallowed laughter from people who drank the night through to forget that the plague was at their doors and that they might be put into the wagon as the others had been the student turned his steps toward the canal at the castle bridge where a couple of small ships were lying one of these was weighing anchor to get away from the plague-stricken city if god spares our lives and grants us a fair wind we are going to gronmud near falster said the captain and he asked the name of the student who wished to go with him ludwig holberg answered the student and the name sounded like any other but now there sounds in it one of the proudest names of denmark then it was the name of a young unknown student the ship glided past the castle it was not yet bright day when it was in the open sea a light wind filled the cells and the young student sat down with his face turned toward the fresh wind and went to sleep which was not exactly the most prudent thing he could have done already on the third day the ship lay by the island of falster do you know anyone here with whom I could lodge cheaply? Holberg asked the captain. I should think you would do well to go to the ferry woman in Borhaus, answered the captain. If you want to be very civil to her, her name is Mother Soren Sorensen Muller, but it may happen that she may fly into a fury if you are too polite to her. The man is in custody for a crime, and that's why she manages the ferry boat herself. She has fists of her own. The student took his knapsack and betook himself to the ferry house. The house door was not locked. It opened, and he went into a room with a brick floor, where a bench with a great coverlet of leather formed the chief article of furniture. A white hen, who had a brood of chickens, was fastened to the bench, and had overturned the pipkin of water, so that the wet ran across the floor. There were no people either here or in the adjoining room only a cradle stood there in which was a child the ferry boat came back with only one person in it whether that person was a man or a woman was not an easy matter to determine the person in question was wrapped in a great cloak and wore a kind of hood presently the boat lay to it was a woman who got out of it and came into the room she looked very stately when she straightened her back Two proud eyes looked forth from beneath her black eyebrows. It was Mother Soren, the fairy wife. The crows and daws might have called out another name for her, which we know better. She looked morose and did not seem to care to talk, but this much was settled, that the student should board in her house for an indefinite time while things looked so bad in Copenhagen. This or that honest citizen would often come to the fairy house from the neighboring little town. There came Frank the cutler and Sivert the excise man. They drank a mug of beer in the ferry house and used to converse with the student, for he was a clever young man who knew his practica, as they called it, and he could read Greek and Latin and was well up in learned subjects. The less one knows, the less it presses upon one, said Mother Soren. You have to work hard, said Holberg one day, when she was dipping clothes in the strong soapy water 
and was obliged herself to split the logs for the fire. That's my affair, she replied. Have you been obliged to toil in this way from childhood? You can read that from my hand, she replied, and held out her hands that were small indeed, but hard and strong, with bitten nails. You are learned and can read. At Christmas time it began to snow heavily. The cold came on, the wind blew sharp, as if there were vitriol in it to wash the people's faces. Mother Soren did not let that disturb her. She threw her cloak around her and drew her hood over her head. Early in the afternoon, it was already dark in the house, she laid wood and turf on the hearth, and then she sat down to darn her stockings, for there was no one to do it for her. Towards evening she spoke more words to the student than it was customary with her to use. She spoke of her husband. He killed a sailor of Dragor by mischance, and for that he has to work for three years in irons. He is only a common sailor, and therefore the law must take its course. The law is there for people of high rank, too, said Holberg. Do you think so? said Mother Soren. Then she looked into the fire for a while. But after a time, she began to speak again. Have you heard of Kai Lake, who caused the church to be pulled down? And when the clergyman, Master Martin, thundered from the pulpit about it, he had him put in irons and sat in judgment upon him and condemned him to death? Yes, and the clergyman was obliged to bow his head to the stroke, and yet Kai Lake went scot-free. He had a right to do as he did in those times, said Holberg but now we have left those times behind us. You may get a fool to believe that, cried Mother Soren, and she got up and went into the room where the child lay. She lifted up the child and laid it down more comfortably. Then she arranged the bed place of the student. He had the green coverlet, for he felt the cold more than she, though he was born in Norway. On New Year's morning, it was a bright sunshiny day. The frost had been so strong and was still so strong that the fallen snow had become a hard mass, and one could walk upon it. The bells of the little town were tolling for church. Student Holberg wrapped himself up in his woolen cloak and wanted to go to the town. Over the ferry house the crows and daws were flying with loud cries. One could hardly hear the church bells for their screaming. Mother Soren stood in front of the house, filling a brass pot with snow, which she was going to put on the fire to get drinking water. She looked up to the crowd of birds and thought her own thoughts. Student Holberg went to church. On his way there, and on his return, he passed by the house of tax collector Sivert by the town gate. Here he was invited to take a mug of brown beer with treacle and sugar. The discourse fell upon Mother Soren, but the tax collector did not know much about her, and indeed few knew much about her. She did not belong to the island of Falster, he said. She had a little property of her own at one time. Her husband was a common sailor, a fellow of a very hot temper, and had killed a sailor of Dragor, and he beat his wife, and yet she defended him. I should not endure such treatment, said the tax collector's wife. I am come of more respectable people. My father was stocking weaver to the court and consequently you have married a government official said holberg and made a bow to her and to the collector it was on twelfth night the evening of the festival of the three kings mother soren lit up for holberg a three king candle that is a tallow candle with three wicks which she herself prepared a light for each man said holberg for each man repeated the woman looking sharply at him for each of the wise men from the east, said Holberg. You mean it that way, said she, and then she was silent for a long time. But on this evening he learned more about her than he had yet known. You speak very affectionately of your husband, observed Holberg, and yet the people say that he ill uses you every day. That's no one's business but mine, she replied. The blows might have done me good when I was a child. Now, I suppose, I get them for my sins. But I know what good he has done me, and she rose up. When I lay sick upon the desolate heath, and no one would have pity on me, 
and no one would have anything to do with me except the crows and daws which came to peck me to bits he carried me in his arms and had to bear hard words because of the burden he brought on board ship it's not in my nature to be sick and so i got well every man has his own way and soren has his but the horse must not be judged by the halter taking one thing with another i have lived more agreeably with him than with the man whom they called the most noble and gallant of the king's subjects i have had the stadtholder gildenlove the king's half-brother for my husband and afterwards i took powder one is as good as another each in his own way and i in mine that was a long gossip but now you know all about me and with those words she left the room it was marie grubb so strangely had fate played with her she did not live to see many anniversaries of the festival of the three kings holberg has recorded that she died in june seventeen sixteen but he has not written down for he did not know that a number of great black birds circled over the fairy house when mother soren as she was called was lying there a corpse they did not scream as if they knew that at a burial silence should be observed so soon as she lay in the earth the birds disappeared but on the same evening in jutland an old manor house an enormous number of crows and chows were seen they all cried as loud as they could as if they had some announcement to make perhaps they talked of him who as a little boy had taken away their eggs and their young of the peasant's son who had to wear an iron garter and of the noble young lady who ended by being a ferryman's wife brave brave they cried and the whole family cried brave brave when the old house was pulled down they are still crying and yet there's nothing to cry about said the clerk when he told the story the family is extinct the house has been pulled down and where it stood is now the stately poultry house with gilded weathercocks and the old poultry maid she rejoices greatly in her beautiful dwelling if she had not come here the old clerk added she would have had to go into the workhouse the pigeons cooed over her the turkey cocks gobbled and the ducks quacked nobody knew her they said she belongs to no family it's pure charity that she is here at all she has neither a drake father nor a hen mother and has no descendants she came of a great family for all that but she did not know it and the old clerk did not know it though he had so much written down but one of the old crows knew about it and told about it she had heard from her own mother and grandmother about poultry meg's mother and grandmother and we know the grandmother too we saw her ride as a child over the bridge looking proudly around her as if the whole world belonged to her and all the birds nests in it and we saw her on the heath by the sand dunes and last of all in the fairy house the granddaughter the last of her race had come back to the old home where the old castle had stood where the black wild birds were screaming but she sat among the tame birds and these knew her and were fond of her poultry meg had nothing to left to wish for she looked forward with pleasure to her death for she was old enough to die grave grave cried the crows and poultry meg has a good grave which nobody knew except the old crow if the old crow is not dead already and now we know the story of the old manor house of its old proprietors and of all poultry meg's family End of chapter 14section number 15 of hans christian anderson fairy tales and short stories volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by zena blue hans christian anderson fairy tales and short stories volume 6 eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy three by hans christian anderson translated by h p paul 
Chapter Fifteen the one who could do the most incredible thing should have the king's daughter and half of his kingdom. The young men, and even the old ones, strained all their thoughts, sinews, and muscles. Two ate themselves to death, and one drank until he died, to do the most incredible thing according to their own taste, but it was not in this way it was to be done. Little boys in the streets practiced spitting on their own backs, they considered that the most incredible thing. On a certain day, an exhibition was to be held of what each had to show as the most incredible. The judges who were chosen were children from three years old to people up in the sixties. There was a whole exhibition of incredible things, but all soon agreed that the most incredible was a huge clock in a case marvelously designed inside and out. On the stroke of every hour, living figures came out, which showed what hour was striking. There were twelve representations in all, with moving figures and with music and conversation. That was the most incredible thing, the people said. The clock struck one, and Moses stood on the mountain and wrote down on the tables of the law the first commandment. There is only one true God. The clock struck two, and the Garden of Eden appeared, where Adam and Eve met, happy both of them, without having so much as a wardrobe. They did not need one either. On the stroke of three, the three kings from the east were shown. One of them was coal black, but he could not help that. The sun had blackened him. They came with incense and treasures. On the stroke of four came the four seasons. Spring with a cuckoo on a budding beech bough, summer with a grasshopper on a stalk of ripe corn, autumn with an empty stork's nest, the birds were flown, winter with an old crow, which could tell stories in the chimney corner, old memories. When the clock struck five, the five senses appeared sight as a spectacle maker, hearing as a coppersmith, smell sold violets and woodruff. Taste was cook, and feeling was an undertaker, with crepe down to his heels. The clock struck six, and there sat a gambler who threw the dice, and the highest side was turned up and showed six. Then came the seven days of the week, or the seven deadly sins. People were not certain which. They belonged to each other and were not easily distinguished. Then came a choir of monks and sang the eight o'clock service. On the stroke of nine came the nine muses. One was busy with astronomy, one with historical archives. The others belonged to the theater. On the stroke of ten, Moses again came forward with the tables of the law, on which stood all God's commandments, and they were ten. The clock struck again. Then little boys and girls danced and hopped about. They played a game and sang, Two and two and seven, the clock has struck eleven. When twelve struck, the watchman appeared with his fur cap and halberd. He sang the old watch verse. "'Twas at the midnight hour, our Savior he was born. And while he sang, roses grew and changed into angel beads, borne on rainbow-colored wings." It was charming to hear and lovely to see. The whole was a matchless work of art, the most incredible thing, everyone said. The designer of it was a young man, good-hearted and happy as a child, a true friend and good to his old parents. He deserved the princess and the half of the kingdom. The day of decision arrived. The whole of the town had a holiday, and the princess sat on the throne, which had got new horsehair, but which was not any more comfortable. The judges round about looked very knowingly at the one who was to win, and he stood glad and confident his good fortune was certain. He had made the most incredible thing. No, I shall do that now, shouted just then a long bony fellow. I am the man for the most incredible thing. And he swung a great axe at the work of art. 
Crash, crash, and there lay the whole of it. Wheels and springs flew in all directions. Everything was destroyed. That I could do, said the man. My work has overcome his, and overcome all of you. I have done the most incredible thing. To destroy such a work of art, said the judges. Yes, certainly that is the most incredible thing. All the people said the same, and so he was to have the princess and the half of the kingdom, for a promise is a promise, even if it is of the most incredible kind. It was announced with trumpet blast from the ramparts and from all the towers that the marriage should be celebrated. The princess was not quite pleased about it, but she looked charming and was gorgeously dressed. The church shone with candles. It shows best late in the evening. The noble maidens of the town sang and led the bride forward. The knights sang and accompanied the bridegroom. He strutted as if he could never be broken. Now the singing stopped, and one could have heard a pin fall, but in the midst of the silence the great church door flew open with a crash and clatter, and boom, boom, the whole of the clockwork came marching up the passage and planted itself between the bride and bridegroom. Dead men cannot walk again, we know that very well, but a work of art can walk again. The body was knocked to pieces, but not the spirit. The spirit of the work walked, and that in deadly earnest. The work of art stood there precisely as if it were whole and untouched. The hour struck, the one after the other, up to twelve, and the figures swarmed forward. First, Moses, flames of fire seemed to flash from his forehead, and he threw the heavy stone tables down on the feet of the bridegroom and pinned them to the church floor. I cannot lift them again, said Moses. You have knocked my arm off. Stand as you stand now. Then came Adam and Eve, the wise men from the east and the four seasons. Each of these told him unpleasant truths and said, For shame. But he was not in the least ashamed. All the figures which each stroke of the clock had to exhibit came out of it, and all increased to a terrible size. There seemed scarcely to be room for the real people, and when at the stroke of twelve the watchman appeared with his fur cap and halberd, there was a wonderful commotion. The watchman walked straight up to the bridegroom and struck him on the forehead with his halberd. Lie there, he said, like for like. We are avenged in our master as well. We vanish. And so the whole work disappeared. But the candles round about in the church became great bouquets, and the gilded stars of the ceiling of the church sent out long, clear beams, and the organ played of itself. All the people said it was the most incredible thing they had ever experienced. "'Will you then summon the right one?' said the princess. "'The one who made the work of art? Let him be my lord and husband.' and he stood in the church with the whole of the people for his retinue. All were glad, and all blessed him. There was not one who was jealous, and that was the most incredible thing of all. End of section 15. Recording by Zena Blue. Section 16 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866 to 1873, by Hans Christian Andersen, Translated by H. P. Paul. Danish Popular Legends, 1870. Denmark is rich in old legends of historical persons, churches, and manors, of hills, of fields, and bottomless moors, sayings from the days of the Great Plague, from the times of war and peace. The sayings live in books 
and on the tongues of the people. They fly far about like a flock of birds, but still are as different from one another as the thrush is from the owl, as the wood pigeon from the gull. Listen to me, and I will tell you some of them. It happened one evening in days of yore, when the enemy were pillaging the Danish country, that a battle had been fought and won by the Danes, and many killed and wounded lay on the field of battle. One of these, an enemy, had lost both his legs by a shot. A Danish soldier standing nearby had just taken out a bottle filled with beer and was about to put it to his mouth when the badly wounded man asked him for a drink. As he stopped to hand him the bottle, the enemy discharged his pistol at him, but the shot missed. The soldier drew his bottle back again, drank half of it, and gave the remaining half to his enemy, only saying, You rascal, now you will only get half of it. The king, afterward hearing of this, granted the soldier and his descendants an armorial bearing of nobility, on which was painted a half-filled bottle in memory of his deed. There is a beautiful tradition worth telling about the church bell of Farham. The parsonage stood close by the church. It was a dark night late in the fall, and the minister was sitting up at a late hour preparing his Sabbath sermon, when he heard a slight, strange sound from the large church bell. No wind was blowing, and the sound was inexplicable to him. He got up, took the keys, and went into the church. As he entered the church, the sound stopped suddenly, but he heard a faint sigh from above. Who is there, disturbing the peace of the church? he asked in a loud voice. Footsteps were heard from the tower, and he saw in the passageway a little boy advancing toward him. Be not angry, said the child. I slipped in here when the vesper service was rung. My mother is very sick, and now the little boy could not say more, for the tears that choked him. The minister patted him on the cheek and encouraged him to be frank and tell him all about it. They say that my mother, my sweet good mother, is going to die, but I knew that when one is sick unto death, he may recover again and live if in the middle of the night one dares enter the church and scrape off a little rust from the large church bell. That is a safeguard against death. Therefore I came here and hid myself until I heard the clock strike twelve. I was so afraid. I thought of all the dead ones and of their coming into the church. I dared not look out. I read my Lord's Prayer and scraped the rust off the bell. Come, my good child, said the minister. Our Lord will forsake neither thy mother nor thee. So they went together to the poor cottage where the sick mother was lying. She slept quietly and soundly. Our Lord granted her life, and his blessings shone over her and her son. There is a legend about a poor young fellow, Paul Vendelbo, who became a great and honored man. He was born in Jutland, and had striven and studied so well that he got through the examination as student, but felt a still greater desire to become a soldier and stroll about in foreign countries. One day he walked with two young comrades, who were well off, along the ramparts of Copenhagen, and talked to them of his desire. He stopped suddenly, and looked up at the window of the professor's house, where a young girl was seated, whose beauty had astonished him and the two others. Perceiving how he blushed, they said in joke, Go into her, Paul, and if you can get a voluntary kiss from her at the window, so that we can see it, we will give you the money for traveling, that you may go abroad and see if fortune is more favorable for you there than at home. Paul Vendelbull entered into the house and knocked at the parlor door. My father is not home, said the young girl. Do not be angry with me, he answered, and the blood rushed into his cheeks. It is not your father I want. And now he told her frankly and heartily his wish to try the world and acquire an honorable name. He told her of his two friends who were standing in the street, 
and had promised him money for travelling on the condition that she should voluntarily give him a kiss at the open honest and frank face that her anger disappeared it is not right for you to speak such words to a chaste maid said she but you look so honest i will not hinder your fortune and she led him to the window and gave him a kiss his friends kept their promise and furnished him with money he went into the service of the czar fought in the battle of poltoa and acquired name and honor afterward when denmark needed him he returned home and became a mighty man of the army and of the king's council one day he entered the professor's plain room and it was not just the professor he wished to see this time either it was again his daughter ingeborg vinding who gave him the kiss the inauguration of his fortune a fortnight after paul vendabo lovenor lion eagle celebrated his wedding the enemy made once a great attack on the danish island of funen one village only was spared but this was also soon to be sacked and burnt two poor people lived in a low studded house in the outskirts of the town it was a dark winter evening the enemy was expected and in their anxiety they took the book of psalms and opened it to see if the psalm which they first met with could render them any aid or comfort they opened the book and turned to the psalm a mighty fortress is our god full of confidence they sang it and strengthened in faith they went to bed and slept well kept by the lord's guardianship when they awoke in the morning it was quite dark in the room and the daylight could not penetrate they went to the door but could not open it then they mounted the loft got the trap door open and saw that it was broad daylight but a heavy drift of snow had in the night fallen upon the whole house and hidden it from the enemies who in the night time had pillaged and burnt the town then they clasped their hands in thankfulness and repeated the psalm a mighty fortress is our god the lord had guarded them and raised an entrenchment of snow around them from north Zealand there comes a gloomy incident that stirs the thoughts the church of Roervig is situated far out toward the sand hills by the stormy Kattegat. one evening a large ship dropped anchor out there and was presumed to be a russian man-of-war in the night a knocking was heard at the gate of the parsonage and several armed and masked persons ordered the minister to put on his ecclesiastical gown and accompany them to the church they promised him good pay but used menaces if he declined to go he went with them the church was lighted unknown people were gathered and all was in deep silence before the altar the bride and bridegroom were waiting dressed in magnificent clothes as if they were of high rank but the bride was pale as a corpse when the marriage ceremony was finished a shot was heard and the bride lay dead before the altar they took the corpse and all went away with it the next morning the ship had weighed anchor to this day nobody has been able to give any explanation of the event the minister who took part in it wrote down the whole event in his bible which is handed down in his family the old church is still standing between the sand hills at the tossing Kattegat, and the story lives in writing and in memory i must tell you one more church legend there lived in denmark on the island of falster a rich lady of rank who had no children and her family was about to die out so she took a part of her riches and built a magnificent church when it was finished and the altar candles lighted she stepped up to the altar table and prayed on her knees to our lord that he would grant her for her pious gift a life upon the earth as long as her church was standing years went by her relations died her old friends and acquaintances and all the former servants of the manor were laid in their graves but she who had made such an evil wish did not die generation upon generation became strange to her she did not approach anybody and nobody approached her 
she wasted away in a long dotage and sat abandoned and alone her senses were blunted she was like a sleeping but not like a dead person every christmas eve the life in her flashed up for a moment and she got her voice again then she would order her people to put her in an oak coffin and place it in the open burying place of the church the minister then would come on the christmas night to her in order to receive her commands she was laid in the coffin and it was brought to the church the minister came as ordered every christmas night threw the choir up to the coffin raised the cover for the old wearied lady who was lying there without rest is my church still standing she asked with shivering voice and upon the minister's answer it stands still she sighed profoundly and sorrowfully and fell back again the minister let the cover down and came again the next christmas night and the next again and still again the following now there is no stone of the church left upon another no traces of the buried dead ones a large white thorn grows here on the field with beautiful flowers every spring as if it were the sign of the resurrection of life it is said that it grows on the very spot where the coffin with the noble lady stood where her dust became dust of earth there is an old popular saying that our lord when he expelled the fallen angels let some of them drop down upon the hills where they still live and they are called beurg folk mountain goblins or trolldy imps they are always afraid and flee away when it thunders which is for them a voice from heaven others fell down in the alder moors they are called elver folk alder folks and among them the women are very handsome to look at but not to trust their backs are also hollow like a doe trough others fell down in old farms and houses they became dwarfs and nisser elves sometimes they are wont to have intercourse with men and a great many stories about them are related which are very strange up in jutland lived in a large hill such a mountain goblin together with a great many other imps one of his daughters was married to the smith of the village the smith was a bad man and beat his wife at last she got tired of it and one day as he was going again to beat her she took a horseshoe and broke it over him she possessed such an immense strength that she could easily have broken him in pieces too he thought about it and did not beat her any more yet it was rumored abroad and her respect among the country people was lost and she was known as the trolled barn an imp child no one in the parish would have any intercourse with her the mountain goblin got a hint of this and one sunday when the smith and his wife together with other parishioners were standing in the churchyard waiting for the minister she looked out over the bay where a fog was rising now comes father she said and he is angry he came and angry he was will you throw them to me or will you rather to do the catching he asked and looked with greedy eyes upon the church people the catching she said for she knew well that he would not be so gentle when they fell into his hands and so the mountain goblin seized one after another and flung them over the roof of the church while the daughter standing on the other side caught them gently from that time she got along well with the parishioners they were all afraid of the mountain goblin and many of that kind were scattered about the country the best they could do was to avoid quarrelling with him and rather turn his acquaintance to their profit they knew well that the imps had big kettles filled with gold money and it was certainly worth while to get a handful of it but for that they had to be cunning and ingenious like the peasant of whom i am going to tell you as also of his boy who was still more cunning the peasant had a hill on his field which he would not leave uncultivated he ploughed it but the mountain goblin who lived in the hill came out and asked how dare you plough upon my roof i did not know that it was yours said the peasant 
but it is not advantageous for any of us to let such a piece of land lie uncultivated let me plough and sow and then you will reap the first year what is growing over the earth and i what grows in the earth next year we will change they agreed and the peasant sowed first year carrots and the second corn the mountain goblin got the top part of the carrots and the roots of the corn in this way they lived in harmony together but now it happened that there was to be a christening in the house of the peasant the peasant was much embarrassed as he could not well omit inviting the mountain goblin with whom he lived in good accord but if the imp accepted his invitation the peasant would fall into bad repute with the minister and the other folk of the parish cunning as the peasant ordinarily was this time he could not find out how to act he spoke about it to his pig boy who was the more cunning of the two i will help you said the boy and taking a large bag he went out to the hill of the mountain goblin he knocked and was let in then he said that he came to invite him to the christening the mountain goblin accepted the invitation and promised to come i must give a christening present i suppose mustn't i they usually do said the boy and opened the bag the imp poured money into it is that sufficient the boy lifted the bag most people give as much then all the money in the large money kettle was poured into the bag nobody gives more most less let me know now said the mountain goblin the great guests you are expecting three priests and one bishop said the boy that is fine but such gentlemen look only for eating and drinking they couldn't care about me who else comes mother mary is expected hm but i think there will also be a little place for me behind the stove well and then well then comes our lord hm that was mighty but such highly distinguished guests usually come late and go away early i shall therefore while they are in slink away a little what sort of music shall you have drum music said the boy our father has ordered heavy thundering after which we shall dance drum music it shall be oh is it not dreadful cried the mountain goblin thank your master for the invitation but i would rather stay at home did he not know then that thundering and drum are to me and my whole race a horror once in my younger days going out to take a walk the thunder began to drum and i got one of the drumsticks over my thigh bone so that it cracked i will not have more of that kind of music give my thanks and my greetings and the boy took the bag on his back and brought his master the great riches and the imp's friendly greetings we have many legends of this sort but those we have told ought to be enough for today End of section 16。section 17 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barbara Best. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. 1866 to 1873 by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul, Lucky Pier, Part One, One. In the principal street there stood a fine old-fashioned house. The wall about the courtyard had bits of glass worked into it, so that when the sun or moon shone, it was as if covered with diamonds. That was a sign of wealth, and there was wealth inside there. Folks said that the merchant was a man who could just put away two barrels of gold in his best parlor. Yes, could put a heap of gold pieces as a savings bank against the future, outside the door of the room where his little son was born. This little fellow had arrived in the rich house. There was great joy from the cellar up to the garret, and up there there was still greater joy an hour or two afterward. The warehouse man and his wife lived up there, and here too there entered just then a little son given by our lord brought by the stork and exhibited by the mother and here too there was a heap outside the door quite accidentally but it was not a gold heap 
it was a heap of sweepings. The rich merchant was a very considerate good man. His wife, delicate and gentle-born, dressed well, was pious, and besides was kind and good to the poor. Everybody congratulated these two people on now having a little son, who would grow up and, like his father, be rich and happy. At the font the little boy was called Felix, which means in Latin lucky, and that he was, and his parents still more. The warehouse man, a right sound fellow, and good to the bottom of his heart, and his wife, an honest and industrious woman, were blessed by all who knew them. How lucky they were at getting their little boy, and he was called Pierre. The boy on the first floor and the boy in the garret each got just as many kisses from his parents, and just as much sunshine from our Lord. But still they were placed a little differently, one downstairs and one up. Pierre sat the highest, away up in the garret, and he had his own mother for a nurse. Little Felix had a stranger for his nurse, but she was a good and honest girl. You could see that in her character book. The rich child had a pretty little wagon, and was drawn about by his spruce nurse. The child from the garret was carried in the arms of his own mother, both when he was in his Sunday clothes and when he had his everyday things on, and he was just as much pleased. They were both pretty children. They both kept growing, and soon could show with their hands how tall they were, and say single words in their mother tongue. Equally sweet, equally dainty and petted were they both. As they grew up, they had a like pleasure out of the merchant's horses and carriages. Felix got permission from his nurse to sit by the coachman and look at the horses. He fancied himself driving. Pierre got permission to sit at the garret window and look down into the yard when the master and mistress went out to drive. And when they were fairly gone, he placed two chairs, one in front, the other behind, up there in the room, and so he drove himself. He was the real coachman. That was a little more than fancying himself to be the coachman. They had noticed each other, these two, but it was not until they were two years old that they spoke to each other. Felix went elegantly dressed in silk and velvet with bare knees after the English style. The poor child will freeze, said the family in the garret. Pierre had trousers that came down to his ankles, but one day his clothes were torn right across his knees, so that he had as much of a draught and was just as much underdressed as the merchant's little delicate boy. Felix came with his mother and wanted to go out. Pierre came with his and wanted to go in. Give little Pierre your hand, said the merchant's lady. You two can talk to each other. And one said Pierre, and the other said Felix. Yes, that was all they said that time. The rich lady petted her boy, but there was one who petted Pierre just as much, and that was his grandmother. She was weak-sighted, and yet she saw much more in little Pierre than his father or mother could see. Yes, more than anybody at all could discover. The dear child, said she, is going to get on in the world. He is born with a gold apple in his hand. There is the shining apple, and she kissed the child's little hand. His parents could see nothing, nor peer either, but as he grew to know more, no doubt he would find that out too. That is such a story, such a real wonder story that grandmother tells, said the parents. Indeed, grandmother could tell stories, and Pierre was never tired of hearing always the same ones. She taught him a psalm and to repeat the Lord's Prayer, and he knew it not as a gabble, but as words which meant something. Every single petition in it she explained to him. Especially he thought about what Grandmother said on the words, Give us this day our daily bread. He was to understand that it was necessary for one to get wheat bread, for another to get black bread. One must have a great house when he had a great deal of company. Another, in small circumstances, could live quite as happily in a little room in the garret. So each person has what he calls daily bread. Pierre had regularly his good daily bread, and very delightful days too, but they were not to last always. Stern years of war began. The young were to go away, the old to stay home. Pierre's father was among those who were enrolled, and soon it was heard that he was one of the first who fell in battle against the victorious enemy. There was terrible grief in the little room in the garret. The mother cried, the grandmother and little Pierre cried and every time one of the neighbors came up to see them, they talked about father, and then they cried all together. The widow, meanwhile, received permission the first year to lodge rent-free, and afterward she was to pay only a small rent. The grandmother stayed with the mother, who supported herself by washing for several single fine gentlemen, as she called them. Pierre had neither sorrow nor want. He had his fill of meat and drink, and grandmother told him stories so extraordinary and wonderful about the wide world that he asked her one day if they too might not go on Sunday to foreign lands, 
and come home again as prince and princess, with gold crowns on. I am too old for that, said Grandmother, and you must first learn a terrible lot of things, become great and strong, but you must always be a good and affectionate child, just as you are now. Peer rode around the room on hobby horses. He had two such, but the merchant's son had a real live horse. It was so little that it might as well have been called a baby horse, as Peer called it, and it never could become any bigger. Felix rode it about in the yard. He even rode outside the gate with his father and a riding-master from the king's stable. For the first half-hour Peer did not like his horses and would not ride them. They were not real. He asked his mother why he could not have a real horse like little Felix, and his mother said, Felix lives down on the first floor, close by the stables, but you live high up under the roof. One cannot have horses up in the garret except like those you have. Do you ride on them? And so Peer rode first to the chest of drawers, the great mountain full of treasures. Both Pierre's Sunday clothes and his mother's were there, and there were the shining silver dollars which he laid aside for rent. He rode to the stove, which he called the Black Bear. It slept all summer long, but when winter came, it must do something, warm the room and cook the meals. Pierre had a godfather, who usually came every Sunday in winter, and got a good warm dinner. It was rather a coming down for him, said the mother and the grandmother. He had begun as a coachman. He took to drink and slept at his post, and that neither a soldier nor a coachman may do. Then he became a carter and drove a cart, and sometimes a drosky for gentlefolk. But now he drove a dirt cart and went from door to door swinging his rattle. snurry rurried And out from all the houses came the girls and housewives with their buckets full and turned these into the cart. Rags and tags, ashes and rubbish were all turned in. One day Pierre had come down from the garret, his mother had gone to town, and he stood at the open gate, and there outside was Godfather with his cart. "'Will you take a drive?' he asked. Right willingly would Pierre, but only as far as the corner. His eyes shone as he sat on the seat alone with Godfather and was allowed to hold the whip. Pierre drove with real live horses, drove quite to the corner. His mother came along just then. She looked rather dubious. It was not so grand to see her own little son riding on a dirt cart. He must get down at once. Still, she thanked Godfather, but when they reached home she forbade Pierre to take that excursion again. One day he went again down to the gate. There was no Godfather there to entice him off for a drive, but there were other allurements. Three or four small street urchins were down in the gutter, poking about to see what they could find that had been lost or had hidden itself there. They had often found a button or a copper coin, but they had quite as often scratched themselves with a broken bottle or pricked themselves with a pin, which was just now the case. Pierre must join them, and when he got down among the gutter stones he found a silver coin. Another day he was down on his knees again, digging with the other boys. They only got dirty fingers. He found a gold ring, and showed, with sparkling eyes, his lucky find. And then the others threw dirt at him and called him Lucky Pierre. They would not let him be with them then when they poked in the gutter. Back of the merchant's yard there was some low ground, which was to be filled up for building lots. Gravel and ashes were carted and tipped out there. Great heaps lay about. Godfather drove his cart, but Pierre was not to drive with him. The street boys dug in the heaps. They dug with a stick and with their bare hands. They were always finding one thing or another which seemed worth picking up. Hither came little Pierre. They saw him and cried out, Clear out, lucky Pierre! And when he came nearer they flung lumps of dirt at him. One of these struck against his wooden shoe and fell to pieces. Something shiny dropped out. Peer took it up. It was a little heart made of amber. He ran home with it. The rest did not notice that even when they threw dirt at him he was a child of luck. The silver skilling which he had found was laid away in his little savings bank. The ring and the amber heart were shown downstairs to the merchant's wife, because the mother wanted to know if they were among the things found that ought to be given notice of to the police. How the eyes of the merchant's wife shone on seeing the ring! It was no other than her own engagement ring, which she had lost three years before. So long had it lain in the gutter. Pierre was well rewarded, and the money rattled in his little box. The amber heart was a cheap thing, the lady said. Pierre might just as well keep that. At night the amber heart lay on the bureau, and the grandmother lay in bed. Eh, hey, what is it that burns so? said she. It looks as if some candle were lighted there. She got up to see, and it was the little heart of amber. 
Ah, the grandmother with her weak eyes often saw more than all others could see. Now she had her private thoughts about this. The next morning she took a small strong ribbon, drew it through the opening at the top of the heart, and put it round her little grandson's neck. You must never take it off, except to put a new ribbon into it, and you must not show it either to other boys. If they should take it from you, you would have the stomach ache. That was the only dreadful sickness little Peer had thus far known. There was a strange power, too, in the heart. Grandmother showed him that when she rubbed it with her hand, and a little straw was laid by it, the straw seemed to be alive and sprang to the heart of Ember and would not let it go. End of one. Two. The merchant's son had a tutor who heard him say his lessons alone and walked out with him. Peer was also to have an education, so he went to school with a great quantity of other boys. They studied together, and that was more delightful than going alone with a tutor. Peer would not change. He was a lucky peer, but Godfather was also a lucky peer. Footnote. Lucky peer is a familiar title given to a person in luck, much as we might say a lucky dog. End footnote. For all he was not called peer. He won a prize in the lottery of two hundred rix dollars on a ticket which he shared with eleven others. He went at once and bought some better clothes, and he looked very well in them. Luck never comes alone. It always has company, and it did this time. Godfather gave up his dirt cart and joined the theatre. For what in the world, said Grandmother, is he going to the theatre? What does he go as? As a machinist. That was a real getting on, and he was now quite another man, and took a wonderful deal of enjoyment in the comedy, which he always saw from the top or from the side. The most charming thing was the ballet, but that indeed gave him the hardest work, and there was always some danger from fire. They danced both in heaven and on earth. That was something for little Pierre to see, and one evening, when there was to be a dress rehearsal of a new ballet, in which they were all dressed and adorned, as in the evening when people pay to see all the fine show, he had permission to bring Pierre with him, and put him in a place where he could see the whole. It was a scripture ballet, Samson. The Philistines danced about him, and he tumbled the whole house down over them in himself, but there were fire engines and firemen on hand in case of any accident. Pierre had never seen a comedy, still less a ballet. He put on his Sunday clothes and went with Godfather to the theatre. It was just like a great drawing loft, with ever so many curtains and screens, great openings in the floor, lamps, and lights. There was a host of nooks and crannies up and down, and people came out from these, just as in a great church with its balcony pews. Footnote. In Denmark, and still more in Norway, one still sees great churches with private boxes for families, so to speak, hung like nests against the wall. End footnote. The floor went down quite steeply, and there Pierre was placed, and told to stay there till it was all finished and he was sent for. He had three sandwiches in his pocket, so that he need not starve. Soon it grew lighter and lighter. There came up in front, just as if straight out of the earth, a number of musicians with both flutes and violins. At the side where Pierre sat, people came dressed as if they were in the street, but there came also knights with gold helmets, beautiful maidens in gauze and flowers, even angels, all in white, with wings on their hacks. They were placed up and down, on the floor, and up in the balcony pews to be looked at. They were the whole force of the ballet dancers, but Pierre did not know that. He believed they belonged in the fairy tales his grandmother had told him about. Then there came a woman, who was the most beautiful of all, with the gold helmet and spear. She looked out over all the others and sat between an angel and an imp. Ah, how much there was to see, and yet the ballet was not even begun. There was a moment of quiet. A man dressed in black moved a little fairy wand over all the musicians, and then they began to play, so that there was a whistling of music, and the wall itself began to rise. One looked out onto a flower garden, where the sun shone and all the people danced and leaped. Such a wonderful sight had Peer never imagined. There the soldiers marched, and there was fighting, and there were the guilds and the mighty Samson with his love, but she was as wicked as she was beautiful. She betrayed him. The Philistines plucked his eyes out. He had to grind in the mill and be set up for mockery in the dancing hall. But then he laid hold of the strong pillars which held the roof up and shook them in the whole house. It fell, and there burst forth wonderful flames of red and green fire. Pierre could have sat there his whole life long and looked on, even if the sandwiches were all eaten, and they were all eaten. Now here was something to tell about when he got home. He was not to be got off to bed. He stood on one leg and laid the other upon the table. That was what Samson's love and all the other ladies did. He made a treadmill out of grandmother's chair and upset two chairs and a bolster over himself to show how the dancing hall came down. 
He showed this, and he gave it with all the music that belonged to it. There was no talking in the ballet. He sang high and low, with words and without. There was no connection in it. It was just like the whole opera. The most noticeable thing, meanwhile, of all, was his beautiful voice, clear as a bell, but no one spoke of that. Pierre was before to have been a grocer's boy, to mind prunes and lump sugar. Now he found there was something very much finer, and that was to get into the Samson story and dance in the ballet. There were a great many poor children that went that way, said the grandmother, and became fine and honored people. Still no little girl of her family should ever get permission to go that way. A boy? Well, he stood more firmly. Pierre had not seen a single one of the little girls fall before the whole house fell. And then they all fell together, he said. Pierre certainly must be a ballet dancer. He gives me no rest, said his mother. At last his grandmother promised to take him one day to the ballet master, who was a fine gentleman, and had his own house like the merchant. Would Pierre ever get to that? Nothing is impossible for our Lord. Pierre had a gold apple in his hand when he was a child. Such had lain in his hands. Perhaps it was also in his legs. Pierre went to the ballet master and knew him at once. It was Samson himself. His eyes had not suffered at all at the hands of the Philistines. That was only a part of the play, he was told. And Samson looked kindly and pleasantly on him, and told him to stand up straight, look right at him, and show him his ankle. Pierre showed his whole foot and leg, too. So he got a place in the ballet, said Grandmother. It was easily brought about at the ballet master's house. But first his mother and grandmother must needs make other preparations, and talk with people who knew about these things. First with the merchant's wife, who thought it a good career for a pretty, well-formed boy without any prospect like Pierre. Then they talked with Miss Franson. She understood all about ballet. At one time in the younger days of grandmother, she had been the most favorite danseur at the theater. She had danced goddesses and princesses, had been cheered and applauded whenever she came out. But then she grew older, we all do. And then she no longer had principal parts. She had to dance behind the younger ones, and finally she went behind all the dancers quite into the dressing room, where they dressed the others to be goddesses and princesses. So it goes, said Miss Franson. The theatre road is a delightful one to travel, but it is full of thorns. Chicane grows there. Chicane. That was a word Pierre did not understand, but he came to understand it quite well. He is determined to go into the ballet, said his mother. He is a pious Christian child, that he is, said Grandmother. And well brought up, said Miss Franston. Well bred and moral. That was I in my heyday. And so Pierre went to dancing school, and got some summer clothes and thin-soled dancing shoes to make it easier. All the old dancers kissed him and said that he was a boy good enough to eat. He was told to stand up, stick his legs out, and hold on by a post so as not to fall, while he learned to kick first with his right leg, then with his left. It was not so hard for him as for most of the dancers. The ballet master clapped him on the back and said he would soon be in the ballet. He should be a king's child, who was carried on shields and wore a gold crown. That was practiced at the dancing school and rehearsed at the theater itself. The mother and grandmother must go to see little Pierre in all his glory, and they looked, and they both cried for all it was so splendid. Pierre in all his glory and show had not seen them at all, but the merchant's family he had seen. They sat in the loge nearest the stage. Little Felix was with them in his test clothes. He wore buttoned gloves, just like grown-up gentlemen, and sat with an opera glass at his eyes the whole evening, although he could see perfectly well. Again, just like grown-up gentlemen. He looked at Pierre, Pierre looked at him, and Pierre was a king's child with a gold crown on. This evening brought the two children in closer relation to one another. Some days after, as they met each other in the yard, Felix went up to Pierre and told him he had seen him when he was a prince. He knew very well that he was not a prince any longer, but then he had worn a prince's clothes and had a gold crown on. I shall wear them again on Sunday, said Pierre. Felix did not see him then, but he thought about it the whole evening. He would have liked very well to be in Pierre's shoes. He had not Miss Franston's warning that the theatre way was a thorny one, and that chicken grew on it. Neither did Pierre know this yet, but he would very soon learn it. His young companions, the dancing children, were not all as good as they ought to be, for all that they sometimes were angels with wings to them. There was a little girl, Mal Nalimp, who always, when she was dressed as page, and Pierre was a page, stepped maliciously on the side of his foot, so as to see his stockings. There was a bad boy who always was sticking pins in his back, and one day he ate Pierre's sandwiches by mistake, but that was impossible, for Pierre had some meat pie with his sandwich, and the other boy had only bread and butter. He could not have made a mistake. It would be in vain to recite all the vexations that Pierre endured in the two years, and the worst was not yet that was to come. There was a ballet to be brought out called The Vampire, 
In it the smallest dancing children were dressed as bats, wore grey tights that fitted snugly to their bodies, black gauze wings were stretched from their shoulders, and so they were to run on tiptoe as if they were just flying, and then they were to whirl round on the floor. Pierre could do this especially well, but his trousers and jacket, all of one piece, were old and worn. The threads did not hold together, so that just as he whirled round before the eyes of all the people, there was a rip right down his back, straight from his neck down to where the legs are fastened in, and all his short little white shirt was to be seen. All the people laughed. Pierre saw it and knew that he was ripped all down the back. He whirled and whirled, but it grew worse and worse. Folks laughed louder and louder. The other vampires laughed with them and whirled into him, and all the more dreadfully, when the people clapped and shouted, Bravo! That is for the ripped vampire, said the dancing children, and so they always called him Ripper Rip. Pierre cried. Miss Franston comforted him. "'Tis only chicane,' she said, and now Pierre knew what chicane was. Besides the dancing school, they had another one attached to the theatre, where the children were taught to cipher and write, to learn history and geography. Eh, they had a teacher in religion, for it is not enough to know how to dance. There was something more in the world than wearing out dancing shoes. Here, too, Pierre was quick, the very luckiest of all, and got plenty of good marks, but his companions still called him Ripper Rip. It was only a joke, but at last he would not stand it any longer, and he struck out and boxed one of the boys, so that he was black and blue under the left eye, and had to have it whitened in the evening when he was to go in the ballet. Pierre was talked to sharply by the dancing master, and more harshly by the sweeping woman, for it was her son he had punished. End of 2 End of Lucky Pierre Part 1《Section 18 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rui Huck. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales, and short stories volume 6 1866 to 1873 by hans christian anderson translated by h b paul chapter 18 the lucky peer part 2 a good many thoughts went through little peer's head and one sunday when he had his best clothes on he started out without saying a word about it to his mother or grandmother or even to Miss Franzen, who always gave him good advice, straight to the chapel master. He thought this man was the most important one there was outside the ballet. He stepped boldly in and said, I am at the dancing school, but there is so much chicane that I would much rather be a player or a singer, if you please. Have you a voice? asked the chapel master and looked quite pleasantly at him. Seems to me I know you. Where have I seen you before? Was it not you who was ripped down the back? And now he laughed. But Pierre grew red. He was surely no longer lucky Pierre, as his grandmother had called him. He looked down at his feet and wished himself away. Sing me a song, said the chapel master. Nay, cheer up, my lad and he tapped him under the chin and pierre looked up into his kind eyes and sang a song which he had heard at the theatre in the opera robert le diable grâce à moi that is a difficult song hot you make it go said the chapel master you have an excellent voice when it is not ripped in the back and he laughed and called his wife she also must hear pierre sing and she nodded her head and said something in a foreign tongue. Just at that moment, the singing master of the theatre came in. It was he to whom Pierre should have gone if he wanted to get among the singers. Now he came of himself, quite accidentally, as it were. He heard him also sing, Crasse-moi, but he did not laugh, and he did not look so kindly on him as the chapel master and his wife. Still, it was decided that Pierre should have singing lessons. Now he has got on the right track, said Miss Franzen. One gets along a great deal farther with a voice than with legs. 
if i had had a voice i should have been a great songstress and perhaps a baroness now or a bookbinder's lady said mother had you become rich you would have had the bookbinder anyway we do not understand that hint but miss franston did peer must sing for her and sing for the merchant's family when they heard of his new career he was called in one evening when they had company downstairs and he sang several songs for one grace or moi all the company clapped their hands and felix with them he had heard him sing before in the stable peter had sung the entire ballet of samson and that was the most delightful of all one cannot sing a ballet said the lady yes peter could said felix and so he was bidden to it he sang and he talked he drummed and hummed it was child's play but there came snatches of well-known melodies which did not give any idea of what the ballet meant all the company found it very entertaining they laughed and praised it one louder than the other the merchant's lady gave peer a great piece of cake and a silver dollar how lucky the boy felt till his eyes rested on a gentleman who stood somewhat back and looked sternly at him there was something harsh and severe in the man's black eyes he did not laugh he did not speak a single friendly word and this gentleman was the theatre's singing master next morning peer was to go to him and he stood there quite as severe looking as before what possessed you yesterday said he could you not understand that they were making a fool of you never do that again and don't you go running about and singing at doors outside or in now you can go i'll not have any singing with you today peer was dreadfully cast down he had fallen out of the master's good grace nevertheless the master was really better satisfied with him than ever before in all the absurdity which he had scraped together there was some meaning something not at all common the lad had an ear for music and a voice clear as a bell and of great compass if it continued like that then the little man's fortune was made now began the singing lesson peer was industrious arid quick how much there was to learn how much to know the mother toiled and slaved that her son might go well dressed and neat and not look too mean among the people to whose houses he now went he was always singing and trolling they had no heed at all of a canary bird the mother said every sunday must he sing a psalm with his grandmother it was charming to hear his fresh voice lift itself up with hers it is much more beautiful than to hear him sing wildly that was what she called his singing when like a little bird he trolled with his voice and gave forth tones which seemed to come of themselves and make such music as they pleased what tunes there were in his little throat what sounding music in his little breast indeed he could imitate a whole orchestra there were both flute and bassoon in his voice violin and bugle he sang as the birds sang but man's voice is most charming even a little man's when he can sing like peer but in the winter just as he was to go to the priest to be prepared for confirmation he caught cold the little bird in his breast said pip the voice was ripped like a vampire's back piece it is no great misfortune thought mother and grandmother now he doesn't go singing tra la and thus he can think more seriously about his christianity his voice was changing the singing master said peer must now not sing at all how long would it be a year perhaps two perhaps the voice would never come again that was a great grief think now only of the confirmation said mother and grandmother apply yourself to music said the singing master but hold your mouth he thought of his christianity as he studied music there was singing and playing going on inside him he wrote entire melodies down in notes songs without words finally he wrote the words too 
really thou art a poet little peer said the merchant's wife to whom he carried his text in music the merchant received a piece of music dedicated to him a piece without words felix only got one and so did miss franzen and that went into her album in which were verses and music by two who were once young lieutenants but now were old majors on half pay the book was given by a friend who had himself bound it and pierre stood at easter as they say felix presented him with a silver watch it was the first watch pierre had owned it seemed to him that he was a man already when he did not need to ask others what o'clock it was felix came up to the garret congratulated him and handed him the watch he himself was not to stand until the autumn they took each other by the hand these two children of the house both just the same age born the same day and in the same house and felix ate of the cake which had been baked in the garret on occasion of the confirmation it is a glad day with solemn thoughts said grandmother yes very solemn said mother had father only lived to see pierre stand the next sunday they all three sat at our lord's table as they came from church there came a message from the singing master asking pierre to come to him and pierre went some good news awaited him and yet pretty serious too he was to give up singing for a year altogether his voice was to lie fallow like a field peasant might say but during that time he was to go to school not in the capital where every evening he would be running to the theatre from which he could not keep away he was to go thirty miles away from home to board with a schoolmaster who kept a lad or two en pension there he was to learn language and science which would one day be of service to him the charge for a year's course was three hundred rix dollars and that was paid by a benevolent man who did not wish his name given it is the merchant said mother and grandmother the day of departure came a good many tears were shed and kisses and blessings given and then pierre rode thirty miles on the railway out into the wide world it was whitsuntide the sun shone the woods were fresh and green the train went rushing through them fields and villages flitted past gentlemen's country seats peeped out the cattle stood on the after crop pastures soon there came a station then another market town after market town at each stopping place there was a hubbub of people welcoming or saying good-bye there was noisy talking outside and in the carriages where pierre sat there was a deal of entertainment and chattering by a widow dressed in black she talked about his grave his coffin and his corpse meaning her child's it had been such a poor little thing and there could have been no happiness for it had it lived it was a great relief for her and the little lamb when it fell asleep i spared no expense in the flowers said she and you must remember that it died at a very expensive time when you have to cut the flowers in pots every sunday i went to my grave and laid a wreath on it and great wild silk bows the silk bows were immediately stolen by small girls and used for dancing bows they were so attractive one sunday when i went there i knew that my grave was on the left of the principal path but when i got there there was my grave on the right how is this says i to the grave digger isn't my grave on the left no it isn't any longer said he madam's grave lies there to be sure but the mound has been moved over to the right that place belongs to another man's grave but i will have my corpse in my grave said i and i have a perfect right to say so shall i go and dress a false mound when my corpse lies without any sign on the other side indeed i won't oh madam must talk to the dean he is such a good man that dean he gave me permission to have my corpse on the right it would cost five rix dollars 
I gave that with a kiss of my hand, and stood myself by my old grave. Can I now be very sure that it is my own coffin, and that my corpse that is moved? That, madam, can. And so I gave each of the men a piece of money for the moving. But now, since it had cost so much, I thought I ought to send something to make it beautiful. And so I ordered a monument with an inscription. But will you believe it? When I got it, there was a carving of a butterfly at the top. Why, that means frivolity, said I. I want that have on my grave. It's not frivolity, madam. It is immortality. I never heard that, said I. Now, have you, have any of you here in the carriage ever heard of a butterfly as a sign of anything, for anything except frivolity? I held my peace. I have no liking for talk, and I put the monument away in my pantry. There it stood till my lodger came home. He is a student, and has ever so many books. He assured me that it stood for immortality, and so the monument was placed on the grave. In the midst of this chatter, Pierre came to the station where he was to stop, that he too might become student and have ever so many books. End of part three. Part four. Her Gabriel, the worthy man of learning, with whom Pierre was to live as a boarding scholar, was himself at the railway station, waiting to meet him. Her Gabriel was a lank, bony man, with great staring eyes that stuck out so very far, one was almost afraid that when he sneezed, they would start out of his head entirely. He was accompanied by three of his own little boys. One of them stumbled over his own legs, and the other two trod on Pierre's toes in their eagerness to see him close to. Two langer boys besides were with him. The older about fourteen years, fair-skinned, freckled, and very pimply. The young Madsen, student in about three years if he studies, Primus, the dean's son, that was the younger, who looked like a head of wheat. Both are boarders studying with me, said her Gabriel. Our little playthings, he called his own boys. Try and take the newcomer's trunk on your wheelbarrow. The table is set for you at home. Stuffed turkey, said the two young gentlemen who were boarders. Stuffed turkey, said the little playthings, and the first again fell over his own legs. Caesar, look after your feet, exclaimed her Gabriel, and they went into the town and out of it. There stood a great half-tumble-down timber workhouse and a jasmine-covered summer house. Here stood Madame Gabriel with more small playthings, two little girls. The new pupil, said her Gabriel. Most heartily welcome, said Madame Gabriel, a youthful thrifty dame, red and white, with kiss me if you dare curls, and a good deal of pomade on her hair. Good heavens, a well-grown lad you are, said she to Pierre. You are quite a gentleman already. I suppose that you were like Primus or young Madsen. Angel Gabriel, it was well that the inner door is nailed. You know what I think? Fudge, said her Gabriel and they stepped out into the room. There was a novel on the table lying open and a sandwich on it. One could see that it was used for a bookmark. It lay across the open page. Now I must be the housewife. And with all five of the children and the two boarders, she carried Pierre through the kitchen, out by the passageway, and into a little room, the windows of which looked out on the garden that was to be his study and sleeping apartment. It was next to Madame Gabriel's room, where she slept with all the five children, and where the connecting door for decency's sake, and to prevent gossip which spares nobody, had been that very day nailed up by Herr Gabriel at Madame's express request. Here you are, to live just as if you were at your parents, 
we have a theatre too in the town the apothecary is the director of a private company and we have travelling players but now you shall have your turkey and so she carried pierre into the dining-room where the week's wash was drying on a line that doesn't go in do any harm said she it's only cleanliness and you are accustomed of course to that so pierre sat down to the roast turkey in the midst of the children but not with the two boarders who had squeezed themselves in behind and were now giving a dramatic representation for the entertainment of themselves and the stranger there had lately been strolling players in town who had acted Schiller's robbers and the two oldest boys had been immensely taken with it and at once performed the whole piece at home all the parts notwithstanding they only remembered these words dreams come from the stomach but they were made uh, use of by all the characters in different tones of voice there stood amelia with heavenly eyes and dreamy looky dreams come from the stomach said she and covered her face with both her hands karl moore came forward with heroic stride and manly voice dreams come from the stomach and at the whole flock of children boys and girls tumbled in they were all robbers and murdered one another crying out dreams come from the stomach this was schiller's robbers pierre had this representation and stuffed turkey for his first introduction into her gabriel's house then he betook himself to his little chamber whose window into which the sun shone warmly gave upon the garden he sat there and looked out her gabriel was walking there absorbed in reading a book he came nearer and looked in his eyes seemed fixed upon peer who bowed respectfully her gabriel opened his mouth as wide as he could thrust his tongue out and let it wag from one side to the other right in the face of the astonished peer who could not understand what in the world he meant by this performance then off went her gabriel but turned back again before the window and thrust his tongue out of his mouth what did he do that for he was not thinking of beer or that the panes of glass were transparent he only saw that one on the outside was reflected in them and he wanted to see his tongue as he had a stomach ache but peer did not know all this later in the evening her gabriel went into his room and pierre sat in his it was quite late he heard scolding a woman's voice scolding in madame gabriel's sleeping chamber i shall go up to gabriel and tell him what rascals you are we should also go to gabriel and tell him what madame is i shall go into fits she cried out who'll see a woman in a fit for skillings then madame's voice sank deeper but distinctly said what must the young gentleman in there think of our house in hearing all this plain talk at that the scolding grew less but then again rose louder and louder finis cried madame go and make the punch better peace than strife and then it was still they went out of the door the girls and madame knocked on the door to peer young man now you have some notion what it is to be a housewife thank heaven you don't keep girls i want peace and so i give them punch i would gladly give you a glass one sleeps so well after it but no one dares go through the entry after ten o'clock my gabriel will not allow it but you shall have your punch nevertheless there is a great hole stopped up in the door i will push the stopper out put the nose of the pitcher in and do you hold your tumbler under and so i'll give you the punch it is a secret even from my gabriel you must not worry him with household affairs and so pierre got his punch and there was peace in madame gabriel's room peace and quiet in the whole house pierre lay down thought of his mother and grandmother said his evening prayer and fell asleep what one dreams the first night one sleeps in a strange house has special significance grandmother had said pierre dreamt that he took the amber heart which he still constantly wore laid it in a flower pot and it grew into a great tree up through the loft and roof it bore thousands of hearts of silver and gold 
the flower pot broke in two and it was no bigger than an amber heart it had become mould earth to earth gone gone for ever then peer awoke he still had the amber heart and it was warm warm on his own warm heart part five early in the morning the first study hours began at her gabriel's they studied french at breakfast the only ones present were the boarders the children and madame she drank here her second cup of coffee her first she always took in bed it was so wholesome when one is liable to spasms she asked Pierre what he had studied thus far french he replied it's a high cost language said she it is the diplomatic speech and the one that is used by people of good blood i did not study it in my childhood but when one lives with a learned man one gets of his wisdom quite as one gets his mother's milk thus i have all the necessary words i am quite confident i should know how to compromise myself in whatever company i happen to be madame had won a foreign word a title by her marriage with a learned man she was baptized met after a rich aunt whose heir she was to be she got the name but not the inheritance her gabriel rebaptized met into meta the latin for measure when she was named all her clothes woolen and linen were marked with the letters m g meta gabriel by young madsen but young madsen had a boy's wit and read in the letters m g the character very good danish mege good and therefore he added in ink a great interrogation point and put it on the tablecloth the towels the sheets and put it on the tablecloth the towels and sheets don't you like madame asked pierre when young manson made him privately acquainted with this piece of wit she's so kind and her gabriel is so learned she's a bundle of lies said young manson and her gabriel is a scoundrel if i were only a corporal and he a recruit ach how i would give him the flat of my sword and there was a bloody thirsty look about young madsen his lips grew smaller than their wont and his whole face seemed one great freckle these were dreadful words to hear spoken and they gave pierre a shock yet young madsen had the clearest right to them in his mind it was a cruel thing on the part of parents and tutor that a fellow should waste his best most delightful youth in learning grammar names and dates which nobody cares anything for instead of enjoying his liberty and spending his time going about with a gun over his shoulder like a good shot no one has no business to be shut up and sit on a bench till he falls asleep over a book hey gabriel wants that and so no one gets called lazy and has the character possible yes one's parents get letters about it so i say her gabriel is a scoundrel he grips your hand too added little primus who seemed to agree with young madsen it was not at all pleasant for peer to hear them but peer got no hand grips he was too grown up as madsen had said he was not called lazy either for that he was not he was to have his hours alone he was soon well ahead of madsen and primus he has ability said hair gabriel and one can see that he has been to dancing school said madame we must have him in our dramatic society said the apothecary who lived more for the town's private theatre than for his apothecary shop malicious people applied the old stale witticism and he had certainly been bitten by a mad player for he was clean gone mad for the theater the young scholar is born for a lover said the apothecary in a couple of years he could be a romeo and i believe that if he were well painted and had a little mustache we could go on the stage very well this winter the apothecary's daughter great dramatic talent said the father true beauty said the mother was to be juliet 
madame gabriel must be the nurse and the apothecary who was both director and stage manager would take the role of the apothecary a slight one but one of great importance the whole depended on her gabriel's permission for peer to act romeo it was plain that it was best to work through madame gabriel and the apothecary understood that he must first win her over you are born to be nursed said he and thought he was flattering her exceedingly this is assuredly the most complete role in the piece he continued it is the humorous role without it the piece could not be tolerated for its melancholy no one but you madame gabriel has the quickness and life that should bubble tip there here all very true she agreed but her husband would surely never permit his young pupil to contribute those crumbs of time which would have to be given in learning the part of romeo she promised however to pump him as she called it the apothecary began at once to study his part and specially to think about his makeup he wished to be a squint-eyed poor miserable fellow and yet a clever man rather a difficult problem but madame gabriel had a much harder one in pumping her husband to the required point he could not he said answer for it to peer's guardians who paid for his schooling and board if he permitted the young man to play in tragedy we cannot conceal the fact however that peer had the most intense longing to act but it will not do said he it's coming said madame only let me keep on pumping she would have given punch but her gabriel did not drink it with any pleasure married people are sometimes different we say this without any offence to madame one glass and no more she said to herself it elevates the soul and makes one happy and thus it behoves us to be it is our lord's will with us peer was to be romeo that was pumped through by madame the rehearsals were held at the apothecaries they had chocolate and geniuses that is to say small biscuits they were sold at the bake shop 12 for a skilling and they were so exceedingly small and so many that it was thought a witticism to call them geniuses it is an easy thing to make fun of one said her gabriel and so he himself gave nicknames to one thing and another the apothecary's house he called noah's ark with its clean and unclean beasts and that was only because of the affection which was shown by the family towards the two and four-footed pets in the house the young lady had her own cat graciosa a pretty soft-skinned creature which lay in the window in her lap on her work or ran over the table spread for dinner the mistress had a poultry yard a duck yard a parrot and canary birds and polly could outcry them all together two dogs flick and flock walked about the chamber they were not perfumery bottles by any means and they lay on the sofa and on the matrimonial bed the rehearsal began and was only interrupted a moment by the dogs slobbering over madame gabriel's new gown but that was out of pure friendship and it did not spot it the cat also caused a slight disturbance it would insist on giving its paw to juliet sit on her head and beat its tail juliet's tender speeches were divided between the cat and romeo every word that peer had to say was exactly what he wished to say to the apothecary's daughter how lovely and charming she was a child of nature who as madame gabriel expressed it went right by the side of her part peer grew quite warm about it there surely was instinct or something even higher with the cat it perched on peer's shoulders and symbolized the sympathy between romeo and juliet with each successive rehearsal peer's ardor grew more manifest and stronger the cat more confidential the parrot and the canary birds more noisy flick and flock ran in and out the evening of the representation came and peer was romeo himself he kissed juliet right on her mouth 
quite like nature said madame gabriel disgraceful said the counsellor hurst said enston the richest citizen and fattest man in the town the perspiration ran down him the house was so warm and he himself was so heated pierre found no favour in his eyes such a puppy said he appears so long too that one could track him in halves and make two puppies of him great applause and one enemy he got off well indeed pierre was a lucky pierre tired and overcome by the exertions of the evening and the flattery shown him he went home to his little chamber it was past midnight madame gabriel knocked on the wall romeo here's punch and the spout was put through the door and pierre romeo held his glass under good night madame gabriel but pierre could not sleep all that he had said and specially what juliet had said buzzed in his head and when at length he fell asleep he dreamt of a wedding a wedding with miss franzen what singular things one can dream footnotes one danish miles two madame gabriel in anxiety to use fine words sometimes overshot the mark translated three the character given meta gabriel by young madsen was not the highest which is u g who the muck it got but the next to that it is a pity her name had not been una translated four the fifth and next to the worst character translated five a little more than half a cent end of chapter eighteen Section 19 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. 1866 to 1873 by Hans Christian Andersen translated by H. P. Paul chapter 19 The Lucky Peer part 3 6 Now get that comedy out of your head said her Gabriel the next morning and let us squeeze in some science Peer had come near to thinking like young Madsen that one was giving up his fresh youth when he was shut up and set down with a book in his hand but when he sat at his book there shone from it so many noble and good thoughts that peer found himself quite absorbed in it he heard of the world's great men and their achievements so many had been the children of poor people themistocles the hero son of a potter shakespeare a poor weaver's boy who when a young man held horses at the door of the theatre where afterward he was the mightiest man in poetic art of all countries and all time he heard of the singing contest at wartburg where the poets vied to see who would produce the most beautiful poem a contest like the old trial of the grecian poets at the great public feats her gabriel talked of these with especial delight sophocles had in his old age written one of his best tragedies and won the prize of victory over all the others in this honour and fortune his heart broke with joy ah how blessed to die in the midst of his joy of victory what could be more fortunate thoughts and dreamings filled the soul of our little friend but he had no one to whom he could tell them they would not be intelligible to young madsen or to primus nor to madame gabriel either she was either all good humour or the sorrowing mother sitting dissolved in tears her two small girls looked with astonishment at her nor could peer either discover why she was so overwhelmed with sorrow and grief the poor children said she then a mother is ever thinking of their future 
the boys can take care of themselves caesar falls but he gets up again the two older ones splash in the water bowl they want to be in the navy and make good matches but my two little girls what will their future be they will reach the age when the heart feels and then know i well that the one they get attached to will not be at all after gabriel's mind he will give them one they cannot endure and then they will be so unhappy that is what i think of as a mother and that is my sorrow and my grief you poor children you to become so unhappy she wept the little girls looked at her pierre looked at her with a sympathetic look he could not think of anything to answer and so he took himself back to his little room sat down at the old piano and forth came tones and fantasies which streamed through his heart in the early morning he went with a clear brain to his studies and performed the part assigned to him he was a conscientious right-minded fellow in his diary he recorded what each day he had read and studied how late he had sat up playing at the piano always mutely so as not to awaken madame gabriel it never read in his diary except on sunday the day of rest thought of juliet was at the apothecary's wrote a letter to mother and grandmother pierre was still romeo and a good son very industrious said her gabriel follow that example young madsen you will be reject scoundrel said young madsen to himself primus the dean's son suffered from lethargy it is a disease said the dean's wife and he was not to be treated with severity the greenery was only two miles distant wealth and fine society were there he will die a bishop said madame gabriel he has good conjugations at the court and the deaness is a lady of noble birth she knows all about haltry that means coats of arms it was whitsuntide a year had gone by since pierre came to her gabriel's house he had acquired an education but his voice had not returned would it ever come the gabriel household was invited to the dean's to a great dinner and a ball in the evening a good many guests came from the town and from the manor houses about the apothecary's family were invited romeo would see juliet perhaps dance the first dance with her it was a substantial place the deanery whitewashed and without any manure heaps in the yard with a dovecoat painted green about which twined an ivy vine the deaness was a corpulent woman glucopis athene her gabriel called her the blue-eyed and not the ox-eyed as juno was called thought pierre there was a certain remarkable mildness about her an endeavour to give an invalid look she certainly had primus's sickness she was dressed in a corn-coloured silk wore great curls caught up on the right by a large medallion portrait of her great-grandmother a general's wife and on the left by an equally large bunch of crepes of white porcelain the dean had a ruddy well-conditioned countenance with shining white teeth well suited to biting into a roast fillet his conversation was always garnished with anecdotes he could discourse with everybody but no one had ever succeeded in carrying on a conversation with him the counsellor too was here and among the strangers from the manors was felix the merchant's son he had been confirmed and was now a young gentleman very elegant in clothes and manners he was a millionaire they said madame gabriel had not courage to speak to him pierre was overjoyed at seeing felix who came forward most cordially to meet him and said that he bought greetings from his parents who read all the letters which pierre wrote home to his mother and grandmother the dancing began the apothecary's daughter was to dance the first dance with the counsellor that was the promise she had made at home to her mother and the counsellor himself the second dance was promised to pierre but felix came and took her out only vouchsafing a good-natured nod you promised that i should have one dance the young lady will only give permission when you promise pierre kept a civil face and said nothing and felix danced with the apothecary's daughter the most beautiful girl at the ball he danced the next dance also with her will you grant me the supper dance asked pierre with a pale face 
yes the supper dance she answered with her most charming smile you surely will not take my partner from me said felix who stood close by it is not friendly we two old friends from the town you say that you are so very glad to see me then you must allow me the pleasure of taking the lady to supper and he put his arm round pierre and laid his forehead jestingly against his granted isn't it granted no said pierre his eyes sparkling with anger felix gaily raised his arms and set his elbows akimbo looking like a frog ready to spring you have perfect right young gentleman i would say the same if the supper dance were promised me sir he drew back with a graceful bow to the young lady but not long after when pierre stood in a corner and arranged his necktie felix came put his arm round his neck and with the most coaxing look said be splendid my mother and your mother and old grandmother they will all say that it is just like you i am off to-morrow and i shall be horribly bored if i do not take the young lady to supper my own friend my only friend at that pier as his only friend could not hold out he himself carried felix to the young beauty it was bright morning when the guests the next day drove away from the dean's the gabriel household was in one carriage and the whole family went to sleep except pierre and madame she talked about the young merchant the rich man's son who was really pierre's friend as she had heard him say your health my friend mother and grandmother there was something so negligent and so gallant in him she said one saw at once that he was the son of rich people or else a count's child that the rest of us can't claim one must be able to bow pierre said nothing he was depressed all day in the evening at bedtime when lying in bed sleep was chased away he said to himself how they bow and smirk that had he done the rich young fellow because one is born poor he is placed under the favour and condescension of these richly horn people are you then better than we and why were you created better than we there was something vicious rearing up in him something wrong something which his grandmother would be grieved at poor grandmother thou also hast been appointed to poverty god has known how to do that and he felt anger in his heart and yet at the same time an apprehension that he was sinning in thought and word against the good god he grieved to think he had lost his child's mind and yet he possessed it just by this grief whole and rich in nature happy peer a week after there came a letter from grandmother she wrote as she could great letters and small letters mixed up all her heart's love in things small and great that concerned peer my own sweet blessed boy i think of thee i long for thee and that too does thy mother she gets along very well with her washing and the merchant's felix was in to see us yesterday with a greeting from thee you had been at the dean's ball and thou wert so honourable that wilt thou always be and rejoice the heart of thy old grandmother and thy hard-working mother she has something to tell you about miss franson and then followed a postscript from pierre's mother miss franson is married the old thing the bookbinder court has become court bookbinder in accordance with his petition with a great sign court bookbinder court and she has become madam court it is an old love that does not trust my sweet boy thy mother second postscript grandmother has knit you six pair of woollen socks which you will get by the first opportunity i have laid with them a pork pie your favourite dish i know that you never get it at her gabriel's since the lady is so afraid of what i don't know exactly how to spell trishines you must not believe that but only eat thy own mother pierre read the letter and read himself happy felix was so good what wrong had he done him they had separated at the dean's without saying good-bye to each other felix is better than i said pierre seven in a quiet life one day glides into the next and month quickly follows month pierre was already in the second year of his stay at her gabriel's who with great earnestness and determination madame called it obstinacy insisted that he should not again go on the stage 
Peer himself received from the singing master, who monthly paid the stipend for his instruction and support, a serious admonition not to think of comedy playing so long as he was placed there. And he obeyed, but his thoughts travelled often to the theatre at the capital. They had but a fancied life there, on the stage where he was to have stood as a great singer. Now his voice was gone, nor did it come back, and often was he sorely oppressed thereat. Who could comfort him? Neither her Gabriel, nor Madame, but our Lord surely could. Consolation comes to us in many ways. Pierre found it in sleep. He was indeed a lucky Pierre. One night he dreamed that it was Whitsunday, and he was out in the charming green forest where the sun shone in through the boughs, and where all the ground beneath the trees was covered with anemones and cowslips. Then the cuckoo began. Cuckoo! How many years shall I live? asked Pierre, for that people always ask the cuckoo the first time in the year that they hear its note. And the cuckoo answered, Cuckoo! but uttered no more and was silent shall i only live a single year asked pierre truly that is too little be so good as to cuckoo it if it is so then began the bird cuckoo cuckoo ay it went on without end and as it went pierre cuckooed with it and that as lively as if he too were a cuckoo but his note was stronger and clearer all the little birds warbled and pierre sang after them but far more beautifully he had all the clear voice of his childhood and carolled in song he was so glad at heart and then he awoke but with the assurance that the sounding bird still was in him and that his voice still lived and some bright wits and morning would burst forth in all its freshness and so he slept happy in his assurance but days and weeks and months passed he perceived not that his voice came again every bit of intelligence which he could get of the theatre at the capital was a true feast for his soul it was meat and drink to him crumbs are really bread and he received crumbs thankfully the poorest little story there was a flax dealer's family living near the gabriels the mother an esteemable mistress of her household brisk and laughing but without any acquaintance or knowledge of the theatre had been at the capital for the first time and was enraptured with everything there even with the people they had laughed at everything she had said she assured them and that was very likely were you at the theatre also asked pierre that i was replied the flax dealer's wife how i steamed you ought to have seen me sit and steam in that hot place but what did they do what piece did they play that i will tell you said she i shall give you the whole comedy i was there twice the first evening it was a talking piece out came she the princess ah be da be abe da be and how she could talk next came the people abe da be abe da be and then down came madame now they began again the prince he abe dabe abe dabe then down came madame she fell down five times that evening the second time i was there it was all singing abe dabe abe dabe and then down came madame there was a country woman sitting by my side she had never been in the theatre and supposed that it was all over but i who now knew all about it and that when i was there last madame was down five times the singing evening she only did it three times there i there you have both the comedies as true to life as i saw them if it was tragedy she saw madame always came down then it flashed over pierre's mind what she meant at the great theatre there was painted upon the curtain which fell between acts a great female figure amused with the comic and tragic mask this was madame who came down that had been the real comedy what they said and sang had been to the flax dealer's wife only abe dabe abe dabe but it had been a great pleasure and so had it also been to pierre and not less to madame gabriel who heard this recital of the pieces 
she sat with an expression of astonishment and a consciousness of mental superiority for had she not as nurse been shakespeare's romeo and juliet as the apothecary said then down comes madame explained by pierre became afterwards a witty byword in the house every time a child a cup or one or another piece of furniture fell upon the floor in the house that is the way proverbs and familiar sayings arise said her gabriel who appropriated everything to scientific use new year's eve at the stroke of twelve the gabriels and their boarders stood each with a glass of punch the only one her gabriel drank the whole year because punch makes one's stomach ache they drank a health to the new year and counted the strokes of the clock one two till the twelfth stroke down comes madame said they the new year rolled up and on at whitsuntide pierre had been two years in the house eight two years were gone but the voice had not come back how would the future be for our little friend he could always be a tutor in a school that was in her gabriel's mind there was a livelihood in that though nothing to be married on nor was pierre's mind quite made up as to how large a share of his heart the apothecary's daughter had be a tutor said madame gabriel a schoolmaster then be the veriest humdrum on earth just like my gabriel no you're born for the theatre be the greatest actor in the world that is something else than being a tutor an actor ay that was the goal he gave vent to his feelings in a letter to the singing master he told of his longing and his hope most earnestly did he long for the great city where his mother and grandmother lived whom he had not seen for two years the distance was only thirty miles footnote one danish measure end of footnote in six hours by the quick train that could be passed why had they not seen one another that is easily explained peter had on leaving been made to give his promise to stay where he should be placed and not to think of a visit his mother was busy enough with her washing and ironing yet for all that she thought a good many times of making the great journey though it would cost a deal of money but she never did grandmother had a horror of railways she thought to go by them was to fly in the face of providence nothing could induce her to travel by steam she was too an old woman and she would take no journey until she took her last one up to her lord that she said in may but in june the old thing did travel and quite alone too the thirty long miles to the strange town to strange people and all to go to pier it was a great occasion the most sorrowful one that could occur to mother and grandmother the cuckoo had said cuckoo without end when pier the second time asked it how many years shall i live his health and spirits were good the future shone brightly he had received a delightful letter from his fatherly friend the singing master pierre was to go home and they would see what could be done for him what course he could pursue if his voice was really gone appear as romeo said madame gabriel you're old enough now for the lover's part and have got some colour in your cheeks you don't need to paint be romeo said the apothecary and the apothecary's daughter many thoughts went sounding through his head and heart but nobody knows what to-morrow shall be he sat below in the garden and stretched out to the meadow it was evening in moonlight his cheeks burned his blood was on fire the air brought a grateful coolness there over the moor a mist hung that rose and sank and made him think of the dance of the elfin maiden there came into his mind the old saying of the knight olaf who rode out to ask the guests to his wedding which was stopped by the elfin maidens who drew him into their dance and sport and thereby came his death it was a piece of folklore an old poem the moonlight and the mist over the moor painted pictures for it this evening pierre sat and soon was in a half dreaming state looking out upon it all the bushes seemed to have shapes of human sort and half of beastly form they stood motionless while the mist rose like a great waving veil 
Something like this had Pierce seen in a ballet at the theatre, where elfin maidens were represented, whirling and waving with wails of gauze. But here it was far more charming and more wonderful. So great a scene as this no theatre could show. None had so clear an air, so shining a moonlight. Just in front in the mist appeared most distinctly a female shape, and it became three, and the three many. They danced hand in hand, floating girls. The air bore them along to the hedge where Pierce stood. They nodded to him. They spake. It was like the cling-clang of silver bells. They danced into the garden and about him. They enclosed him in their circle. Without thought he danced with them, but not their dance. He whirled about, as in the memorable vampire dance. But he thought not of that. He thought not at all of aught more, but was enveloped in the wondrous beauty he saw around him. The moor was a sea, so deep and dark blue, with water lilies that were bright with all conceivable colours. Dancing over the waves, they bore him upon their veil to the opposite shore, where the giant mound had thrown aside its grassy sward and rose into a castle of clouds. But the clouds were of marble, flowering vines of gold and costly stones twined about the mighty blocks of marble. Each flower was a radiant bud that sang with human voice. It was like a choir of thousands and thousands of happy children. Was it heaven, or was it the elfin hill? The castle walls stirred. They moved toward each other. They closed about him. He was within them, and the world of men was without. Then he felt a pain, a strange yearning, as never before. No outlet could he find, but from the floor away up to the roof there smiled upon him. Sweet young girls, they were so loving as he looked upon them and yet the thought came are ye but paintings he would speak with them but his tongue found no words his speech was gone not a sound came from his lips then he threw himself upon the earth with a misery he never before had known one of the elfin maidens came to him surely she meant well to him in her manner she had taken the shape he would most like to see it was the likeness of the apothecary's daughter he was almost ready to believe that it was she but soon he saw that she was hollow in the back charming front view but open behind and nothing at all inside one hour here is a hundred years outside said she thou hast already been here a whole hour all whom you know and love without these walls are dead stay with us yes stay thou must or the walls will hold thee in a vice till the blood spurts from thy forehead and the walls trembled and the air became like that of a glowing furnace he found his voice lord lord hast thou forsaken me he cried from the depths of his soul then grandmother stood beside him she took him in her arms she kissed his brow and kissed his mouth my sweet little one said she our lord doth not let thee go he lets none of us go not the greatest sinner to god be praise and honour for evermore and she took out her psalm book the same one from which she and peer many a sunday had sung how her voice rang how full her tones all the elfin maidens laid their heads down to the rest they longed for peer sang with grandmother as before he had sung each sunday how strong and mighty all at once was his voice. The walls of the castle trembled. They became clouds and mist. Grandmother went with him out of the hill into the high grass, where the glowworms made light and the moon shone. But his feet were so weary, he could not move them. He sank down on the sward. It was the softest bed. There he rested and awoke to the sound of a psalm. Grandmother sat beside him sat by his bed in the little chamber in her gabriel's house the fever was over life and reason had returned but he had been at the door of death down in the garden that evening they had found him in a swoon a violent fever followed the doctor thought that he would not get up from it again but must die and so they had written thus to his mother she and grandmother felt that they must go to him both could not leave and so the old grandmother went and went by the railway it was for peer only that i did it said she i did it in god's name or i must believe that i flew with the evil one on a broomstick on midsummer's eve End of
The Lucky Peer Part 3 Section 20 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866-1873, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Lucky Peer, Part 4. The journey home was made with glad and light heart. Devoutly did Grandmother thank our Lord that Peer was yet to outlive her. She had delightful neighbours in the railway carriage, the apothecary, and his daughter. They talked about Peer. They loved him as if they belonged to his family. He was to become a great actor, said the apothecary. His voice had now returned too and there was a fortune in such a throat as his what a pleasure it was to the grandmother to hear such words she lived on them she believed them thoroughly and so they came to the station at the capital where the mother met her god be praised for the railway said grandmother and be praised too that i quite forgot i was on it i owe that to these excellent people and she pressed the hands of the apothecary and his daughter the railway is a blessed discovery when one is through with it one is in god's hands then she talked of her sweet boy who was out of all danger and housed with people who were very well off and kept two girls and a man peer was like a son in the house and on the same footing with two children of distinguished families one of them was a dean's son the grandmother had lodged at the post inn it was dreadfully dear but then she had been invited to madame gabriel's there she stayed five days they were angelic people especially the mistress she had urged her to drink punch excellently made but rather strong in about a month would peer by god's help be strong enough to come home to the capital he had been flattered and has become very fine said the mother he will not feel at home here in the garret I am very glad that the singing master has invited him to stay with him, and yet, so mourned she, it is horribly sad that one should be so poor that one's own bairn should not find it good enough for him in his own home. Don't say those words to Peer, said Grandmother. You don't see into him as I do. But he must have meat and drink, anyway, no matter how fine he has grown, and he shall not want those so long as my hands can joggle in the wash-tub. Madame Court has told me that he can dine twice a week with her, now that she's well off. She knows what posterity is, and what rough times are, too. Has she not herself told me that one evening, in the box at the theatre where the old Dan Suisses have a place, she felt sick? The whole day long she only had water and a caraway seed cake, and she was sick from hunger, and very faint. Water, water, cried the other. No, some tarts, she begged. Tarts, she needed something nourishing, and had not the least need of water. Now she has her own pantries and a well-spread table. Thirty miles away Pierre still sat, but happy in the thought that he would soon be in the city, at the theatre with all his old dear friends, whom now he rightly knew how to value. Within him there was music, without there was music too. All was sunshine, the glad time of youth, the time of hope and anticipation. Every day he grew stronger, got good spirits and colour. But Madame Gabriel was much depressed as his time for departure drew near. You are going into great society and into the midst of many temptations, for you are handsome, that you have become in our house. You have navy, just as I have, and that will get you into temptation. One must not be fastidious, and he must not be mangy, fastidious like the Queen Dagmar, who on Sunday tied her silk sleeves and then had her mind made up about such little things. More than that, I would never have taken on so as I, Lucretia, did. What did she stick herself for? She was pure and honest. Everybody in the town knew that. What could she do about the misfortune? 
which i won't talk about but that you at your time of life understand perfectly well so she gives a shriek and takes the dagger there was no use in that i would not have done it nor you either for we are both people of nature and that you will continue to be in your art career how happy i shall be to read about you in the papers some time you will come to our little town and appear perhaps as romeo but i shall not be the nurse then i shall sit in the parkway and enjoy myself madame had a great washing and ironing done the week he went away that peer might go home with a whole clean wardrobe as when he came she drew a new strong ribbon through his amber heart that was the only thing she wanted for a remembrance souvenir but she did not get it from her gabriel he received a french lexicon enriched with marginal notes by her gabriel's own hand madame gabriel gave him roses and ribbon grass the roses would wither but the grass would keep all winter if it did not get into the water but was kept in a dry place and she wrote a quotation from goethe as a kind of album leaf um gang mit frausen it dash element guter sitten she gave it in translation intercourse with women is the foundation of good manners goethe he was a great man said she if he had only not written forced for i don't understand it gabriel says so too young madston presented peer with a not badly done drawing which he had made of her gabriel hanging from the gallows with a ferule in his hand and the inscription a great actor's first conductor on the road of science primus the dean's son gave him a pair of slippers which the deaness herself had made but so large that primus could not fill them for a year or two yet upon the soles was written in ink remember a sorrowing friend primus all of her gabriel's household accompanied peer to the train they shall not say that you went off sans adieu said madame as she kissed him in the railway station i am not concerned said she when one does not do a thing secretly one can do anything the signal whistle let off steam young madson and primus shouted hurrah the small playthings joined in with them madame dried her eyes and wiped them with her pocket handkerchief her gabriel said only the word veil vale. the villages and stations flew by were the people in them as happy as peer he thought of that praised his good fortune and thought of the invisible golden apple which mother had seen lying in his hand when he was a child he thought of his lucky find in the gutter and above all of his new-found voice and of the knowledge he had now acquired he had become altogether another person he sang within for gladness it was a great restraint for him to keep from singing aloud in the cars now the towers of the city appeared and the buildings began to show themselves the train reached the station there stood mother and grandmother and one other along with them madame court well bound court bookbinder court's lady born franzen neither in want nor in prosperity did she forget her friends she must needs kiss him as his mother and grandmother had done court could not come with me said she he is hard at work binding a lot of books for the king's private library you had your good luck and i have mine i have my court and my own chimney corner with a rocking chair twice a week you are to dine with us you shall see my life at home it is a complete ballet mother and grandmother hardly got a chance to talk to peer but they looked on him with eyes that shone with delight then he had to take a cab to drive to his new home at the singing master's they laughed and they cried he is still so charming said grandmother he has his own good face just as when he went away said mother and he will keep that when he is in the theatre the cab stopped at the singing master's door but the master was out his old servant opened the door and showed peer up to his chamber where all about on the walls were portraits of composers and on the stove a white plaster bust stood gleaming the old man a little dull but trustworthiness itself showed him the drawers in the bureau and hooks for him to hang his clothes from and said 
he was very willing to clean his boots when the singing master came in and gave Pierre a hearty shake of the hand in welcome. Here is every convenience, said he. Make yourself quite at home. You can use my piano in the room. Tomorrow we will hear how your voice gets on. This is our warden of the castle, our director of household affairs. And he nodded to the old servant. All is in order. Karl Maria von Weber on the stove there has been whitened in honor of your coming. He was dreadfully grimy. But it is not Weber at all that is put up there. It is Mozart. How comes he there? It is the old Weber, said the servant. I took him myself to the plaster man, and he has sent him home this morning. But this is a bust of Mozart, not a bust of Weber. Pardon, sir, said the servant. It is the old Weber who has become clean. The master does not recognize him again now that he has been whitened. He could learn how it was of the plaster man, and then he got the answer that Weber had been broken in pieces and so he had sent him Mozart instead. It was all the same thing on the stove. The first day Pierre was not to sing nor play, but when our young friend came into the parlour where the piano stood and the opera of Joseph lay open upon it, he sang My Fourteenth Spring, and sang with a voice that was clear as a bell. There was something so charming about it, so innocent, and yet so strong and full. The singing master's eyes were wet with tears. So shall it be and better still, exclaimed he. Now we will shut the piano for the day. You will want to rest. But I must go this evening to my mother and grandmother, for I have promised it. And he hurried away. The setting sun shone over the home of his childhood. The bits of glass in the wall sparkled. It was like a diamond castle. Mother and grandmother sat up there in the garret, a good many steps up, but he flew up three stairs at a time, and was at their door, and received with kisses and embraces. It was clean and tidy there in the little chamber. There stood the stove, the old bear, and the chest of drawers with the hidden treasure which he knew when he rode his hobby horse. On the walls hung the three familiar pictures, the king's portrait, a picture of our lord, the father's silhouette, cut out in black paper. It was a good side view, said mother, but it would have been more like him if the paper had been white and red. For that, he was an excellent man, and Pierre was the very picture of him. There was so much to talk about, much to tell. They were to have a head cheese, and Madame Court had promised to look in upon them in the evening. But how is it that those two old people, Court and Miss Fanston, ever should have got married? asked Pierre. It has been in their thoughts these many years, said Mother. You know he was married? Well, he did it, they say, to pique Miss Fanston, who looked down on him when she was in her high and mighty state. He got a comfortable property with his wife, but she was dreadfully old, lively, and on crutches. She could not die. He waited for it. It would not have surprised me if, like the man in the story, he had every Sunday put the old thing out in the open air so that our Lord might see her and remember to send for her. Miss Franzen sat still and waited, said Grandmother. I never believed she would get it. But last year, Madame Court died, and so Fransom came to be mistress of the house. At that moment, in came Madame Court. We were talking about you, said Grandmother. We were talking about your patience and reward. Yes, said Madame Court. It did not come in my youth, but one is always young so long as one hasn't a broken body, says my Court. He's a witty fellow. We are old, good works, he says, both in one volume and that with gilt top. I am so happy with my court and my chimney corner. A porcelain stove. There, the fire is made in the evening, and it keeps warm all the next day. It is such a luxury. It is as in the ballet of Circe's island. Do you remember me as Circe? Yes, you were charming, said Grandmother. But how people do change. That was not at all said impolitely, and was not so taken. Then came the head cheese and the tea. 
next morning peer paid his visit at the merchant's the lady met him pressed his hand and begged him to take a seat by her in conversation with her he expressed his great gratitude knew that the merchant was a secret benefactor the lady did not know it but it is like my husband said she it is not worth talking about the merchant was nearly angry when peer touched on this you are on the wrong track altogether said he and abruptly closed the conversation felix was a student and was to go into diplomatic life my husband calls it all folly said the lady i have no opinion providence disposes of such things felix did not show himself for he was taking a lesson at his fencing master's at home peer told how he had thanked the merchant but that he would not receive his thanks who told you that he was what you call him your benefactor asked the singing master mother and grandmother answered peer oh then it must be so you know about it said peer i know but you will get nothing out of me now come let us sing an hour here at home this morning Ten. once a week there was quartet music ears soul and thought were filled with the grand musical poems of beethoven and mozart for a long time peer had heard no good and well-given music it was as if a kiss of fire darted down his spine and shot through all his nerves his eyes filled with tears every music evening here at home was a feast to him that made a deeper impression upon him than any opera at the theatre where there is always something that destroys pleasure or brings faults too strongly forward the first thing one knows the words do not come out right they are so smoothed down in the singing that they are as intelligible to a chinaman as to a greenlander then the effect is weakened by faults in the dramatic expression and by a full voice sinking down in single places to the tower of a music box or is drawled out in false tones lack of truthfulness also in decoration and costume is to be observed all this was absent from the quartet the music poems rose in all their grandeur costly hangings decorated the walls in the concert room and he was in the world of music listening to the masters in their fascination in the great public music hall was given one evening by a well-trained orchestra beethoven's pastoral symphony especially the andan movement the scene by the brook stirred and excited our young friend by strange power it carried him into the living fresh woods the lark and the nightingale warbled there the cuckoo sang what beauty of nature what a well-spring of refreshment was there from this hour he knew within himself that it was the picturesque music in which nature had reflected and the emotions of men's hearts were set forth that struck deepest into his soul beethoven and hayden became his favourite composers with the singing master he talked frequently of this and at every conversation they two came nearer each other flow rich in knowledge this man was as inexhaustible as mimers footnote two mimer in the scandinavian mythology is the goddess of wisdom it was from her well that odin drew his bucketfuls of wisdom translator end of footnote well pierre listened to him and just as when he was a little boy he heard eagerly grandmother's wonder stories and tales now he heard those of the world of music and knew what the forest and the sea told what sounds in the old giant mound what every bird sings with its bill and what the voiceless flowers breathe forth in fragrance the hour for singing every morning was a real hour of delight for master and pupil every little song was sung with a freshness and expression and a simplicity most charmingly did they give schubert's travel song the melody was true and as the words also they blended together they exalted and illumined one another as is fitting peer was undeniably a dramatic singer each month showed progress in ability every week yes each day by day our young friend grew in a wholesome happy way knowing no want or sorrow his trust in mankind was never deceived he had a child's soul and a man's endurance and everywhere he was received with gentle eyes and a kind welcome day by day the relations between him and the singing master grew more intimate and more confidential 
the two were like elder and younger brothers and the younger had all the fervour and warmth of a young heart that the elder understood and gave in turn in his own wise the singing master's character was marked by a sudden ardour and one saw at once that this man could hate vehemently or love passionately and fortunately this last governed in him he was moreover so placed by a fortune left him by his father that he did not need to take any office which he did not content him he did secretly a great deal of good in a sensible way but would not suffer people to thank him or indeed to talk about it have i done anything said he it is because i could and ought to do it it was my duty his old serving man our warden as he called him in jest talked only with half a voice and he gave expression to his opinion about the master of the house i know what he gives away between a year and a day and i don't know the half the king ought to give him a star to wear on his breast but he would not wear it he would get mad as lightning if i know him should one notice him for his honesty he's happy beyond the rest of us in his faith which he has he's just like a man out of the bible and at that the old fellow gave an additional emphasis as if pierre could have some doubt he felt and understood well that the singing master was a true christian in good earnest an example for every one yet the man never went to church and when pierre one day mentioned that next sunday he was going with his mother and grandmother to our lord's stable and asked if the singing master never did the same the answer came no it seemed as if he would say something more as if indeed he had some confidence to impart to pierre but it was not said one evening he read aloud from the papers of the beneficence of two or three persons who were mentioned and that led him to speak of good deeds and their reward when one does not think of it it is sure to come the reward for good friends is like dates that are spoken of in the talmud they ripen late and then are sweet talmud asked pierre what sort of a book is that a book was the answer from which more than one seed of thought has been implanted in christianity who wrote the book wise men in the earliest time wise in various nations and religions here is wisdom enclosed in such words as the finds in solomon's proverbs what kernels of truth one reads here that men round about the whole earth in all the centuries have always been the same what kernels of truth one reads here that men round the whole earth in all the centuries have always been the same thy friend has a friend and thy friend's friend has a friend be discreet in what you say is found here it is a piece of wisdom for all times no one can jump over his own shadow is here too and wear shoes when you talk over thorns you ought to read this book you will find in it the proof of culture more clearly than you will discover cultivation of the soil in layers of the earth for me as a jew it is besides an inheritance from my fathers jew said pierre are you a jew did you not know that how strange that we two should not have spoken of it before today mother and grandmother knew nothing about it either they had never thought anything about it but always had known that the singing master was an honorable unexceptionable man it was in the providence of god that pierre had come in his way next to our lord he owed him all his fortune and now the mother let out a secret which she had carried faithfully a few days only and which under the pledge of secrecy had been told her by the merchant's lady the singing master was never to know that it was out it was he who had paid for pierre's support and education at her gabriel's from the evening when at the merchant's house he heard pierre sing the ballad samson he alone had been his real friend and benefactor but in secret end of the lucky peer part 4section 21 of ans christian andersen fairy tales and short stories volume 6 this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck, Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 6, 1866-1873, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. B. Paul. The Lucky Peer, Part 5. 11. Madam Court expected Peer to visit her at her house, and he went there. Now you shall know my court, said she and you shall make the acquaintance of my chimney corner i never dreamed of this when i danced in circe and the rose elf in provence indeed there are not many now who think of that ballet and of little franzen seek transit gloria in the moon as they say in latin my court is a witty fellow and uses that phrase we be i talk about my time of honour he likes to poke fun at me but he does it with a good heart. The chimney corner was an inviting low studded room with a carpet on the floor and an endless lot of portraits for a bookbinder to have. There was a picture of Gutenberg and one of Franklin, of Shakespeare, Cervantes, Moliere and the two blind poets Homer and Ossian. Lois down, hung, glazed and in a broad frame one cut out in paper of a damp Swiss with great spangles on a dress of gauze, the right leg lifted toward heaven and written beneath a verse. Who wins our heart by her dancing? Who of her wreath trophies can sing? Mademoiselle Emily Franzen. Footnote. 1. It is but fair to say for the enthusiastic court that he is not responsible for the disgraceful English rhymes. His Danish ones were built on Miss Franzen's name. Translator. End of footnote. It was written by Court, who wrote excellent verse, especially comic verse. He had himself clipped the picture out and pasted and sewed it before he got his first wife. It had lain many years in a drawer. Now it flourished here in the poetic picture gallery. My chimney corner as madame court called her little room here were peer and court introduced to each other is he not a charming man said she to peer to me he is just the most charming i on a sunday when i am well bound in state clothes said her court you are charming without any binding said she and then she tipped her head down as it came over her that she had spoken a little too childishly for one of her age Oh, love does not rust, said her court. An old house a fire burns down to the ground. It is as with the phoenix, said Madame Court. One rises up young again. Here is my paradise. I do not care at all to seek any other place except an hour at your mother and grandmother's. And at your sister's, said her court. No, angel court. It is no longer any paradise there. I must tell you, Peer, they live in narrow circumstances, but there is a great mingle-mangle about them for all that. No one knows what he dare say there in that house. One dare not mention the word darky, for the eldest daughter is beloved by one who has negro blood in him. One dare not say hunchback, for that one of the children is. One dare not talk about defalcation. My brother-in-law has been in that unfortunate way. One dare not even say that he has been driving in the wood. Wood is an ugly sound, for it is just the same as Woods, who fought with the youngest son. I don't like to go out and sit and hold my tongue. I don't dare talk. So I just come back to my own house and sit in my chimney corner. Were it not too emphatic, as they say, I would gladly ask our Lord to let us live as long as my chimney corner holds out. For there grows better here is my paradise and this my court has given me she has a gold mill in her mouth said he and thou hast gold grain in thy heart said she grind grind all the bag will hold millie's the grain millie's pure gold said he as he chucked her under the chin that verse was written right on the spot it ought to be printed yes 
and handsomely bowed said he so these two old folks rallied each other a year passed before pierre began to study a role at the theatre he chose joseph but he changed it for george brown in the opera of the white lady the words and music he quickly made his own and from sir walter scott's romance which had furnished the material for the opera he obtained a clear full picture of the young spirited officer who visits his native hills and comes to his ancestral castle without knowing it an old song wakens recollections of his childhood fortune attends him and he wins a castle and his wife what he read became as if something which he himself had lived a chapter of his own life story the music rich in melodies was entirely in keeping there was meanwhile a long very long time before the first rehearsals began the singing master did not mean that there should be any hurry about his appearance and at length he too understood this he was not merely a singer he was an actor and his whole being was thrown into his character the chorus and the orchestra at the very first applauded him loudly and the evening of the representation was looked forward to with the greatest expectation one can be a great actor in a nightgown at home said a good-natured companion can be very great by daylight but only so so before the lights in a full house that you will see for yourself pierre had no anxiety but the strong desire for the eventful evening the singing master on the contrary was quite feverish pierre's mother had not the courage to go to the theatre she would be ill with anxiety for her dear boy grandmother was sick and must stay at home the doctor had said but the trusty friend madame court promised to bring the news the very same evening how it all went off she should and would be at the theatre even if she were to be in the last extremity how long the evening was how the three or four hours stretched into eternity grandmother sang a psalm and prayed with mother to the good god for their little peer that he might this evening also be lucky peer the hands of the clock moved slowly now peer is beginning they said now he is in the middle now he has passed it the mother and grandmother looked at one another but they said never a word in the streets there was the rumbling of carriages people were driving home from the theatre the two women looked down from the window the people who were passing talked in loud voices they were from the theatre they knew bringing good news or sorrow up into the garret of the merchant's house at last someone came up the stairs madame court burst in followed by her husband she flung herself on the necks of the mother and grandmother but never said a word she cried and sobbed lord god said mother and grandmother how has it gone with peer let me weep said madame court so overcome was she i cannot bear it ah oh, you dear good people you cannot bear it either and her tears streamed down have they hissed him off cried the mother no no not that said madame court they have oh that i should live to see it then both mother and grandmother fell to weeping be calm emily said her court pierre has been victorious he has triumphed the house came near tumbling down they clapped him so i can feel it still in my hands it was one storm of applause from pit to gallery the entire royal family clapped too really it was what one may call a white day in the annals of the theatre it was more than talent it was genius i genius said madame court that is my word god bless you court that you spoke that word out you dear good people never would i have believed that one could so sing and act in comedy and yet i have lived through a theatre's whole history she cried again the mother and grandmother laughed while tears still chased down their cheek now sleep well on that said her court and now come emily good night good night 
they left the garret chamber and two happy people there but these were not long alone the door opened and pierre who had not promised to come before the next forenoon stood in the room he knew well with what thoughts the old people had followed him how ignorant too they still must be of his success and so he was driving past with the singing master he stopped outside there were still lights up in the chamber and so he must needs go up to them splendid glorious superb all went off well he exclaimed jubilantly and kissed his mother and grandmother the singing master nodded with a bright face and pressed their hands and now he must go home to rest said he and the visit was over ah oh, father in heaven how gracious and good thou art said these two poor women they talked long into the night about pierre round about in the great town people talked of him the young handsome wonderful singer so far had pierre's fame gone twelve the morning papers mentioned the debut with a great flourish of trumpets as something more than common and the dramatic reviewer reserved till another number his privilege of expressing his opinion the merchant invited pierre and the singing master to a grand dinner it was an attention intended as a testimony of the interest which he and his wife felt in the young man who was born in the house and in the same year and on the very same day as their own son the merchant proposed the health of the singing master the man who had found and polished this precious stone a name after which one of the prominent papers had called pierre felix sat by his side and was the soul of gaiety and affection after dinner he brought out his own cigars they were better than the merchant's he can afford to get them said that gentleman he has a rich father pierre did not smoke a great fault but one that could easily be mended we must be friends said felix you have become the lion of the town all the young ladies and the old ones too for that matter you have taken by storm if you are a lucky fellow all over i envy you especially that you can go in and out over there at the theatre among all the little girls that did not now seem to peer anything so very worthy of envy he had a letter from madame gabriel she was in transports over the extravagant accounts in the papers of his debut and all that he was to become as an artist she had drunk his health with her maids in a bowl of punch her gabriel also had a share in his honour and was quite sure that he beyond most others spoke foreign words correctly the apothecary ran about town and reminded everybody that it was at their little theatre they had first seen and being amazed by his talent which was now for the first time recognised at the capital the apothecary's daughter would be quite out of conceit with herself added madame now that he could be courting baronesses and countesses the apothecary's daughter had been in too much of a hurry and given in too soon she had been betrothed a month since to the fat counsellor the bans had been published and they were to be married on the twentieth of the month it was just the twentieth of the month when pierre received this letter he seemed to himself to have been pierced through the heart at that moment it was clear to him that during all the vacillation of his soul she had been his steadfast thought he thought more of her than of all others in the world tears came into his eyes he crumpled the letter in his hand it was the first great grief of heart he had known since he heard with mother and grandmother that his father had fallen in the war it seemed to him that all happiness had fled and his future was dull and sorrowful the sunlight no longer beamy from his youthful face the sunshine was put out in his heart he does not seem well said mother and grandmother it is the wear and tear of that theatre life he was not the same as formerly 
they both perceived and the singing master also saw it what is the matter said he may i not know what troubles thee at that his cheeks turned red his tears flowed afresh and he burst out with his sorrow his loss i loved her so earnestly said he now for the first time when it is too late i see it clearly poor troubled friend i understand thee so well weep freely before me and hold fast by the thought as soon as thou canst but what happens in the world happens best for us i too have known and felt what you now are feeling i too once like you loved a girl she was discreet she was pretty and fascinating she was to be my wife i could offer her good circumstances but one condition before the marriage her parents required and she required i must become a christian and that you would not i could not one cannot with an honest conscience jump from one religion to another without sinning either against the one he takes leave of or the one he steps into have you no faith said pierre i have the god of my fathers he is a light for my feet and my understanding they sat for an hour silent both of them then their hands glanced over the keys and the singing master played an old folk song neither of them sang the words each made his own thoughts underlie the music madame gabriel's letter was not again read she little dreamed what sorrow it had carried a few days after there came a letter from her gabriel he also wished to offer his congratulations and a commission it was this especially which had given occasion to the letter he asked pierre to buy a little porcelain thing namely armor and hymen love and marriage it is all sold out here in the town he wrote but easily to be got in the capital the money goes with this send the thing along as quickly as possible it is a wedding present for the councillor at whose marriage i was with my wife finally pierre came to young madsen will never become a student he has left the house and has dubbed the walls over with stale witticisms against the family a hard subject that young madsen so puri 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 purila trustant boys are boys and boys do boyish things i translate it since you are not a latinist and with that her gabriel's letter closed 13 sometimes when pierre sat at the piano there sounded tones in it which stirred thoughts in his breast and head the tones rose into melodies that now and then carried words along with them they could not be separated from song thus arose several little poems that were rhythmic and full of feeling they were sung in a subdued voice it was as if they were shy and timid in feeling and moved in loneliness like the wind our days are blown no tarrying places here from cheeks the roses have flown perish the smile and the tear wherefore then smitten with grief sorrow to take it its flight everything fades like the leaf men and women and daytime and night vanishing vanishing all thy youth thy hope and thy friend like the wind they heed not thy call they vanish not turn back again where did you get that song and melody asked the singing master who accidentally found the words and music written down it came of itself that and all this they do not fly farther into the world a downcast spirit sets out flowers too said the singing master but it dare not give counsel now we must set sail and steer for your next debut what do you say to hamlet the melancholy young prince of denmark i know shakespeare's tragedy said pierre but not yet thomas's opera the opera should be called ophelia said the singing master shakespeare has in the tragedy made the queen tell us of ophelia's death and this is made to be the chief point in the musical rendering one sees before his eyes and feels in the tones what before we could only learn from the narrative of the queen there is a willow grows a slant a brook that shows his hoar leaves in the glassy stream 
prepare with fantastic garlands did she come of crow flowers nettles daisies and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them there on the pendant boughs her coronet weeds clambering to hang an envious silver broke when down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook her clothes spread wide and murmured like a while they bore her up which time she chanted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress or like a creature native and endued unto that element but long it could not be till that her garments heavy with their drink pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death the opera brings all this before our eyes we see ophelia she comes out playing dancing singing the old ballad about the mermaid that entices men down beneath the river and while she sings and plucks the flowers the same tones are heard from the depths of the stream they sound in the voices that allure from the deep water she listens she laughs she draws near the brink she holds fast by the overhanging willow and stoops to pluck the white water lily gently she glides on to it and singing reclines on its broad leaves she swings with it and is carried by the stream out into the deep where like the broken flower she sinks in the moonlight with the mermaid's melody welling forth about her in the entire scene it is as if hamlet his mother his uncle and the dead avenging king alone were necessary to make the frame for the picture we do not get shakespeare's hamlet just as in the opera forced we do not get goethe's creation the speculative is no material for music it is the passionate element in both these tragedies which permits them to be rendered in a musical production the opera of hamlet was brought on the stage the actress who had ophelia's part was admirable the death scene was the most effectively rendered but hamlet himself received on this evening a commensuratic greatness a fullness of character which grew with each scene in which he appeared people were astonished at the compass of the singer's voice at the freshness shown in the high as well as in the deep tones and that he could with a like brilliancy of power sing hamlet and george brown the singing parts in most italian operas are a patchwork in which the gifted singers men and women work in their soul and genius and then out of the variegated colours given them construct shapes as the progress of the poem requires how much more glorious then must they reveal themselves when the music is carried out through thoughts and characters and this gonod and thomas have understood this evening at the theatre hamlet's form was flesh and blood and he raised himself into the position of the chief personage in the opera most memorable was the night scene on the ramparts where hamlet for the first time sees his father's ghost the scene in the castle before the stage which had been erected where he flings out the words that are drops of poison the terrible meeting with his mother where the father's ghost stands in a vengeful attitude before the son and finally what might in the singing what music at ophelia's death she became as a lotus flower upon the deep dark sea whose waves rolled with a mighty force into the soul of the spectators hamlet this evening became the chief personage the triumph was complete how came he by it said the merchant's rich wife as she thought on peer's parents and his grandmother up in the garret the father had been a warehouse man clever and honourable he had fallen as a soldier on the field of honour the mother a washerwoman but that does not give the son culture as he grew up in a charity school and how much in a period of two years could a provincial schoolmaster instil into him of higher science it is a genius said the merchant genius that is born of god's grace most certainly said his wife and folded her hands reverently when she talked to peer 
do you feel humble in your heart at what you have received she asked heaven has been unspeakably gracious to you everything has been given you do not know how overpowering your hamlet is you have yourself created the representation i have heard that many great poets do not themselves know the glory of what they have given the philosophers must reveal it for them where did you get your conception of hamlet i have thought over the character and have read a portion of what has been written about shakespeare's work and since on the stage i have entered into the person and his surroundings i give my part and our lord gives the rest our lord said she with a self-reproving look do not use that name he gave you power but you do not believe that he has anything to do with the theatre and opera most assuredly i do said pierre courageously there also does he have a pulpit for men and most people hear better there than in church she shook her head god is with us in all good and beautiful things but let us be careful how we take his name in vain it is a gift of grace for one to be a great artist but it is still better to be a good christian felix she felt would never have named the theatre and the church together before her and she was glad of that now you have laid yourself out against mamma said felix laughing that was very far from my thoughts don't trouble yourself about that you will get into her good graces again next sunday when you go to church stand outside her pew and look up to the right for there in the balcony pew is a little face which is worth looking at the widow baroness's charming daughter here is a well-meant piece of advice and i give it to you you cannot live where you are now move into larger lodgings with the stairs in good order or if you won't leave the singing master then let him live in better style he has means enough and you have a pretty good income you must give a party too an evening supper i could give it myself and will give it but you can invite a few of the little dancing girls you're a lucky fellow but i believe heaven help me that you don't yet understand how to be a young man pierre did understand it exactly in his own way with his full ardent young heart he was in love with art she was his bride she returned his love and lifted his soul into gladness and sunshine the depression which had crushed him soon evaporated gentle eyes looked upon him and every one met him in a friendly and cordial manner the amber heart which he still wore constantly on his breast where grandmother once had hung it was certainly a talisman and he thought for he was not quite free from superstition a childlike faith one may call it every nature that has genius in it has something of this and looks to and believes in its star grandmother had shown him the power that lay in the heart of drawing things to itself his dream had shown him how out from the amber heart there grew a tree which burst through garret and roof and bore a thousand fold of hearts and silver and gold that surely betokened that in the heart in his own warm heart lay the might of his art whereby he had won and still should win thousands upon thousands of hearts between him and felix there was undoubtedly a kind of sympathy different as they were from each other pierre assumed that the difference between them lay in this that felix as the rich man's son had grown up in temptations and could afford to taste them and take his pleasure thus he had on the contrary been more fortunately placed as a poor man's son both of these two children of the house were meanwhile growing up into eminence felix would soon be a camera junker footnote two titles of court attendants the latter of these gentlemen were in their court dress a gold key hanging by a ribbon at the back of the coat end of footnote and that is the first step to being a camer her as long as one has a gold key behind pierre always lucky he had already in his hand though it was invisible the gold key of genius which opens all the treasures of the earth and all hearts too end of the lucky peer part 5
section 22 of anderson fairy tales and short stories volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ruhi hak hans christian anderson fairy tales and short stories volume 6 1866 to 1873 by Anne Christian Anderson, translated by H. P. Paul. The Lucky Peer, Part Six. Fourteen. It was still winter time. The sleigh bells jingled and the clouds carried snowflakes in them. But when sunbeams burst through them, there was a heralding of spring. There was a fragrance and a music in the young heart that flowed out in picturesque music and found expression in words a spring song in swath of snow the earth is lying over the sea merry skaters are flying the frost rim trees are speckled with crow but tomorrow tomorrow the winter time goes the sun bursts through the skies spring comes riding in summer guise footnote three it is a custom at easter tide for the peasants to come riding into the towns and villages their horses and themselves decked with green boughs especially of the beach and so they go in procession and have a merry dance in the evening it is then said it's the people's way spring is riding summerwise into town End of footnote. and the willow pulls off its woollen glove strike up musicians in leafy grove little birds little birds sing in the sky winter's gone by winter's gone by o oh, warm is the kiss of the sun on our cheek as violets in stone wart in the woodland we seek tis as if the old forest were holding its breath for now in a night each leaf wakes from death the cuckoo sings you know its tell-tale song so many years your days will be long footnote four it is a scandinavian superstition that the first cuckoo one hears in the spring will answer the question how many years shall i live by a prophetic number of notes many other questions were asked and boys and girls will go out at night then in the early morning they may hear the cuckoo's answers end of footnote the world is young be thou too young let happy heart and merry tongue with springtime lift the song on high youth's never gone by never gone by youth's never gone by never gone by the earth lives a charmed life for i with its sun and its storm its joy and its pain so in our hearts a world has lain that will not be gone like a shooting star for man is made by god afar and god and nature keep ever young so teach us spring the song thou sung and pipe in little birds in the sky youth's never gone by never gone by that is a complete musical painting said the singing master and well adapted for chorus and orchestra it is the best yet of your pieces which have sprung out of words you certainly must learn through bass although it is not your vocation to be a composer some young music friends meanwhile quickly brought out a song the song at a great concert where it excited remark but led to nothing our young friend's career was open before him his greatness and importance lay not in the sympathetic tones of his voice but in his remarkable dramatic power this he had shown as george brown and as hamlet he very much preferred the regular opera to the singing of pieces it was contrary to his sound and natural sense this stepping over from song to talking and back to singing again it is said he as if one came from marble steps on to wooden ones sometimes even on to mere hen roosts and then again to marble the whole poem should live and breathe in its passage through stones the music of the future which the new movement in opera is called and of which wagner is specially standard bearer received a response and strong admiration from our young friend he found here characters so clearly marked passages so full of thought the entire handling characterized by forward movement without any standstill or recurrence of melodies 
it is surely a most unnatural thing the introduction of areas yes introduction said the singing master but how they in the works of most of the great masters stand prominently forth a large part of the whole so must and should it be if the lyric has a home in any place it is in the opera and he mentioned in don juan don octavia's area tears cease your flowing how like is it to a charming lake in the woods by whose bank one rests and is filled to the brim with the music that streams through the leafy woods i pay my respects to the profundity that lies in the new musical movement and i do not dance with you before that golden calf nor is it your heart's real meaning which you express or else you are not yourself quite clear about it i will appear in one of wagner's operas said our young friend if i cannot show my meaning by the words yet i will by my singing and acting the choice fell on lohengrin the young mysterious knight who in the boat drawn by swans glides over the scheldt to do battle for elsa of brabant who so well as he ever acted and sang the first song of the meeting the conversation of two hearts in the bridal chamber and the song of farewell when the holy grail's white dove hovers about the young knight who came one and vanished this evening was if possible another step forward in the artistic greatness and celebrity of our young friend and to the singing master it was a step forward in the recognition of the music of the future under certain conditions he said fifteen at the great yearly exhibition of paintings pierre and felix one day met before the portrait of a young and pretty lady daughter of the widow baroness as the other was generally called whose salon was the rendezvous for the world of distinction and for every one of eminence in art and science the young baroness was in her sixteenth year so an innocent charming child the picture was a good likeness and given with artistic skill step into the saloon here close by said felix there stands the young beauty with her mother they stood engaged in looking at a characteristic picture it represented a field where two young married people came riding on the same horse holding fast to one another the chief figure meanwhile was a young monk who was looking at the two happy travellers there was a sorrowful dreamy look in the young man's countenance one could read in it his thought the story of his life an aim missed great happiness lost human happiness and human love he had not won the elder baroness saw felix who respectfully greeted her and the beautiful daughter pierre showed the same customary politeness the widow baroness knew him immediately from having seen him on the stage and after speaking to felix she said some friendly obliging words to pierre as she pressed his hand i and my daughter belong to your admirers what perfect beauty seemed to possess the young girl at this moment she looked with her gentle clear eyes almost gratefully upon him i see in my house continued the widow baroness very many of the most distinguished artists we common people stand in need of a spiritual airing you will be heartily welcome our young diplomat she pointed to felix will show you the way the first time and afterward i hope you will find the way yourself she smiled on him the young girl reached out her hand naturally and cordially as if they had long known each other later in the autumn one cold sleety evening the two young men went as they had been invited it was weather for driving and not walking in for the rich man's son and for the first singer on the stage nevertheless they walked well wrapped up with galoshes on their feet and rough caps on their heads it was like a complete fairy scene to come out from the row into the apartment displaying such luxury and good taste in the vestibule before the carpeted stairs there was a great display of flowers among bushes and fan palms a little fountain splashed in the basin which was surrounded by tall callas the great saloon was beautifully lighted and a great part of the company had already gathered soon there was almost a crowd people trod on silk trains and laces there was a hum round about 
of conversation's sonorous mosaic which on the whole was the least worth while of all the splendour there had pierre been a vain fellow which he was not he could have imagined that it was a feast made for him so cordial was the reception which he had met from the mistress of the house and the beaming daughter young ladies and old yes and gentlemen with them said most agreeable things to him there was music a young author read a very well written poem there was singing and true delicacy was shown in that no one urged our young and honoured singer to make the whole affair most complete the lady of the house was the observing hostess full of spirits and full of hospitality in that elegant salon it was his introduction into the great world and our young friend was soon here also one of the select ones in the choice family circle the singing master shook his head and smiled how young thou art dear friend said he that thou canst enjoy going among these people they can be good enough in and for themselves but they look down on us plain citizens for some of them it is only a piece of vanity an amusement and for others a sort of mark of exclusive culture when they receive into their circle artists and the lions of the day these belong in the salon much as the flowers in a vase they wither and then they are thrown away how harsh and unjust said pierre you do not know these people and will not know them no answered the singing master i am not at home with them nor are you either and this they all remember and know they caress you and look at you just as they pat and look at a race horse that is to win a wager you belong to another race than they they will let you go when you are no longer in the fashion do you not understand that you are not proud enough you are vain and you show that by seeking these people how very differently you would talk and judge said pierre if you knew the widow baroness and a few of my friends there i shall not get to knowing them said the singing master when is the engagement to come out asked felix one day is it the mother or the daughter and he laughed don't take the daughter for then you'll have all the young nobility against you and i too shall be your enemy and the fiercest one what do you mean asked pierre you are the most favoured one you can go out and in at all hours you'll get the cash along with the mother and belong to a good family stop your joking said pierre there is nothing amusing to me in what you say no indeed there is no fun at all in it said felix it is a most serious matter for you'll not let her grace sit and weep and be a double widow leave the baroness out of your talk said pierre make yourself merry over me if you want to but over me alone and i will answer you no one will believe that it is a love match on your side continued felix she is a little outside of the line of beauty one does not live on spirit alone i give you credit for more refinement and good sense said pierre than would let you talk thus of a lady you ought to esteem and whose house you visit and i won't talk of this longer what are you going to do about it asked felix will you fight i know that you have learned that and i have not but i can learn and he left felix a day or two afterward the two children of the house met again the son from the first floor and the son from the garret felix talked to pierre as if no quarrel had risen between them he answered courteously but curtly too what is the matter now said felix we two were a little irritable lately but one may have his joke without being flayed for it so let us forget and forgive can you forgive yourself the manner in which you spoke of a lady to whom we both owe great respect i spoke very frankly said felix in fine society one may talk with a razor edge but that is not thought an ill thing it is the salt for the tasteless fish dinner as the poet calls it we are all just a little wicked you can also let a drop fall my friend a little drop of innocence which makes one smart so they were soon seen arm in arm felix well knew that more than one pretty young lady who would otherwise have passed him by without seeing him now noticed him since he was walking with the idol of the stage lamplight always 
casts a glamour over the theatre's hero and lover it still shines about him when he shows himself on the street in daylight but it is generally rather extinguished then most of the artists of the stage are like swans one should see them in their element not on the paving stones or the public promenade they are exceptions however and to these belonged our young friend his appearance apart from the stage never disturbed the conception one had of him as george brown or hamlet or lohengrin it was the form associated thus with poetry or music that many a heart made to be the same with the man himself and exalted into the ideal he knew that it was thus and found a kind of pleasure in it he was happy in his art and the means he possessed of exercising it yet there would come a shadow over the joyous young face and from the piano sounded the melody with the words vanishing vanishing all thy youth thy hope and thy friend like the wind they heed not thy call they vanish nor turn back again how mournful said the widow baroness you have happiness in full measure i know no one who is so happy as you call no one happy before he is in his grave the wise solon said replied he and smiled through his seriousness it were a wrong a sin if i were not thankful and glad of heart i am thus i am thankful for what is entrusted to me but i myself set a different value on this from what others do it is a beautiful piece of fireworks which shoots off and then is all out the actor's work thus vanishes out of knowledge the everlasting shining stars may be forgotten for the meteors of a moment but when these are extinguished there is no living trace of them except by the old signs a new generation does not know and cannot picture to itself those who delighted their fathers from the stage youth perhaps applaud splendour and brass as delightedly and as loudly as the old folks once did splendour and true gold far more fortunately placed than the scenic artist are the poet the sculptor the painter and the composer they may in the struggle of life experience hard fortune and miss the merited appreciation while those who exhibit their works as the actor and the musician live in luxury and proud taste let the many stand and gaze at the bright coloured cloud and forget the sun yet the cloud vanishes the sun shines and beams for new generations he sat at the piano and improvised with a richness of thought and a power such as he never before had shown wonderfully beautiful broke in the widow baroness twas as if i heard the story of a whole lifetime you gave your heart's canticle in the music i thought of the thousand and one nights said the young girl of the lamp of fortune of aladdin and she looked with pure dewy eyes upon him aladdin he repeated this evening was the turning point in his life a new section surely began what was befalling him this befitting year his fresh colour forsook his cheeks his eyes shone far more clearly than before he passed sleepless nights but not in wild orgies in revels and rioting as so many great artists he became less talkative but more cheerful what is it that fills you so said his friend the singing master you do not confide all to me i think how fortunate i am he replied i think of the poor boy i think of aladdin sixteen measured by the expectations of a poor-born child pierre now led a prosperous agreeable life he was so well to do that as felix once said he could give a good party to his friends he thought of it and thought of his two earliest friends his mother and grandmother for them and himself he provided a festival it was charming spring weather the two old people must drive with him out of town and see a little country place which the singing master had lately bought as he was about seating himself in the carriage there came a woman humbly clad about thirty years old she had a begging paper recommending her from madame court 
don't you know me said she little curly head they used to call me the curls are gone there is so much that is gone but there are still good people left we too have appeared together in the ballet you have become better off than i you have become a great man i am now separated from two husbands and no longer at the theatre her paper begged that she might come to own a sewing machine in what ballet have we two performed together asked pierre in the tyrant of padua she replied we were two pages in blue velvet and feathered cap do you not remember little mary can naller up i walked just behind you in the procession and stepped on the side of my foot said pierre laughing did i said she then i took too long a step but you have gone so far of me you have understood how to use your legs in your head and she looked with her melancholy face coquettishly with a simper at him quite sure she had passed quite a witty compliment pierre was a generous fellow she should have the sewing machine he promised little mally had indeed been one of those who specially drove him out of the ballet into a more fortunate career he stopped soon outside the merchant's house and stepped upstairs to his mother and grandmother they were in their best clothes and had accidentally a visit from madame court who was at once invited to join them whereupon she had a sore struggle with herself which ended in her sending a messenger to her court to inform him that she had accepted the invitation pierre gets all the salutations said she how stylishly we are driving said mother and in such a roomy great carriage said grandmother near the town close by the royal park stood a little cosy house surrounded by vines and roses hazels and fruit trees here the carriage stopped this was the country seat they were received by an old woman well known to mother and grandmother and she often helped them in their washing and ironing the garden was visited and they went over the house there was one specially charming thing a little glass house with beautiful flowers in it it was connected with the sitting room there was a sliding door in the wall that is just like a coulisse said madame court it moves by hand and one can sit here just as in a bird cage with chickweed all about it is called a winter garden the sleeping chamber was also very delightful after its kind long close curtains at the windows soft carpets and two armchairs so commodious that mother and grandmother must needs try them one would get very lazy sitting in them said mother one loses his weight said madame court ah here you two music people can swim easily enough through the seas of theatrical labour i have known what they are i believe me i can still dream of making bottemore and court makes bottemores at my side is it not charming two souls and one thought there is fresher air here and more room than in the two small rooms up in the garret said pierre with beaming eyes that there is said mother still home is so good there did i bear thee my sweet boy and lived with thy father it is better here said grandmother here there are all the conveniences of a rich man's place i do not grudge you and that noble man the singing master his home of peace then i do not grudge it to you grandmother and you dear blessed mother you too shall always live here and not as in town go up so many steps and be in such narrow and close quarters you shall have a servant to help you and see me as often as in town are you glad at this are you content with it what is all this the boy stands here and says said mother the house the garden all are thine mother and thine grandmother it is for this i have laboured to lay up money my friend the singing master has faithfully helped me by getting it ready what is all this you are saying child burst forth the mother will you give us a gentleman's seat my dearest boy thou wouldst do it if thou couldst it is all true said he the house is thine and grandmother's he kissed them both they burst into tears and madame court shed quite as many 
it is the happiest moment of my life exclaimed pierre as he embraced them all and now they had to see everything all over again since it was their own in place of their roxy of five or six plants in pots out on their roof they now had this beautiful little conservatory instead of a little closet they had a great roomy pantry and the kitchen itself was a complete little warm chamber the chimney had an oven and cooking stove it looked like a great shining box iron said mother now you two have at last a chimney corner just like me said madame court it is royal here you have got all that man can get on this earth and you too my own courted friend not all said pierre to be sure the little wife comes said madame court i have her already for you i have her in my feeling but i shall keep my mouth shut thou noble man is it not like a ballet all this she laughed with tears in her eyes and so did mother and grandmother Seventeen. to write the text and music for an opera and to be himself the interpreter of his own work on the stage this was his great aim a young friend had a talent in common with wagner in that he could himself construct the dramatic poem but had he like him the fullness of musical power so that he could fashion a musical work of any significance courage and doubt alternated in him he could not dismiss this constant thought from his mind a year and a day since it had shone forth as a picture of fancy now it was a possibility an end in his life many free fancies were welcomed at the piano as birds of passage from that country of perhaps the little romances the characteristic spring song gave promise of the still undiscovered land of tone the widow baroness saw in them the sign of promise as columbus saw it in the fresh green weed which the currents of the sea bore toward him before he saw the land itself on the horizon land was there the child of fortune could reach it a word thrown out was the seed of thought she the young pretty innocent girl spoke the word aladdin a fortunate child like aladdin was our young friend this was the light that broke into him with this light he read and re-read the beautiful oriental story soon it took dramatic form scene after scene grew into words and music and the more it grew the richer came the music thoughts at the close of the work it was as if the well of tone were now for the first time pierced and all the abundant fresh water gushed forth he composed his work anew and in stronger form months afterward arose the opera aladdin no one knew of this work no one had heard any measures at all of it not even the most sympathetic of all his friends the singing master no one at the theatre when of an evening the young singer with his voice and his remarkable playing entranced the public had a thought that the young man who seemed so to live and breathe in his role lived far more intensely i for hours afterward lost himself in a mighty work of music that flowed forth from his own soul the singing master had not heard a bar of the opera aladdin before it was laid upon his table for examination complete in notes and text what judgment would be passed assuredly a strong and just one the young composer passed from highest hope to the thought that the whole thing was only a self-delusion two days passed by and not a word was interchanged about this important matter at length the singing master stood before him with the score in his hands that now he knew there was a peculiar seriousness spread over his face that would not let his mind be guessed i had not expected this said he i had not believed it of you indeed i am not yet sure of my judgment i dare not express it here and there there are faults in the instrumentation faults that can easily be corrected there are single things bold and novel that one must hear under fair conditions as there is with wagner a working over of karl maria weber so there is noticeable in you a breath of hayden 
that which is new in what you have given is still somewhat far off from me and you yourself are too near for me to give an exact judgment i would rather not judge i would embrace you he burst out with a rush of gladness how came you to do this and he expressed him in his arms happy man there was soon a rumour through the town in the newspapers and in society gossip of the new opera by the young singer whom all the town was flattering he is a poor tailor who could not put together a child's trousers out of the scraps left over on his board said one to another write the text compose it and sing it all himself was also said that is a three-storied genius but he really was born still higher in a garret there are two at it he and the singing master they said now they'll begin to beat the signal trumpet of the mutual admiration society the opera was given out for study those who took part would not give any opinion it shall not be said that it is judged from the theatre said they and almost all put on a serious face that did not let any expectation of good show itself there are many good horns in the piece said a young man who played that instrument and also composed well if he doesn't run a horn into himself footnote five alluding to a danish popular phrase in which a man is supposed to gore himself End of footnote it has genius it is sparkling full of melody and character that was also said to-morrow at this time said pierre the scaffold will be raised the judgment is perhaps already passed some say that it is a masterpiece said the singing master others that it is a mere patchwork and wherein lies truth truth said the singing master pray show me look at that star yonder tell me exactly where its place is shut one eye do you see it now look at it with the other only the star has shifted its place when each eye in the same person sees so differently how variously must the great multitude see happen what may said our young friend i must know my place in the world understand what i can and must put forth or give up the evening came the evening of the representation a popular artist was to be exalted to a higher place or plunged down in his gigantic proud effort a shot or a drop the matter concerned the whole city people stood all night in the street before the ticket office to secure places the house was crammed frill the ladies came with great bouquets would they carry them home again or cast them at the victor's feet the widow baroness and the young beautiful daughter sat in a box above the orchestra there was a stir in the audience a murmuring a movement that stopped at once as the leader of the orchestra took his place and the overture began who does not remember hensel's piece that is like a twittering of birds this was something akin merry playing children happy child voices the cuckoo gave its note with them the thrush struck in it was the play and carol of innocent childhood the mind of aladdin then there rolled upon it a thunderstorm noureddin displayed his power a flash of lightning rent the rocks general beckoning stones followed a sound from the enchanted grotto where the lamp shone in the petrified cavern while the wings of mighty spirits brooded over it now they sounded forth in notes of a bugle a psalm so gentle and soft as if it came from the mouth of a child a single horn was heard and then another more and more were blended in the same tones and rose in fullness and power as if they were the trumpets of the judgment day the lamp was in aladdin's hand and there swelled forth a sea of melody and majesty as if the ruler of spirits and master of music held sway the curtain rolled up in a storm of applause which sounded like a fanfare under the conductor's baton a grown-up boy played there so big and yet so simple it was aladdin who frolicked among the other boys grandmother would at once have said 
that is peer as he played and jumped about between the stove and the chest of drawers at home in the garret he's not a year older in his soul with what faith and earnest prayer he sang the prayer nuruddin bade him offer before he stepped down into the crevice to obtain the lamp was it the pure religious melody or the innocence with which he sung that drew all hearts after him the applause was unbounded it would have been a profane thing to have repeated the song it was called for but it was not given the curtain fell the first act was ended every critic was speechless people were overcome with gladness they could not speak out their gratitude a few chords from the orchestra and the curtain rose the strains of music as in gluck's armada and mozart's magic flute arrested the attention of each as the scene was disclosed where aladdin stood in the wonderful garden a soft subdued music surrounded from flowers and stones from springs and deep caverns different melodies blending in one great harmony a sousurus of spirits was heard in the chorus it was now far off now near swelling in might and then dying away borne upon this unison was the monologue of aladdin what one needs calls a great area but so entirely in keeping with character and situation that it was a necessary dramatic part of the whole the resonant sympathetic voice the intense music of the heart subdued all listeners and seized them with a rapture that could not rise higher when he reached forth for the lamp it was fanned by the song of the spirits bouquets rained down from all sides a carpet of living flowers was spread out before his feet what a moment of life for the young artist the highest the greatest a mightier one could never again be granted him he felt a wreath of laurel glanced upon his breast and fell down before him he had seen from whose hand it came he saw the young girl in the box nearest the stage the young baroness rising like a genius of beauty singing a paean over his triumph a fire rushed through him his heart swelled as never before he bowed took the wreath pressed it against his heart and at the same moment fell backward fainted dead what was it the curtain fell dead ran the word through the house dead in the moment of triumph like sophocles at the olympian games like thor walston in the theatre during beethoven's symphony an artery in his heart had burst and as by a flash of lightning his day here was ended ended without pain ended in an earthly jubilee in the fulfilment of his mission on earth lucky peer more fortunate than millions end of the lucky peer part 6